This is Josiah Plays, Lone Wolf, Book 22, The Buccaneers of Shadokai. The legendary Moonstone was created by the godlike Shianti, whose presence upon Magnamund heralded the dawn of humanity. It contains the might of all the Shianti's magic and wisdom, the sum of their divine knowledge. Lone Wolf, supreme master of the Kai, has successfully retrieved the Moonstone following its theft by the forces of darkness. And now, this magical artifact must be returned quickly to its creators before its immense powers disrupt the delicate balance of nature. He has entrusted the precious Moonstone to you, the most promising warrior in the ranks of the New Order Kai. In The Buccaneers of Shadokai, your quest is to deliver this stone of power to the Shianti, who are exiled upon the mystical Isle of Lorne. Will your vital quest succeed, or will you fall foul of the pirates and perils that infest the southern seas of Magnamund? Okay, hello and welcome back to another Lone Wolf book. This is the 22nd book. We've done 21 of these so far. It's amazing. It is amazing that we've gone through 21 of these books. Now we're on book 22, Buccaneers of Shadokai. Loved these books when I was a kid. Never got this far in the books, but I love the earlier ones. They were written by Joe Deaver. And this one was illustrated by Brian Williams. You see this uh, digital version of the books that I'm reading here is uh, courtesy of projectaeon.org. They've done digital versions of all the Lone Wolf books with permission of the author. And the music you hear throughout this stream slash, uh, slash video is by Kevin McLeod in Competech.com. In my YouTube video, you will find attribution and links to his stuff. He does lots of lots and lots and lots of good royalty-free music of all different genres. You should check him out. So, here we go. We are no longer playing Lone Wolf. We are now playing a new Order Kai. One of Lone Wolf's brightest and best students, whom I've named Fire Snake. That is now our character, Fire Snake. This will be his second adventure. I've got my character here, carried forward from the last adventure, and we're gonna level him up a little bit here, or, you know, give him what he gets for his new rank. And as you can see, the cover is over there to the right. It looks like we're gonna be murdering some dinosaurs, as uh, Saito put it a little bit ago. Looks like we're going to be murdering dinosaurs, so there you go. Steven Seagal underwater murdering dinosaurs. You know, I would not even be surprised if that is not an actual Steven Seagal movie that currently exists. That wouldn't even surprise me, given some of the cheesy-ass movies he's been in. Fire Snake does sound like a Steven Seagal movie. <laughs> nice. Here we go. I really think you ought to reconsider what you're doing. <laughs> broke your arm, broke your arm! I don't know, that was a terrible Steven Seagal impersonation, but... Let's just, uh, you know... We got some music going here, I don't think it's too loud. You can hear me over the music just fine, right, Saito? Alright, let's go. For Chris and Sally, plus one. Apparently Chris and Sally had a child. That's what I'm guessing. Some acknowledgements. All right, and it brings us to the story so far, which is going to probably be a pretty long read. This is essentially the previously on Lone Wolf. So we're going to find out what happened before the current book. Here we go. You are a Kai Grand Master of the New Order of the Kai, the warrior elite of Summerland. It is the year MS 5083, and 33 years have passed since the First Order of the Kai was almost wiped out by the Dark Lords of Helgatad. These champions of evil, who were sent by the Dark God Nar to destroy your fertile world of Magnamund, have since been destroyed. The leader of your illustrious fighting order, Lone Wolf, was the sole survivor of the massacre. As a young Kai initiate, he stood amidst the burning wreckage of the old Kai monastery and vowed to avenge the slaughter of his comrades. In the year MS 5070, he kept his pledge. When alone, he infiltrated the foul domain of the Dark Lords and destroyed the infernal city of Helgadad, the base of their evil power. 
With the fall of Helgadad, chaos befell the Darkland armies, who had, until then, been poised to conquer all Magnamund. Quickly, their disorder escalated into a mutinous civil war, which allowed the Freeland armies of Magnamund time in which to recover and launch a successful counteroffensive. Against all odds, a swift and total victory was secured over the feuding armies of evil. And hey, Noxmoo, good to see you. How you doing? Following the demise of the Dark Lords, peace reigned in your homeland of Summerland. Under the direction of Lone Wolf, the ruined Monastery of the Kai was rebuilt and restored to its former glory, and the raising of a new order of Kai warriors was swiftly established. You are one of this new generation of Kai recruits. You were born in Summerland in the year MS 5063, during the time of the war against the Dark Lords. When you were seven years old, you were sent by your father to the Kai Monastery. There, under the tutelage of Lone Wolf, you developed your martial skills and honed the special Kai abilities which lay dormant within you. During the years that followed, your skills were nurtured and sharpened to perfection by long hours of study and rigorous training. Your exceptional talent helped you to master all of the Kai and Magna Kai disciplines, and you rose swiftly through the ranks of the New Order to become one of only five who now hold the high rank of Kai Grand Master. It is an achievement which has brought great honor upon you and your family. Hold on, let's stop and think about that for a second. It took Lone Wolf a long time to become Grand Master, and let's also remember that throughout the entirety of the history of the Kai previous to this, Grandmaster was the absolute highest rank. There were no ranks past that. That was the pinnacle. And it took people like their whole lives to become Grandmaster. Lone Wolf, it took him quite a long time to become Grandmaster. Now these guys, this guy is 20 years old. 20 years old, and he's only been training since he was 7. So, I mean, he's barely out of childhood, and he's already a Grandmaster. That's kind of a big deal. Lone Wolf must be one hell of a fucking teacher. I mean, assuming he got, like, teachermanship as one of his, uh, as one of his later abilities, because for him to raise up new kids to become grandmasters, five of them even, so quickly, you know, would have been unheard of from the Kai before. So that's pretty amazing. Yeah, I guess because he collected all the lore stones, he got all that wisdom and stuff, that it must have made it a lot easier to teach the students. Spoonie Bard walks up to the door and says, I'll be a Grandmaster. <laughs> In the year MS 5077, your skill and courage were put to the test when an attack was launched upon the Kai Monastery during Lone Wolf's absence. By means of a shadow gate, an astral corridor between the physical world of Bagnamund and the many ethereal domains which lie beyond it, the Dark God Nar set forth a host of dragon creatures to besiege the monastery and lay waste of all Summerland. He had chosen his time well, yet his evil plan was thwarted by the tenacious defense that you and your brethren maintained until the siege was raised by Lone Wolf and the King's Army of Summerland. The defeat of his minions enraged Nar and inflamed his lust for vengeance. Three years later, he created and sent to Summerlin an evil champion called Wolf's Bane, who was the very image of Lone Wolf. While your leader was engaged upon a quest overseas, this imposter terrorized your homeland in his guise and sought to destroy the reputation and the honor of the Kai. He would have succeeded had not Lone Wolf returned home and pursued this enemy to an ancient necropolis in the Somlending city of Tyso. There, deep within a subterranean crypt, he and his evil alter ego were drawn through a shadow gate to the Plain of Darkness, Nars Stronghold, where a deadly duel ensued. Lone Wolf vanquished the foe and discovered that Nar had in his possession the fabled Moonstone of the Shianti. This wondrous artifact was created many thousands of years ago by the godlike Shianti, whose presence upon Magnamund heralded the dawn of humanity. This stone of power contains the combined might of all their magic and wisdom, the sum of all their knowledge. So significant was the creation of this stone that all time on Magnamon has since been measured from the date of its creation. 
It had long been held that the Moonstone's location was a secret known only to the remnants of the Shianti, who dwell upon the mysterious Isle of Lorne in southern Magnamund. Yet the evidence of Lone Wolf's eyes had told him that this mystical artifact had somehow fallen into the hands of Nar. Lone Wolf realized that the Dark God had been using its legendary powers to generate shadow gates within the world of Magnamund at locations and times of his own choosing. Such power had enabled him to send his loathsome champions to your home world while the force of the gods of good, Kai and Ashir, had been held at bay. Lone Wolf and the New Order Kai were all that stood against the onslaught of Nar's agents following the demise of the Dark Lords. Lone Wolf successfully escaped from the Plain of Darkness and returned to Somerland, yet he knew that the fight against evil had not been won outright. He realized that he would have to return to the Plain of Darkness and retrieve the fabled Moonstone. Only by doing so would Magnamund truly be safe from an invasion by Nar's legions of darkness. Two years ago, with the aid of his most trusted ally, Lord Ramoa of Desi. I imagine Bandon's like, what the fuck, why am I not the most trusted ally? What am I, chopped liver? But apparently, Lord Ramoa is the most trusted. <laughs> Nox Moo, however, the Moonstone and you had a disagreement over the best jazz artist of the 80s and it has since refused to heal you. I know, right? That fucking squirrely Moonstone. Lone Wolf fulfilled his vow by journeying to the Dark God's domain and retrieving the Moonstone of the Shianti. Upon his triumphant return, Lone Wolf placed the Moonstone in the Vault of the Sun. His personal chamber, located deep below the fortified citadel of the Kai Monastery. He had hoped that the fabled artifact could remain there indefinitely, to be guarded by generations of Kai who would keep it secure from Nar's minions. Retrieval of the Moonstone had denied the Dark God's champions ready access to Magnamund, yet Lone Wolf knew that there were many lesser agents of Nar upon Magnamund waiting quietly in the shadows for the chance to do his evil bidding. Undoubtedly, they would stop at nothing to retrieve the Moonstone for their fell master. Within a year of his return home, it became clear to Lone Wolf that his wish could not be fulfilled. At first, the presence of the Moonstone seemed greatly beneficial to Somerland. Crops grew abundantly, incidents of disease and illness became increasingly rare, and the newly born were uniformly healthy. Even the offspring of the impoverished, who, in normal times, could expect only one in three of their infants to survive longer than a month beyond birth, were all in good health and exceptional in their physical and mental development. Okay, so here we go. So it's, it's pointing it out to you specifically, that by removing the Moonstone from Sauerland, you are now dooming two out of three infants to die. <laughs> uh, we can't have all these infants living. That's amazing. By removing the Moonstone, two out of three infants are now gonna die. Chianti sounds like the name of the person who does Steven Seagal's hair. Nice. The Somlending called this extraordinary period of providence the Blessing of the Moonstone. Yet this time of good fortune could not last. The power of the Moonstone is a great force for good, but it is also greatly disruptive of the natural order of Magnamund. Soon death itself became a rarity in Somerland, and the four seasons of the year were slowly transformed into one unending spring. Lone Wolf was deeply concerned at the changes wrought by the Moonstone, and sought the counsel of his closest friend, Guildmaster Bainden, leader of Somerland's Brotherhood of Magicians. Hold on. Wait a minute. Lord Ramoa is his most trusted ally, but Bainden is his closest friend. It's like, Bainden, I got love for you, but I don't trust you as much as, as much as Ramoa. Ramoa, I trust you, but, you know, we're not, we don't really have a bromance going like I do with Bainden, you understand. So apparently that's how that works. He's his closest friend, but not his trusted ally. Bainden entreated him to relinquish the Moonstone before the effects of its power became irreversible. 
To right the imbalance of nature, the Moonstone would have to be taken to the Isle of Lorne, in the southernmost reaches of Magnamon, and delivered back into the hands of the Shianti. Only they, its creators, could prevent its powers from disrupting the natural order of your world. Lone Wolf agreed with Bainton. The Moonstone would have to be returned to the Shianti. The physical effects of its presence were beginning to attract the unwelcome attentions of those who secretly desire to enact Nar's vengeance, Nar's revenge upon the Kai. When one of Nar's agents was captured by a Kai patrol within a few miles of the monastery, Lone Wolf felt he could wait no longer. He resolved to act immediately. Preparations were made for a long journey, and, especially among the lower ranks of the Kai, rumors were rife that your leader would personally take responsibility for returning the Moonstone to the Shianti. Indeed, this speculation seemed to be confirmed as fact when it was discovered that Lone Wolf had secured the use of Guildmaster Bainden's famous flying ship, Cloud Dancer. It therefore came as a shock when, early one morning, you were summoned unexpectedly to the Vault of the Sun. In strictest confidence, Supreme Master Lone Wolf informed you that he had decided to entrust you with the task of returning the Moonstone to the Shianti. His elaborate preparations were simply a diversion, a bluff designed to draw attention away from the vital mission that he wished you, the most talented and courageous of his five Kai Grand Masters, to undertake. It was with great pride and apprehension that you accepted the quest. Lone Wolf gave you the precious Moonstone in a seemingly ordinary satchel, yet the lining of this plain leather bag was woven from Corlidium, a special mineral that would hide the Moonstone's powerful energies from the agents of Nar. In the guise of a Kai journeyman, you set sail from the Samlending capital of Holmgard aboard a caravel that was to carry you south on the first leg of your journey, a voyage of 2,000 miles to Elzion, the capital of Desi. This legendary city is home to Lord Ramoa and the Elder Magi. They are the last surviving members of Magnamon's oldest race of magicians, and they had promised Lone Wolf that they would help you reach your final destination. You had hoped and expected the voyage would be swift and uneventful. Nobody expected that. However, fate and ill fortune decreed otherwise. Your ship was attacked by pirates off the coast of Vasagonia and badly damaged. It limped to the port of Cape Kabar, where you were forced to continue the long journey by overland routes to Elzion. This trek was fraught with danger, yet you overcame the many perils ranged against you and eventually arrived at the Decian capital, to the relief of Lord Ramoa and his anxious brother magicians who had feared the worst. Now, the final and most challenging part of your voyage to the Isle of Lorne lies ahead, and it is a journey that may prove more difficult than any you have undertaken so far. I mean, in fairness, I've only undertaken one journey so far. So, it wouldn't be that hard to prove more difficult than any I've un undertaken, because I've only undertaken one. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, the bar is not that high. For it will lead you deep into the wild and lawless reaches of Southern Magnamond. Dun dun dun, which we know, you know, Southern Magnamond is a crazy place. So here's my thing. You see how long this story so far is, and it talks about all this stuff that happened in all these previous books? And then, the part about what happened in just the last book is almost nothing. It's this tiny little bit right here. Um... That's my point that I made at the end of the last book. Nothing important happened in that book. Nothing plot-relevant even happened. That's why there's... It says almost nothing about what happened in that book in the story so far, whereas it talks on and on about shit that happened many books ago. It's just, you know, you could sum it up. You went on a fucking journey. You journeyed there. And then now you're in... Now you're in Elzian. So the, the, the previous book didn't really have a lot of... Plot important stuff that occurred is what I'm saying. Alright, so... Let's, um, move on here. Game rules. It is time to select an additional uh, discipline. And when we do so, we'll get to add one to our base combat skill. And two to our base endurance. 
which is great. Got their Kai name already. All right, which discipline are we going to take? This time, I think, as boring as it is, I think I have to take Grand Weapon Mastery because we were getting our ass kicked last book. Really getting our ass kicked. And, um... I mean, I had to start the whole book over, for God's sake. What could possibly top astrology? I don't know. Astrology, bardsmanship, and herbs mastery. That's what I have so far. Astrology, herbs mastery, elementalism, which actually came in useful a lot of times, and bardsmanship. And I also have magi magic. This time we're going to take grand weapon mastery, even though it's boring. Because I think it'll help us out a lot with not getting our ass kicked so bad in the fights. This discipline enables a New Order Grand Master to become supremely efficient in the use of all weapons. When you enter combat armed with one of your Grand Master weapons, you may add 5 points to your combat skill. The rank of Kai Grand Master Senior, with which you begin the New Order series, means that you are skilled in the use of one of the weapons listed in the Equipment section. For every adventure that you complete successfully in the New Order series, while possessing the Discipline of Grand Mastery, you will gain proficiency with one additional weapon. So we will take Grand Mastery with Sword. Which now allows us to add 5 here. Now we have a little bit more respectable combat skill of 44. So we might be able to get through some of these fights without getting slapped around so bad. If you take it, it'll last for Kai Alchemy every eight passages once again. Oh, I know it will. I know it will. Kai Alchemy is going to be all over the place. And all the other ones that I usually have but don't have this time, like Telenosis and Grand Pathsmanship and Grand Hunt Mastery. No, I can't take another weapon as well because it says every adventure that you complete while possessing the discipline, you get another weapon. I have completed no books while possessing that discipline so far. After I complete this book, I'll get another one. So anyway, that is that. Let's see if any of my abilities have improved from me gaining a new rank. Before you leave Elzean and begin your long voyage south to the Isle of Lorne, you acquire a map of southeastern Magnamund. Let's take a look at the map. Looks pretty cool. Let's get rid of the book cover. Let's enlarge the map. There's Shadokai and the lands of the Free Alliance of Southern Magnamund, formerly the Shadokin Empire. There's Elzean. That's where we're starting off. So north is this way. So this map is basically flipped. You know, this is south. This is north. Um, the map is turned from like how it would normally be shown with north to the, at the top and south at the bottom. There's Gold Tabris, got Masama over here, all kinds of strange and foreign and exotic new places to go. We've never been to Southern Magnamund, even Lone Wolf has never been to Southern Magnamund. All of his adventures took place in Northern Magnamund or on other planes and shit. And here is... Oh, I see. This continues from... From there, there's Masama and Kitezi, right? And here's going further south, all the way to the Isle of Lorne. There it is. It doesn't look that far away, but I guess it kind of is. It's all the way down past this entire Shadokai, past all of this, all this, all this, all the way to there. So, yeah. Sidus says, Intuit Bardsmanship, you can play three chords on your loot and also gain the power of busking. <laughs> nice. Well, this isn't my real rank right here. That's a super low rank, actually. Super low. Like, lower than Lone Wolf even starts at. My actual rank, it's not going to show because I don't have all of the stuff selected and I, and I don't have all of my abilities. You know, some of my... Because this wasn't made to use with the Grand Master books, so it doesn't... You know, the New Order books. So it doesn't uh, have all the... New Order abilities and stuff. Anyway. That was the map. Also get a pouch of gold. Let's roll a random number. I got a 3 plus 20 is 23 gold. That's good because I only had 1 gold. So I'm to 24 now. 
I can take five items from the list below. Keep in mind, I literally have no weapons right now besides my special item Sunstrike Sword. So I'm going to need a bow. But I do already have six arrows. So... I'm going to take a bow and I'm going to take something else. Like... We've got a flute already, so I'm not going to take another flute. Oh, I'll take some meals, though. I've got a rope. I'll take a potion of Lomspur all day long. And I'll take a sword, another sword besides my sword, just in case I need a backup weapon for some reason. How many times you get to say I told you so this time? Dual wielding flutes, says Noxmu. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think that would really work. <laughs> told me so about what this particular time? All right. Got my special Kai weapon. See, actually, my rank should be... Actually, my rank should be... Kai Master Superior, I suppose. Kai Grandmaster Superior? I'm not sure. Improved disciplines. Alright, here we go. Now we can see if any of my stuff got better. Kai Grandmaster Superior. Yeah, that is my rank. Okay. Are you warned about the old guy and the second Deathstalker? Oh, I do remember that. Yeah. I do remember that. Alright, I don't have Animal Mastery. I don't have a similar set. I do have Astrology. Kai Grandmaster Superiors who possess this discipline are skilled in the use of all mechanical devices designed to measure and or observe the cosmology of Magnamund. Such devices include sextants, astrolabes, and orreries. Really? That is massively underwhelming. You know who else is proficient in that? Like any first year astrology college student. Like anybody that's not a Kai that's fucking spent a week apprenticing at a fucking observatory. <laughs> I mean, what kind of ability is that? You gotta be a Kai Grand Master for this shit? Herb Mastery. Kai Grand Master superiors who have this discipline are able to purify water, thereby making contaminated or briny water suitable for consumption. Roughly two pints of water per day can be purified using this skill alone. This daily total steadily increases as a Grandmaster adva advances in rank. Now have the same level of usefulness as an old Brita filter, right? Wow, these are some underwhelming ass abilities. Elementalism, I have that as well. Kai Grandmaster superiors who possess this skill are able to condense pure water out of the surrounding air. This water can be made to fall as a fine spray or a sudden deluge. It can also be made to fill any suitable container or receptacle. Using this skill, Grandmaster Superiors can create the equivalent of one large bucketful of fresh water. Wow. So that just makes the Herb Mastery thing fucking useless. Like, I could purify water or I could just create water out of air. Our Herb Mastery is like, I'm I really like my purified water, though. You need to cast a natal horoscope for someone. You now have that ability as a Kai. <laughs> yeah. So much water. Bardsmanship. I have that. Of course I do. And it's now improved. Kai Grandmaster superiors who possess this discipline are able to utilize their musical skills to pacify an excited or hostile animal. Wow. So Bardsmanship, you can use to do the exact same damn thing you can do with your Magna Kai Discipline of Animal Control. Sweet. Thanks for the hookup. 
can provide dinner music for wild animals as they devour him alive. Nice, Saito. Alright, so... None of these were very exciting. Not at all. Okay. Here we go. New Order Wisdom says the same shit as always. It lies to you about how it doesn't matter how weak your initial combat skill is. That's just not true at all. Alright, here we are. We finally arrive at section one, the actual beginning of the adventure. Are you ready? I ask again, are you ready? For three days, you are treated to the lavish hospitality of the Elder Magi and the freedom of the wondrous city of Elzion. Then, on the morning of the fourth day, having fully recovered from the rigors of your journey to Desi, you meet with Lord Rimoa in the Tower of Truth to discuss the final stage of your quest, the voyage to the Isle of Lorn. He informs you that passage has been arranged for you aboard a Sunni's trading ship called the Azan, which sails tomorrow at dawn. The ship's master, Captain Jenkshi, has been paid generously to carry you to his home port of Soon, and you can expect to be well treated by him and his crew. It will be a long voyage, some 2,500 miles in all, but not all of it will be spent at sea. The Azan will put in at several ports along the way, both to trade and to take on fresh supplies of food and water. Ramoa reminds you of the need for secrecy. Nobody must know the real purpose of your journey. Jenkshi and his men have been told that you are simply a courier who is carrying official papers for the attention of Lord Zinair, the Desian ambassador to Soon. On arriving at Soon, you are to contact Lord Zinair, who will arrange for your passage across the Sea of Dreams to the Isle of Lorne. Before you leave the Tower of Truth and return to your chambers, Lord Ramoa examines the satchel in which you carry the Moonstone. Its special corlinium lining meets with his approval. Well, that's good. Inspected by number 57. Nox Moo says, reminds him of the quest for glory games. If you cast Calm while in close combat, the monster calmly devours you. <laughs> that's awesome. Also, why is there no female Kai? Lone Wolf might have creeped out all the potential candidates. Yeah. Yeah, he was not so great with women. That, that we can all agree on. The home port of soon. Yeah, will we be there soon? We'll be, we'll be arriving in soon, soon? Soon, we'll be in soon. Yeah. I bet people from soon probably really get sick of that joke fast. Apparently, in case we didn't know what a satchel looks like. Lone Wolf has prepared you well for your mission, he says as he secures the buckle. I'm sure I have no need to remind you to keep this bag closed at all times. You are about to venture through dangerous territory, and there are many who would give anything to possess the contents of this satchel. You would be wise to trust only yourself, Grandmaster. If you have not already done so, record the Moonstone in your action chart as a special item. You carry it slung over your shoulder in its leather satchel. I have THE Moonstone! Exclamation point. It's there. Ramoa escorts you to your room and tells you that he will call for you at an hour before dawn to take you to the key. As he bids you good night, a doleful bell rings out in some distant part of the city. Ramoa's eyes fill with sadness. What does the bell mean, my lord? It signifies, you ask. I, I remembered that Spire Snake has to sing all of his lines. <laughs> because bardsmanship. Saito says, you know what, I just realized your bardsmanship would be super helpful with that thing on the cover. You know, if you weren't underwater. <laughs> yeah, being underwater does really hurt with the whole singing and playing musical instruments thing. It signifies the passing of Lord Cassus. He, too, is about to begin a journey. Alas, it will be his last. 
I must go now. I am being summoned to witness his departure. As he leaves, Ramoa pauses for a moment and then glances back over his shoulder. You are welcome to accompany me if you wish, Grandmaster. The passing of an elder is a rare and special occasion. You may learn much from what you see. Why the hell would you not go? Like, if you wish to go see some cool shit, go to 225. If you just want to fuck around in your room and do nothing, t stay at 118. I mean, if I was role-playing Fire Snake as though he was me, I'd be like, nah, I'm good. I ain't going to some fucking creepy-ass mage funeral. I got shit to do in my room, and by shit to do, I mean nothing. If only you had some other skill available that allowed you to affect beasts without the need for an instrument, a sort of mastery of animals, one might call it. Yeah, that's crazy. Whoever designed the uh, Kai abilities really should have thought of that. Then you discover the deaths here like some Polynesian cultures and eat their dead. That would be awesome. I want to go meet some people that eat their dead. I would eat the shit out of somebody. I'm just saying. I'm just, I'm just saying. Not to be a cannibal or anything. <laughs> no, you know, I'm not a cannibal or anything. I would just eat the shit out of some human flesh, though. I would. Alright, I'm going to accept the invitation. Phrasing. <laughs> you hurry with Lord Ramoa through the corridors of the Tower of Truth towards the sound of the tolling bell until at last you arrive at a chamber located below its vaulted presidium. Gathered here are the members of the High Council. They stand in a circle around the cloaked body of Lord Cassis, which lies upon a bed of shimmering crystals. A cocoon of light encases its frail form, the pale luminescence shedding an uncanny glow upon the faces of the surrounding elders. Ramoa joins them, and as you observe this eerie scene, you recall Lone Wolf's teachings at the Kai Monastery. Okay, what do I recall? Here's apparently the image of Doctor Strange and uh, some other people. The, I mean, that is an unnecessarily large collar they've got on the, their robes there. Have you ever visited the Abbey of Light in the Winter's Eternal? Yeah. There you go. There you go. Alright, so crystal, luminescent, corpse, got it. The Elder Magi are all that remain of the race of beings from whom all goodly magic stems. They were sent to Magnamund almost 10,000 years ago by the gods Kai and Ashir to defeat Agarash the Damned, Nar's first champion, and they triumphed in their task. Yet, in a later age, their numbers were decimated by a plague, and the few thousands who survived this tragedy sought refuge here in Desi. The Elder Magi have always aided Samaland and have been loyal and invaluable allies to the Kai, but now their ancient power is waning and the few thousands who survived the Great Plague now number less than a hundred. I think you mean fewer than a hundred. But that is not very many. Out of, out of thousands, now there's fewer than a hundred of them remaining. That's, um... They could really use the Moonstone for some of that fecundity. Looks like they're about to break out singing Age of Aquarius. It'd be perfect with Fire Snake, he could join in and provide the harmonies. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Aquarius! <laughs> I don't know how to sing it. I don't know how to sing it. Suddenly the bell ceases to toll and you watch in awe as the fragile remains of Lord Cassus gradually fade from sight. He has ended his time here upon Magnamund and has passed over into the Plain of Light, the ethereal domain of the gods Kai and Ashir. Silently, the remaining elders file out of the chamber. As Lord Ramoa pot passes, he beckons you to follow him. You are the first Kai who has ever witnessed the ascension of an elder, he says as he takes you back to your room. Alas, our power ebbs with each passing year. For this is the twilight of our existence here on Magnamund. 
I am the last of the Herodrum. No, wait, that's somebody else. Yet we embrace our fate. For even as we weaken and fade, so the power of the New Order Kai grows stronger. This is the dawning of your age! Oh my god, it really is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. This is the dawning of your age! The age of Aquarius! I can't, am I even going to get through this line? Aquarius! This is the dawning! Oh, I'm not doing well today. We're having problems. Learn that tune with your new Grandmaster Rank next book. Stay a while and listen. This is the dawning of your age, Grandmaster. You and your brothers shall carry forward the fight against Na, and you shall be victorious. Yeah. If you say so, buddy. If you say so. Upon reaching your room, Lord Ramoa bids you good night and reminds you that he shall call for you an hour before dawn. You retire to bed, but remain awake for more than an hour as you contemplate the quest that lies ahead. You are apprehensive of the dangers you may encounter, but you are also greatly inspired by what you have witnessed this night and by Ramoa's prophetic words of wisdom. No sooner have you fallen asleep, it seems, than you are awoken by Ramoa's knock on the door. You gather your weapons and belongings and walk with him through a procession of torchlit corridors that lead to the entrance to the tower. As you approach the main doors, Ramoa points to a chamber close by. That is the tower armory, Grandmaster, he says. You are welcome to inspect it and take whatever you wish before you embark upon your voyage. Yeah, if you want to go to the super awesome armory, go to 152. If, you, if you're a fucking idiot, turn to 49. Nah, I'm good. I, I hate getting additional gear that will help me in my quest. I mean, there could be armor in there. There could be a shield or a helmet or actual armor. God, that would really be good. Probably isn't, though. It's just a bunch of quarter stabs and shit. Alright, here we go. The walls of the armory are lined with oaken racks containing many skillfully crafted weapons. They are all of ancient design and many centuries old. Their gleaming blades have been kept in pristine condition, yet it strikes you that this chamber is more like a museum than an armory. Clearly the Elder Magi have little need for conventional weapons. Among the right racks you note the following weapons that are of exceptional quality. Spear, short sword, mace, warhammer, bow, and broadsword. If you wish to take any of these weapons, make the appropriate adjustment to your action chart. So, yeah, I don't need any of that. Thanks, though, really. That's, that's great. They don't have any oaken shields. They don't have Thorin or any other ones. Alright. I guess we'll move on from here. You leave the Tower of Truth and pass along a wide stone ramp that gently descends to the great canal that encircles the city of Elzion. Few of the city's Vaqueros natives are abroad at this early hour, and the streets and avenues are empty and quiet. A warm mist wreathes the barges and ships that are moored along the canal bank, and in the pre-dawn twilight, these vessels take on a ghostly appearance. By the time you find the Azan, the sun has broken through the mist and the city is beginning to stir. Captain Jenkshi and the crew of the Sunese trader are busily preparing their ship to sail, yet they immediately stop their work to welcome you and Lord Ramoa aboard. Jenkshi is a lean, yellow-skinned man with wide almond eyes and a small, blunt nose. His slick black hair is tied in a knot atop his head in the Sunese style, a fashion that is also favored by all his crewmen. He orders one of his men to show you to your cabin at the prow, but before you go, you bid Lord Ramoa farewell, and thank him for all that he and the Elder Magi have done to aid your quest. By the time the Azan is ready to sail, the mist has vanished. 
Having inspected your cabin, you return to the foredeck where you settle yourself in the sun and enjoy the ever-changing views of the lush farmlands and vaquero settlements which border upon the canal. What? Yellow skin, dude, not cool. What? For 90 miles, this waterway cuts a wide furrow through the southern jungle of Desi. To the east, the horizon is dominated by a solitary mountain, and you marvel at its snowy peak, which is the steepest you have ever seen. Vasquez Kalamut, says one of the friendly Sunnis crewmen. In your language, I think it has the meaning, Chair of the Heavens. Well, yeah, I know, it says he's yellow-skinned. I don't understand what the ha what your thing means though, what you said. By midday you come to the estuary of the canal and the Azan heads out into the open waters of the Gulf of Tentarium. Captain Jenkshi joins you on deck and offers to share some of his food. While you eat, you learn from him that the voyage will take little more than three weeks to complete. Including visits to ports of call along the way. Well... Fire Snake wasn't referring to him as yellow skinned. This is what the narrator is saying. So it, it would have to be Joe Deaver that would be racist if, if somebody's racist here. Offers to share some of his food. While you eat, you learn from him that the voyage will take little more than three weeks to complete, including visits to ports of call along the way. You ask him about, here's the deal, we're not going to be in this fucking ship for three weeks. This ship is going to crash or be taken over or destroyed or whatever way before three weeks are over. So don't even trip about this three weeks. You ask him about the notorious Shadokin pirates who plague these waters and he answers you with a shrug of his muscular shoulders. Relax and enjoy the journey as best you can, my friend. He says jovially as he finishes his food and wipes his mouth on his silken shirt sleeve. You're in safe hands. I and my crew have sailed these waters all our lives, and we've yet to meet a buccaneer we can't outwit or outrun. Breathe easy. You have nothing to fear from those mangy curs. Okay. Well, I trust him. I'm pretty sure in a book called The Buccaneers of Shadokai, we're not going to have any trouble from the Buccaneers of Shadokai. I think we'll be fine. I myself am not concerned. Jenkshi tells you that it will take three days to cross the Gulf of Tentarium to the Shadokin city of Zarloom. There the Azan will dock overnight and collect its cargo of metal ingots, which are to be traded when the ship reaches its home port of Soon. Your first day in the gulf passes pleasantly, yet on the second day the weather closes in and a squall keeps you confined to your cabin for most of the morning. By mid-afternoon the rain abates and you go up on deck to take some exercise. I just imagine Fire Snake is up doing like yoga on the deck of the ship and they're all just looking at him like what? You're looking out across the ocean. He's got his shake weight up there. Ah, <laughs> uh, it's not listed on my action chart, but uh... I bring a shake weight everywhere I go for exercise. You were looking out across the ocean towards the east, when suddenly you notice something bobbing in the water. You magnify your vision and see that it is a man clinging to a piece of wreckage, or is it not a man? Is it truly a hell gas in the water? Quickly you informed Captain Jenksheet, yet to your surprise he is very reluctant to change course in order to rescue this man. Oh no, what will I do with tie-dye headband? Yeah, exactly. Jazzercise headband for real. Do I want to use my Psychic Kai skills to persuade Jenkshi? Or will I not influence the captain's decision? Man, this is a tough one. 
This is a tough one. I don't know. Yeah, fuck him. Fuck Captain Jenkshi. I'm gonna fucking Jedi mind trick this dude, and we're gonna do this. You want to rescue the man. I just moved my hand in the way that, you know, the way that they do in Jedi mind trick. I want to rescue the man. The captain complies with your powerful psychic suggestions, and without really knowing why, he orders his helmsman to steer towards the distant speck in the sea. As you draw closer, you see that the man is lying unconscious upon a raft made of coiled ropes and smashed timbers. A crewman brings him aboard, and together you carry him to your cabin, where you wrap him in a blanket and use your Kai healing skills to bring him back to consciousness. As slowly the man recovers his senses, you learn that his name is Gregor Lugs. He is a Lordanian sailor and sole survivor of a pirate attack which destroyed his ship and killed all of his fellow crewmen three days ago. I rescued Tom Hanks. <laughs> Wilson! It was the Shadow King who done it, he says, trembling with anger. They came upon us at night, out of the dark, with not a deck light showing. After they took all the cargo, they turned their cannons upon us. We didn't stand a chance. At a volleyball to your action jar. Gregor thanks you repeatedly for saving his life. Another few hours and he would have died of exposure. As a mark of his gratitude, he gives you an ornate silver clasp. It is a special item. Alright. Silver clasp. Ornate. Silver. Clasp. From Gregor. And he insists that he pay you for allowing him to share your cabin and food. He takes ten gold crowns from his belt pouch and offers them to you. Okay, hold on. Slow your fucking roll, Gregor. You are not sharing my food. My f No, you're not sharing my- in fact, who- who s when did I volunteer to let you share my cabin, for that matter? Ten gold crowns is not worth it. No, fucking sleep in the bilge and find a rat to eat, because I only have so many meals, dude. I ain't got Grand Hunt Mastery. I can't just be handing out food to every Tom, Dick, and Gregor that comes along. And I can't heal myself of starvation damage now that I'm in the New Order books and the healing is, like, super horrible, so... No. No. I'm not going to take your 10 gold crowns and then, like, give you one of my meals if that's what you think is going to happen. Might as well just fucking forget it. I am going to take your 10 gold crowns, though. <laughs> take your 10 crowns and... That's it. I'm not going to give you any food. He took Kaiser, so he made you let him share your cabin and food? Gregor, yo, man, you remember me from the Kai Woodstock Festival and that herbalist math lab? <laughs> Right? Fair weather returns, and the Azan makes good speed as it crosses the jade green waters of the Gulf of Tentarium. It is shortly before noon of the following day when the first glimpse of Zarloom is sighted by the lookout, and less than an hour later you find yourself sailing into the harbor of this grand city. Okay, I gotta say, I'm already honestly surprised we made it this far without disaster. Emerald pennants flutter from its towers and the roofs of its sun-bleached houses, and crowds of industrious citizens throng its paved avenues and alleyways. This old Shatakin port has a long history of free and fair trading. It is many miles from the cities of Shatakin political power which lie to the south, and due to this fortunate fact, 
It has been spared much of the damage inflicted upon this troubled land by a succession of ruthless and tyrannical rulers. The ship enters and docks at the harbor wall, close to the jetty of a warehouse, which contains the iron and copper ingots that it will carry to soon. As the crew begin the task of loading the cargo aboard, you agree to help Gregor find the Lordanian Consulate, so that he may report the attack upon his ship and seek their help in returning home. You're imagining Fire Snake climbing onto the bow of a ship and belting out, I'm sailing away. I'm not really sure I know how that song goes. I'm sailing away. All I can think of is Sail Away by Anya, which is definitely not the song you were referring to. Or the hymn I'll Fly Away, but that's definitely also not the song. Or the song by Lonely Island, On a Boat, I'm on a Boat. <laughs> None of those are the songs you were referring to. Sail away, sail away, sail away. I'm on a boat. Sail away, sail away, sail away. I'm on a boat. That'd be a great, uh, that'd be a great, you mash those up. Great mashup. And you sail away and, um, Lonely Island's I'm on a boat. That would be a great mashup. Together, you disembark from the Azan and follow a cobblestone road which leads out of the harbor and into the heart of the city. When asked for directions, a helpful trader tells Gregor that the Lordanian Consulate building lies at the far end of this busy main street. He gives the smiling man a gold crown, and then you continue your way along this crowded thoroughfare. Man, this Gregor's just got all kinds of money to give away. Who was the last guy? You remember, this was a lot of books ago. It was many books ago, but there was some guy that we were with in one of the books who kept giving money to everyone, and I remember commenting on it quite extensively. Some fucking asshole that was- and we- I got into a contest with him to see who could be more generous, giving shit away. You know what? I'm not getting in that contest this time. Gregor can give away as much shit as I want. Fire Snake gives no fucks. Look, I'll start being generous once I have Grand Hunt Mastery. And Assimilance. Or, I mean, Deliverance. And I'm no longer on death's door all the time, basically. Prarg! How the hell do you remember that? Fucking Prague. Good times. All right, what book was that in, smart guy? He gives the smiling man a gold crown, and then you continue your way along this crowded thoroughfare. Gregor wishes to reach his consulate, but he is in no great hurry. He suggests that perhaps you and he could first pay a visit to one of the many colorful inns or famous emporia which line this teeming main street. I just get the image of Gregor being like, Hey man, you want to hit up a cold stone on the way? I'm really in the mood for some ice cream. I know he reappeared in one of the later books. Yeah, I do remember that. Do I want to visit the Zarloom Herb Emporium or the Lucky Horse Inn? Well... I would say, oh, I'll visit that Lucky Horse Inn and do some bardsmanship shit, except that didn't work the last book. No matter how many inns I went to, I didn't get to bardsmanship anything. But the Herb Emporium could be interesting. So I'm going to go there because I am an Herb Master. Wait, what What am I? An Herb Master, yes. Maybe I'll find some good, some good useful herbs there. This one is like worded in such a way that you're like an idiot if you take it. If you prefer not to visit either of these famous establishments, I guess you can be a dick and go along the main street to 168. Like the book's feelings are hurt. If you don't get to go to one of these like, I thought both of those places were really cool, but I guess I just wrote those for nothing. If you go to 168, I guess all the time I spent writing about the Urban Emporium and the Lucky Horse Inn was for nothing, asshole. All right, let's go to the Urban Emporium. Let's go to the fucking dispensary. It's medicinal, yo. You enter this imposing herbalist shop and stare in awe at the thousands of stoppered jars that line its wooden shelves and counters. They contain all manner of rare liquids, powders, roots, and tinctures 
most with foreign names that are unfamiliar. You scour the jars and find only two that contain herbs from Summerland with which you are very familiar. Potion of Lomspur and Potion of Alathur. I am very familiar with those. Each of these potions costs three nobles. Who the fuck has nobles? One noble equals one gold crown. Oh, that's a convenient exchange rate. That's a really convenient exchange rate. One or both of them. So there's really only one of each. I can't buy, like, I can't stock up. All right, yeah, I'm going to buy both of those, no question. No question. I have two of these. I have two of these. I have a potion of Alather. Gives me a little plus two CS. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I can carry one more thing. Good. I don't think Moo has a freakish robot-like memory like you, Saito. Alright. Let's leave the Emporium and continue along the main street. At length, you arrive at the Lordenian Consulate, where a guard at the gate allows you both to enter and wait in its cool, tree-shaded courtyard. A few minutes later, you are met by the Consul's assistant, a rotund little official called Cheery. He is shocked to hear of the pirate attack. Okay, why would he be shocked to hear of it? I mean, we're in an area that's famously known for fucking pirates. This whole- this is like Super Pirate Central. Why would he be sh why wouldn't he be like, oh, yeah, another pirate attack, right? Shocked to hear of it. And he urges Gregor to accompany him inside the consulate to make a full written report. He says that it could take several hours, possibly even a day or two. <laughs> Dude's gonna be writing for a day or two? That is a hell of a report. That report is no joke. I'm going to need you to write your memoirs about what happened with this pirate attack. He was cheery, but then the news shocked him to the core, and I see chill running down his spine. Yeah, I mean, I could see him being shocked if Gregor was like, Oh, ship! It was attacked by wooden platforms! You know, that'd be scary, but... Duvall was the fourth book, the leg legacy... Yeah, Captain Duvall was in the fourth book. I know that for certain. I know that for certain. I was like, yo, man, I ain't up for no port report. I ain't going back to the Admiralty with this shit. Anyway, it could take an excessively long time, and so you decide that now is a good time to say farewell to your companion. Before you go, Gregor offers you his heartfelt thanks for all you have done for him, and he hopes that one day soon your paths will cross again. If you should ever visit Foron, Foradon, he says... Stop by the Singing Lamb Tavern on Spike Street. If I'm not there, the landlord will know where you can find me. I'm never going to remember that. You know what? I'm going to make a note, just in case. Just in case. I'm going to make a note. Gregor. Singing Lamb Tavern. Spike Street. Foradon. Just in case. You know what I'm saying? I'm writing it down. You wish Gregor a safe journey home, and then you leave the consulate and make your way back along the main street to the harbor. The heat and dust of the afternoon are making you thirsty, and so you stop to drink from a freshwater fountain set into the wall of a crumbling old temple. The fuck I do? I just create some water out of thin air right above my mouth and drink that shit casually in front of everybody. Maybe not. Do you hear the lambs singing, Clarice? <laughs> Alright, so no, I guess I drink from a fountain. But I purify it first. I want to really want to use my abilities for something. I purify the water. Now, this is where, like, if you're playing a paper game, the DM's like, alright, you find a fountain. And you're the player and you just really want to use your shit because you've never gotten to use it. So you're like, alright, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to purify the water from the fountain. The DM's like, 
dude, it's already it's already pure. You don't need to. Yeah, but I want to purify it anyway. No, it's seriously, it's as pure as it can possibly be right now. It's the purest water you've ever seen. No, but I want to purify it anyway. <sighs> All right, fine. You purify the water. <laughs> I can totally see it. Old quarter, because what the fuck is going to be in a park? All right. You stop to drink from a freshwater fountain set into the wall of a crumbling old temple. The hustle and noise of the street crowd is becoming oppressive, and you yearn to find somewhere quiet where you can rest before you return to the ship. Looking around, you notice two places which promise some respite. The first is a public park which stands upon a cliff that looms above the city to the east of the harbor wall. The second is a narrow, deserted alley that wends its way into the city's old quarter. Hmm, intriguing. Maybe I can busk if I go to the park. Old Quarter sounds like a place where I'm going to get in trouble. Park sounds like a place where I'll just have a nice relaxing time. But maybe that's just what he wants me to believe. Clearly I cannot choose the old quarter in front of you. Clearly I cannot choose the park in front of me. Wonder how Fire Snake purifies water. Maybe he just stares at it really hard until it's purified. Well, you know, it tells how, how it works. It's very clear how, how it works. Uh, Okay, it doesn't tell at all how it works. Just says that they can fucking do it somehow. Left his water purifying cheesecloth at the Kai Monastery. All right, I'll go to the old quarter. That's what Saito wants me to do. The park's probably got some really cool shit that happens, but. Because if I don't go to the old quarter, Saito's all going to be like, Oh, I told you so, because when I go to the park, something bad will happen, and Saito will be like, oh, If you'd gone to the old quarter, that shit wouldn't have happened, and you got, probably would have got the silver bow of Duodon right, if you'd gone there, because it would be really cool. Alright, you follow the shadowy alleyway until you arrive at a small square, which is flanked on all sides by dingy hovels and derelict shops. I do love me some dingy hovels. I'm glad I came this way. Only one of these shops is open for business. A sign nailed above its worm-eaten door says Dulg's Curios. Oh, I do like curio shops, though. There's a curio shop in Planescape Torment that has really cool stuff in it. In fact, I think it's where you buy the strange toy that opens up into the labyrinth where you find, where you find the Modron companion, Nordum. I think you get that from the curio shop. Anyway, a bell tinkles as you push open the creaking door, and a gust of stale, musty air makes you cough as you step into the gloomy interior. Despite its decrepit appearance, you quickly discover that this shop is full of strange and fascinating artifacts. One in particular catches your eye. It is a porcelain figurine of a small child which has uncannily lifelike eyes. The child is alive! Ah, you're a Sam Lending, and you're a connoisseur too, I see, says a reedy voice. From behind a stand of rusty armor, there suddenly appears a little old man. He squints at you through his thick spectacles and wrinkles his face into the semblance of a smile. It is a genuine Nang doll, one of the original 100 that were made for Emperor Hyunstai. Very rare indeed. I am loath to sell, but, well, times are hard. It can be yours for a mere ten gold crowns. Well, I happen to be ten gold crowns richer because I rescued some dude from the ocean. Here's, this is a cool picture. Could I just get the, fuck the doll. Could I get this armor right here with this helmet? That would be amazing. Oh, I want that armor and helmet. And also that skull fucking chalice. I want that as well. But I guess I'm buying this thing, because it's the only thing that I want to buy. 
Old quarters are always good. Oh yeah, old quarter. Well, in real life too. If you go visit a city and it has an old quarter, you gotta go there because it's cool. There's gonna be cool shit. Hmm. You want his fez? He kind of looks like. Kind of looks like a little bit more decrepit uh, Charlie Rose. <laughs> I don't know why I think that. Buy it for 10 crowns, try to barter with the man, or fuck off with the doll. Let's barter. We're gonna barter. Maybe I can bardsmanship. Bar... Barter. Maybe I can bard -er with him. I really think you should lower your price. Your price is too fucking expensive. Lower, 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 lower your price. Something like that. I don't think that would be very convincing. I don't think if you sang that, anybody in the whole world would be like, okay, yes, I'll lower my price. I think they would just, like, I don't know what they would do, but they wouldn't be amused. Uh, <laughs> let's barter. We're gonna barter. At first, the old man is reluctant to lower his price, but then I fucking use my mind blast or my psychic powers on him. But when you shake your head and step towards the door as if to leave, he changes his mind and agrees to sell the doll for seven gold crowns. You nod in agreement and carefully, the old man wraps the doll in a square of linen while you count out seven gold crowns from your belt pouch. With trembling hands, he takes the coins and gives you the package, which you place into your backpack. If I did it to the tune of Karma Chameleon... Lower, 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 lower your price! Or I'm gonna go... Or I'm gonna go... Lower, 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 lower your price! You see something like, something like that? <laughs> Fucking... <laughs> Fucking Karma Chameleon, bud. It's a great song. Boy George, gotta love him. Record the Nang doll on your action chart as a backpack item. Subtract seven gold crowns. Alright. Um. That leaves me 27. I can do meth. And I now have. I now have a Nang doll. It's a backpack item. Oh, I don't like that. I got a straight, a straight up Nang doll, yo. Just felt appropriate. Just felt appropriate. Alright, here we go. This bardsmanship thing. I don't know. Do it long enough, he'll probably pay you to go away. <laughs> yeah. Out of, out of pity for the mentally ill person. And before later in the book, it asks if you have the Nang doll and it turns into a Chucky doll boss fight. That would be pretty cool. You retrace your steps along the winding alleyways of the old quarter and make your way back through the crowd to the harbor. Dusk is drawing its gray cloak across the cloudless sky by the time you reach the Azan. And when you go aboard, you discover that the cargo has been fully loaded. Captain Jenkshi is pleased with his crew and feels they deserve a reward for all their hard work. Half of his men would like to spend the night ashore at the Three Capstans Inn, one of their favorite taverns. The tavern keeper delivered some fresh food to the ship during the afternoon, and he promised a free flagon of ale to any crew member who paid him a visit this evening. The captain gives his permission, but on one condition. All those who wish to go ashore this evening must be back on board before dawn breaks tomorrow. We sail on the dawn tide, he bellows, so don't expect to find us still here if you roll up late. For some, for some reason at first I thought this said y'all. I thought this was the word y'all and I was completely shocked that this character would be saying y'all. But it's not, it's not y'all. Get back to the ship, y'all. All right. I'm gonna go ashore and visit the inn because I'm a bard and bards visit inns. The crew are in good spirits by the time you arrive at the Three Capstans Inn. 
The owner, a pot-bellied man with an oddly childlike face, welcomes the Sunnis with open arms, and he orders his son to be generous with the ale. The tavern has three tap rooms, which are all busy, but not overcrowded. And in each area, there is a minstrel and jugular... Jugular? <laughs> each area, there is one very large vein pulsing. Um, and a juggler to entertain the patrons. During the course of the evening, you learn that these raucous performers are all members of the owner's family. God, why has there always got to be somebody else already doing my thing? Can we get an open mic night at one of these places or something? Denang Brothers, y'all. <laughs> San Andreas reference. I don't know. I've neither seen the movie San Andreas nor have I played the game San Andreas nor have I well I know what the San Andreas fault is in California I do know what that is but that's not what you're making a reference to the entertainments continue for most of the evening until the joyful mood is unexpectedly soured by the arrival of an Eldenoran crew led by their boorish captain these coarse, loudmouthed thugs seem to delight in hurling cheap insults at the Sunnis. I'm gonna whoop some ass in a second here. Stoically, the crew ignore the abuse, quietly hoping that the Eldenorans will soon tire of goading them and leave. But then one of Jenkshi's men rails against a racial slur, and in a moment of anger, he yells at them to shut their foul mouths. For a few moments, the tavern is filled with a deathly hush. Then the Eldenoran captain lunges at him, grabs him by the neck, and lifts him one-handedly off his feet. I've a better idea, you bilge rat! Why don't they shut your mouth up instead, eh? He growls as slowly he tightens his vice-like grip on the helpless crewman's throat. I'm about to stab this dude through his back, and my sword is gonna fucking come out with bits of his fucking heart on it. I don't know if that's really going to be given to me as an option, though. No, I never played any Grand Theft Auto games. In the last book, there were so many performances, festivals, and yeah, and inns and taverns and shit, no bardsmanship, I know. And this book is so far going the same way. I didn't play it in a boat or in a moat or while wearing a coat or with a goat either. Not with a goat as well, in case you're going to ask. Uh, do I want to make him release his grip or apologize to the captain? Not just no, but hell no. No. I got grand weapon mastery now. I'm not scared. I'll fucking kill all these guys. I'll turn this place into a fucking abattoir. I'll cut this dude's arm off straight up like fucking Obi-Wan Kenobi in the cantina scene in Star Wars. You rise from your seat and take a step toward the Eldenoran captain, but his crew are quick to react to your move. They reach to the hilts of their swords, and several hurry to block your path to their leader. You sense that this ugly incident could easily get out of hand and lead to a murderously uneven combat between the heavily armed Eldenorans and Jinxie's crewmen, none of whom are carrying weapons. What the fuck kind of useless crewmen are these with no weapons? A brawl between the two crews would jeopardize the success of your quest, and it could also cost many innocent men their lives. Mindful of these facts, you know you must try to avoid a fight breaking out at all costs. Damn it. Couldn't I just murder some people? Wait a minute, bardsmanship? What? What? I finally get to use bardsmanship? Hell yeah, I'm about to bard my way out of this situation. Battle of the Bards. Let's do this. Turn the ultra creepy Chucky doll on the captain, yeah. Nope, I'm barred my way out of this. Quickly, you take your musical instrument from your backpack and play the first few verses of the Eldenoran National Anthem, entitled Mighty Dewa Dawn. 
Damn it! Duodon! They gotta throw that shit in my face even now while I'm not even playing the same character. They gotta bring up Duodon. I.e. the place where the silver bow was from. Fucking fuck. Fuck you. The loudish Eldenorans begin to cheer and stamp on the taproom floor in time to the music. When they recognize... They're gonna be barred from the bar? Yeah, I see what you did there, Saito. I thought of the same thing, I just didn't say it because, you know, I didn't want to. Well, it wasn't the exact same thing, but it was similar. The loudish Eldenorans begin to cheer and stamp on the taproom floor in time to the music when they recognize their banal battle song. Soon they are all singing along, including the captain who releases his grip and lets the gasping crewman drop in a heap to the taproom floor as he joins in with the chorus. You motion to the others that now would be a good time to leave. Without a word, they move towards the door, pausing only to pick up their injured comrade as they go. The Eldenorans are soon singing so loudly that they do not notice when you cease playing and hurry out of the tavern. You join the others outside and laugh with them at the incredible stupidity of the Eldenorans. It is hollow laughter, but at least it helps to relieve the frustration of having to return early to the Azan. That sucks. I think it would have been cooler if I'd played the song and got like all of the all the uh, crewmen out, and then once all of my my people were out of the tavern, I just immediately stopped playing the song and just started slaughtering the Eldenorans. I think that would have been better. Mighty Duodon, Song of Lone Wolf Failing the Archery Contest. Motherfucker. Once everyone is safely back aboard the Azan, you inform Captain Jinxie of what happened at the Three Capstans Inn. With a resigned expression on his weather-beaten face, he listens to your report and then thanks you for the part you played in saving his crew from further injury or death. He tells you that similar incidents have happened many times before, in ports all over Magnamund. And he is resigned to the fact they will happen again sometime in the future. Eldenorans are infamous for their bigotry and intolerance. Jengshi is just glad that this time his crew had the good fortune to have you looking after their interests. Before you and the crew retire to your cabins to sleep, the captain takes the precaution of posting extra watchmen on deck, just in case the Eldenorans should come looking for trouble during the night. It's fucked up, Saito. It's fucked up. You're making me sad. God damn it, Saito. You awake early the following morning, just as the pre-dawn light is brightening the night sky. Captain Jenkshi and his crew have also risen early to ensure that the Azan is the first ship to leave Zarloom this morning. Shortly before dawn, they weigh anchor and turn the ship about, and by the time the sun crests the horizon, you are already more than a mile away from Zarloom Harbor, riding the morning tide ahead of a bracing westerly wind. Jenkshi tells you that the next port of call will be the city-state of Gold Tabris, where you will dock in four days' time to take on supplies of fresh water. The first day out of Zarloom passes without incident. Then, around noon of the second day, the ship heads south as it leaves the Tentarium and enters the Gulf of Ralzuha. You are sitting on the foredeck, enjoying the sun when the splendid and the splendid views of the rugged isles and coastline when suddenly you notice something in the distance that makes your pulse race. You magnify your vision and see that it is a plume of smoke. It is rising from the hull of a burning ship located close to a cluster of rocky islets. As the Azan draws closer, you are able to see that a flag is hanging from a broken masthead which lies draped over the vessel's smoldering stern. It is a green flag with scarlet edging surmounted by a large silver fish. The sight of this flag makes you swallow hard, for it is identical to the flag that flies from the mast of the Azan. It is the flag of a Sunni's traitor. 
<laughs> God damn it, Saito. That song is fucked up. Your song is so fucked up. Oh, here's to a mighty Alton, master of the bow. While he stands high, lone wolf holds his head low. Swift were his arrows each time his bow he notched. Less so for lone wolf, for him it was truly botched. Now great Alton, plus three on all his bow rolls. And for the Kylo lone wolf, nothing there but woe. <laughs> I just fucked up. It's so horrible. You're traumatizing me right now. Pretty good though. A flag hangs from a broken masthead. A green flag surmounts and by a large silver fish. Yeah, alright, well there's some fire going on there. It looks pretty serious. When Captain Jenkshi and his men first see this flag for themselves, they become very anxious about what may have happened to the crew of this stricken vessel. Many of them have fathers, sons, and brothers who work Sunni's ships in these waters. They urge the captain to search for survivors, and he grants his consent readily. Steer towards the wreck, Tolshi, he says, ordering his helmsman to change course. And I want all other hands on deck immediately. Everyone is on lookout duty. Oh, here we go with the telenosis. No, I don't have telenosis. <clears throat> Your Kai senses scream a warning that you were in great danger as you draw steadily closer to the burning wreck. You tell Jenkshi, but he is greatly skeptical of your seamanship, and he ignores your advice. He is more concerned about fighting survivors than listening to your vague warnings of danger. Unfortunately, he soon has cause to regret his decision, when suddenly a Shadokin man -o war breaks cover from between two rocky islets and comes surging towards the Azan. Yeah, big fucking surprise this is. If you have Talonosis, turn to 111. If you do not possess this skill, close the book because clearly you don't know how to play. <laughs> oh, damn it. Talonosis was one of the very first ones I took as Lone Wolf. It was one of my initial group. Talonosis, Grand Passmanship, Grand Hunt Mastery, Deliverance. Those are all ones I really wish I had, because they seem pretty essential to me, and I don't have any of them this time. That's because that guy that was drowning in the ocean before didn't have a Sunni's flag. If that guy would have been, like, draped in a Sunni's flag, he'd have been like, Oh, let's go over there and get him. Dude is nationist. I just made that up, that's not even a word. Alright, here comes the ship, surging toward the Azan. Jinxi immediately orders his crew to unfurl every last inch of canvas and take evasive action. But the wind is now beginning to change, and this greatly hampers them as they struggle to carry out his orders. You magnify your vision and scour the prow and foredecks of the approaching ship. It is dressed with the scarlet sails of a Shadokai buccaneer vessel, and it is sitting very low in the water. You hazard a guess that it must be fully laden with booty stolen from the hold of the burning traitor. Gambold, too much booty in the hold. 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 It's got too much booty in the hold. It does. Oh. Uh... With the wind going against him, Jenkshi takes a calculated gamble. He orders his helmsman to steer towards a narrow channel between two nearby islets. He is hoping that his lighter craft will be able to pass through the shallows here and gain precious time, while the heavier enemy ship will be forced to go around the isles to avoid running aground. It is a bold maneuver, and one that is made all the more dangerous when the enemy captain suddenly turns his vessel and runs it parallel to the Azan. Oh yeah, see all those cannons on there? To your horror, you see that the Shadokin Man of War is armed with deck cannons. Of course it is. 
As it gains on your ship, you see clouds of white smoke and flame erupt all along its hull. Then, seconds later, you hear the rumbling roar of its cannons, followed closely by the terrifying shriek of its deadly ball and chain shot as it comes hurtling through the air towards your vulnerable ship. What makes it even better is the fact that the skill you do have, Astrology, is literally just a worse version of Telenosis that can only be used at night. Yeah, but hold on. I can use fucking Astrolabes and shit now, so what's up? What's up? What's up? Because that comes into play a whole lot. Here's the yes, your song lives. If any protagonist in these games besides playing were to sing it, Fire Snake would be the one. Yeah. Random number, huh? Does disaster happen, or are things only slightly horrible? Let's find out. Oh, looks like we're going to have disaster. You throw yourself to the deck and take cover behind the wooden parapet of the prow as the enemy's shot rips into the sails and rigging. Shredded canvas and splintered timbers fall about your ears, yet you survive this ferocious bombardment without sustaining the slightest injury. Now that is surprising. If you wish to compare the horoscopes of the sailors of each ship to look for an astrological advantage, turn to page 22. Uh... Aha! We can win this fight! The enemy captain! I've looked at his chart! <laughs> his Mars is in fucking... His Mars is in Venus this month or whatever. I don't know. I don't really know how this strategy thing exactly works, but... Something like that. Um... All right, not the slightest injury. Sweet. Bravely, Captain Jenkshi takes over the helm and steers his battered ship relentlessly towards the channel. You see him cursing the enemy captain and shaking his fist defiantly at the villainous Shadokin gunners as their cannonballs whistle across the decks of the Azan. Then, a gust of wind fills the torn mainsail, and the ship begins to pull away from the lumbering man of war. A second broadside falls wide of its mark, and Jinxi's bold plan finally pays off when the enemy ship is forced to veer away for fear of beaching her hull in the shadow shallows. The crew cheer loudly when they see her red sails falling away to the stern, and the Azan is left alone to make a swift passage through the Islet Channel. This reminds me of Black Sails. It's a good show. Black Sails, you should watch it. You pull yourself unsteadily to your feet and make your way along the debris-strewn deck to congratulate Jenkshi for his masterful display of seamanship. He accepts your praise and the cheers of his crew with a rueful smile. Even though his skill and his coolness under enemy fire have undoubtedly saved the ship and the lives of all aboard. However, as the ship emerges on the far side of the Islets, you soon discover that more than just Jenkshi's bravery will be needed if everyone aboard the Azan is to live to tell the tale of their deadly encounter with the Buccaneers of Shadokai. It's the name of the book! Holy shit! It's the name of the book! That means, you know, when they drop the name of the book, it's pretty serious. So... Book says you can use astrolabes and sextants, but apparently not well. Otherwise, you should have been able to navigate away from this. Yeah. Yeah, the, the other captain's like, lol, fuck it. <laughs> We've got our other two pirate ships just on the other side of that channel that he just went through. That's exactly where I wanted him to go. Classic pincer maneuver. Alright. Yeah, Calico Jack's pretty cool. Tolshi, the helmsman, climbs out of the hatchway to the stern hold, and he hurries over to the captain's side. He reports that the ship is holed below the waterline, close to the rudder, and that she is fast taking in water. Jenkshi inspects the damage for himself and immediately sets his crew at work to work at patching up the damage. They do their best with the materials available, but still the Azan continues to take on water. Jenkshi estimates that the ship will stay afloat no more than three hours, unless proper repairs are carried out, and he orders Tolshi to set a course for Dlashda Ralzuha, the nearest port. 
I did not know that, Saito. You voice your fear that Shadokin pirates may already occupy this port, but Jenkshi laughs when he hears this. So that's what that whole thing was in the show about him just trying to design the flag and all that. That's what that was about, huh? Jenshi laughs when he hears this. If you knew Dlash da Razua like I do, you'd know we have no cause to worry about running foul of any buccaneers there. It's a slum port, a rubbish dump. Its name means Junkyard of the Razuha, and it certainly lives up to its name. Your first glimpse of Dlash da Razua confirms everything Jinxi has said about it. Its rust-red hovels and stinking shacks are grouped haphazardly around the rim of a natural stone harbor formed by a semicircle of black volcanic rocks. Flocks of vultures hover in the sky, swooping to feed occasionally on rafts of rotting debris which litter the shoreline. It is late in the afternoon, and the Azan is listing alarmingly to starboard when at last she enters the stench-filled harbor of Dlashta Razuha. It seems that the whole population of this derelict little port turns out to greet your arrival. For the natives, it is something of a special occasion, for so rarely do ships ever visit their squalid harbor. Despite their wretched living conditions, the poverty-stricken tribal natives of Dlashta Razuha give the Azan a warm welcome and they seem genuinely eager to help Jenkshi and his crew with the repair of the ship's hull. Gruja, the port's oldest man and tribal leader, provides Jenkshi with 50 native men to help with the unloading of the cargo in order that the damaged section of the hull can be raised above the waterline. The captain sets them to work, and he estimates that adequate repairs could be made overnight to enable the ship to sail on the first high tide tomorrow. The crew are pleased to hear this news. None of them want to stay in Dlashda Razuha a minute longer than is absolutely necessary. Yeah, my numerology analysis tells me this port is very bad. While Jenkshi and the crew are busy repairing the ship's hull, you are approached by Gruja, the town elder. He is able to speak a little Samlending, and he asks if you would care to stay the night as a guest in his humble home. He says that he would be greatly honored if you accepted his invitation, and rather than risk hurting his feelings, you agreed to go. Yeah, I don't like making decisions, that's cool. Gruja lives in the best hut in all of Dlashda Razuha. It is the best hut because it possesses a door and a roof which does not leak when it rains. Wow, this guy's living in the lap of luxury. Gruja's family prepare for you a meal of roasted vulture meat and boiled snakes. Wow, that sounds like an epic fucking meal. Roasted vulture meat and boiled snakes. That sounds like something goblins would eat. Alright. Nice. Fucking living the dream here. After this unusual feast, his wife invites their 20 grandchildren. See, these people don't need the Moonstone. They, got, they don't have any problem with infant mortality here, apparently. They also have Zima. Oh, God. I'd rather eat the vulture meat and boiled snakes. Shouldn't Fire Snake be insulted that they're serving him snake meat? Well, I don't know. Maybe he he's eats the snakes to absorb their snake power. I, I don't know. Alright, the 20 grandchildren come and entertain you with an ancient tribal dance in which they each spin around and around for as long as they can before they are violently sick. Okay, these people are goblins. These people are literally goblins. Whenever this happens, the other members of Gruja's noisome clan scream and cheer them excitedly. When at last this display of quaint tribal culture comes to a natural end, Gruja's toothless wife sidles up next to you and suggests that you should pay attention a visit to the Shrine of the Oracle. Oh, this sounds legit. 
she assures you, this wondrous shrine is famous throughout this region, for it dispenses infallible words of wisdom to all those who would seek its counsel. Yeah, well, we're, of course we're gonna go. This is like the Oracle of Delphi up in here. Of course we're gonna go. Rather risk the ship falling in the sea than visit this port. This port is awesome. These people are great. These are my peeps right here. Of course, I'm gonna go to the shrine. <laughs> I just, what the fuck is going on with that illustration? You follow Gruja out of his hut and along a vermin infested path which wends a tortuous route through a maze of slum dwellings and festering rubbish dumps. After a mile or so, this rough track ascends into a wooded hillside and then ends upon a plateau which overlooks the harbor. From here, you can see Jenkshi and his crew working on the Azan by the light of a hundred oily torches. With undisguised pride, Grusia points to the Shrine of the Oracle and invites you to avail yourself of its wisdom. The Shrine consists of a man-sized statue constructed from rusting metal and chunks of driftwood held together with nails, strips of animal skin, and twisted steel wire. Okay, I have arrived at Burning Man. You decide the humor, Gruja, and so you ask the statue to tell you if there is anyone you should trust or distrust during your long journey to Soon. As expected, you get no response. But then a wind arises and it makes a faint whistling sound as it passes through the holes in the statue. For a fleeting moment, you think you hear the words, Bad. Dragon. Is good. But then the wind dies and there is nothing but silence. Grusia smiles. He seems to think that the Oracle has spoken a great truth. Wow, this thing is awesome looking. I wish I had one of these in... Well, I was going to say in my yard, but I don't actually have a yard. But out in front of my apartment, just chilling, would be nice. That is really cool. Honestly. Look at this guy, he even looks like a goblin. Come, we go now! The Oracle speaks but once a day! It has given you good wisdom! You are blessed! On returning to Gruja's hut, you find Tolshi waiting there for you. He asks you to accompany him to the ship at once, for the captain needs you to help with the repairs. It is as if your silent prayers for rescue have been answered. You thank the Elder for the visit to the Oracle and his wife for her hospitality, and then you leave quickly for th with the Helmsman. The captain doesn't really need your help, confides a grinning Tolshi as you make your way hurriedly through the hovels of Dlashto Ralzua towards its tor torchlit harbor. He just thought you'd welcome an excuse for not having to stay all night at Gruja's flea-ridden shack. On your return to the ship, you thank the captain for sending Tolshi to rescue you. And to show your appreciation, you help the crew to patch the damaged hull. At first light, by first light, the repairs have been completed, and the cargo is then reloaded into the hold. Jenkshi gives Gruja and the natives some copper ingots as payment for their help, and then the crew cast off and catch the morning tide. For two days, the Azan hugs the coastline as it sails a southerly course to Gold Tabras. The weather is kind and the ship makes good progress, enabling you to enter port shortly before dusk. Things aren't going too badly. Didn't even get to share of his bounty of prairie oysters. Yeah, well, I'll pass. I'll pass, thanks. A sinister quiet enshrouds the great city of Gold Tabris as the Azan sails beneath the arch of its harbor bridge and docks along its grand stone quay. The only citizens to be seen abroad are the guards of the harbor watch, who quickly approach once the ship is safely moored. 
A sly-faced sergeant informs Captain Jinxi that a night curfew is in force, and that a mooring fee of 100 nobles a day must be paid by all ships arriving after sunset. That's fucking outlandish. That's highway robbery. That's... High seas robbery. That's... Well, it's bullshit. This is a huge charge, and Jinxi complains bitterly, but the sergeant merely laughs as he protests. Pay the fee or forfeit your ship, Captain, he sneers. Jinxi asks that he be allowed to pay tomorrow, so that he may sell some of his cargo to offset the exorbitant fee, but the sergeant shakes his head and refuses his request out of hand. The fee must be paid now, he growls, and in coinage, not cargo. Reluctantly, the captain pays the sergeant using every last noble that he possesses, leaving him with no money to pay his crew or purchase flesh, fresh supplies of food and water in the morning. He tells the crew that he must sell some of the cargo to raise the money he needs. A sale must be arranged quickly, for he cannot afford to stay in this harbor for more than a day. Jenkshi picks a handful of his best crew members and tells him to accompany him ashore to help him find someone who will be willing to buy his copper ingots. You offer to help him, and he suggests that you take half his men and meet back at the ship at dawn. He tells you to accept no less than eight nobles per ingot. He also tells you of two places he knows where a buyer for copper may be found, the Flying Fish Tavern and Coppersmith's Hall. Hmm... Lone Wolf will get the option here to murder the sergeant, his men, their families, and their closest acquaintances. I know, right? And then steal a horse. Just because. Yeah. Well, Flying Fish Tavern sounds like a place where I could bard some shit up. Copper Smith's Hall? Too obvious. Too obvious. Has the word copper right in it. I am not fooled. Guided by your companions, you make your way through the darkening streets of Gold Tabris and arrive at the entrance to the Flying Fish Tavern. The inn is filled with the captains and crews of many of the vessels that are moored down in the harbor. They are a raucous crowd, yet their noise quietens to barely a whisper the moment you and your companions step through the door. Slowly, you approach the bar, trying your best to ignore the dark mutterings that are passing among the hard-faced sailors. I hate dark mutterings. The innkeeper glares at you. It is as if he is daring you to ask him for service. You swallow hard and ask if he knows of anyone who would be interested in buying some copper. I listen up, he shouts to the others. This infidel wants to sell some copper. The crowded inn erupts with laughter. Now grinning inanely, the innkeeper fixes you with his piggy eyes and asks, Just what is it that you've got to sell then, eh? Your father's old spit pot, maybe? Bah, be gone, you scabs. We don't serve the likes of you no more. I'm the new owner of this fine establishment, and we don't want your kind here. When I'm thinking about getting some lunch, I go to the hardware store because the restaurant is too obvious. How did you know? How did you know? I'm not fooled by your sign that indicates the exact sort of product that I'm seeking. <laughs> no! Buy some ale in the hope that it will appear- or wasting precious time here. No, fuck this guy. I'm not gonna buy any ale. Besides, he just said they don't serve the likes of me, so how would I buy ale? I want option three. If you wish to lop this dude's head off and kick it around like a soccer ball, turn to... But that's not an option. So, I will leave the inn. I could have barded some shit, but no. 
They only sell beef there, and then the Moolies would come and shut it down while he's there. <laughs> you resign yourself to the fact that you are unlikely to find a buyer for copper in this unfriendly inn, and so you turn to leave. Seeing this, the drunken louts in the tap room start to jeer at you and throw food and ale at your companions. In the face of this mindless abuse, you lead them out of the tavern and begin retracing your route back to the harbor in the hope of reaching the Azan before night closes in completely. You are within a few hundred yards of the harbor entrance when suddenly a patrol of the city watch come marching around a corner with their spears couched on their chainmailed shoulders. I could use some chainmail. Their officer commands you all to halt and demands that you raise your hands above your heads. Uh... God damn it. Whoop, whoop, this is the sound of the police. Whoop, whoop, sound of the beast. No, um... So 5 -0 just rolled up on me, and I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm being profiled. Walking while some lending. Making a dash for the harbor sounds like kind of a bad idea, though. I am really tired. We'll comply with this officer for now. If I'm all for here, he already would have killed these people, yeah. Again? A fucking gen? The city watch rounds you up and guards you at spear point until two horse-drawn wagons arrive to take you away to the city gale. As you are hoarded, herded aboard these foul-smelling carriages, your weapons, Kai weapon, and backpack items are confiscated and dumped into a wooden crate beside the driver's seat. Alright, they're no longer in my possession, but do not erase them, so that means I'm gonna get my shit back. At the officer's command, the wagons move off at a speedy pace. After a few bruising minutes, your wagon emerges from the gloomy streets and ascends a smooth ramp which passes through the daunting gate of Gold Tabris' Gale. Above this gate flutters a flag which depicts a black serpent entwined around the blade of a silver scimitar. That doesn't sound like a fucking intimidating sort of place. It is the personal emblem of Sescaterra, the ruler of this city, a man not known for either his kindness or for his mercy. I swear one of these days I'm going to get a lawyer and sue these jerks. Let me just check where the refinery is. <laughs> the Gale of Goltabris was once the southern wing of a grand citadel built by Jublaj Kir, the first emperor of Shadokai. Its cells are reputed to be among the most escape-proof of any in southern Magnamon especially those which are located below ground level in the dungeons of the old citadel. Upon arriving at the gale, you and your companions are thrown into a communal cell on the second floor. However, as soon as the galers examine the Kai weapon and equipment that they confiscated from you, they begin to think that perhaps you are something more than just a hapless curfew breaker. An hour after you arrive, the door of the communal cell bangs open, and six armed Citadel guards burst in. They have come to take you away from the Sunnis and transfer you to a separate cell below ground level. Your destination turns out to be a damp, windowless chamber. It opens onto a torchlit corridor that is lined with rusting stands of armor. At the end of the corridor is a guard room, and when you pass by this room on your way to the cell, you catch a glimpse of the wooden crate which contains your weapons and equipment. It is being stored here. You are pushed into your dingy cell, and then the iron door is slammed shut and bolted. As you listen to the footsteps of the guards receding down the corridor, you vow that you will escape from this gale before the night is over.
playing a game of Hangman, I've got the following phrase, I blank 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 you blank blank. God damn it. God damn it, Saito. I'm not gonna play your little game. At least I have elementalism and I can use it here. Calling upon your grand mastery, you focus upon the section of the stone door jam into which the bolt is secured and you cause it to vibrate. It is a slow and tiring process. Lose three endurance points. That's rude. But eventually, the stonework cracks under this persistent pressure. When the strength of the stone has been sufficiently undermined, you are then able to wrench open the cell door. You leave your cell and make your way silently along towards the guard room. Now I'm imagining the part in The Witcher 2 in the beginning when you're creeping through the, the dungeon after being arrested. You are determined to retrieve your Kai weapon and equipment, but you are also aware that you must avoid alerting the guards if you are to preserve your hopes of escaping from this gale alive. Peering around the door to the guard room, you discover that it is occupied by three galers. They are playing cards, and they are using the crate which contains your equipment as a makeshift table. God damn it. In order to get at your equipment, you must first lure the galers out of the room. I don't have a simulance or grand nexus. Seriously, I can't use magi magic here? Alright, no, I have to turn to 130, the loser section. You take a torch from its bracket in the wall and hurl it down the corridor. Then, using your Kai camouflage skills, you press yourself into a shadowy recess in the wall and remain completely still. The guards hear something clatter along the floor outside their room and they react immediately. <laughs> Noxie says, lols, if you're a bard, go to 130. <laughs> If you're a spoony bard, go to 130. They grab fresh torches and rush to investigate both the noise and the sudden dimness that has enveloped the corridor. The moment they step through the doorway, your hiding place is illuminated by the glare of your torches. I don't have a simulant, so four or lower is probably really bad. I need that five or higher. Come on, no whammies. Good number, here we go. A zero! That is much lower than a five or higher. That's the lowest I possibly could get. That's awesome. Is this going to be instant fail? Is it going to be instant fail? I think it is. Oh, it's not. The Galers see you crouching against the corridor wall, and instantly they attack you with the torches and the clubs they are holding. To save yourself from a severe beating, you are forced to fight them barehanded. You are unarmed, ignore all weapon bonuses. Oh, that sucks. Now, right, let me see something real quick. Do I... have a penalty? I don't think I have a penalty. Okay, I know I have no combat skill loss when fighting barehanded. That's what I needed to know. So that means, essentially, my combat skill is 34 instead of, instead of 44. No, I don't have to take off minus four for unarmed because I have, I have the Magna Kai Discipline of Weapon Mastery at max rank, so that gives me the, you know, unarmed fighting thing. Zero, you're humming Mighty Duodon to yourself too loudly as they come out. <laughs> Alright, so, what I'm going to do then is add ten to their combat skill to represent my current failure of combat skill. So they're going to beat me up here. They're going to beat me up. It's going to hurt. First fight I get into in this book, finally. And I'm like, yeah, Grand Weapon Master, I'm going to kick some ass. First fight I get into, I don't have my we fucking weapon. Nice. Oh, but it doesn't say they're immune to Mind Blast. Wait, but can I use Mind Blast? Shit. I don't know if I'm allowed to use... I don't think I can use it.
Well, like it says here under under Psy Surge, you know, it tells you that you have Psy Surge, but it doesn't say anything about being able to actually use Mind Blast to uh, to do anything. And what I read was that in this in the New Order series, you are not allowed to assume any of the abilities that Lone Wolf had. Any of the stuff that Lone Wolf had, you don't have. You only have, you can only do what it specifically tells you you can do in these books. And it does not specifically tell you, like it specifically tells you you can use curing. But you can't, uh, like you don't get it, you don't get a weapon bonus from weapon mastery. And you don't get, and you don't get mind blast until you actually take the, uh, So let me fight these Citadel Galers real quick. We'll just do this. Alright, here we go. Round 1. 34-36. I lost 5, they lost 3. That's very bad. 29-33, round 2. Alright, that's great. I lost none, they lost 10. That's fantastic. Let's get some more like that, please. 29, 23. Shit, I lost five. They lost three. That's bad. I don't like that. 24, 20. Come on. Here we go. Come on. I need a good roll. Fuck. I lost four again. I'm getting whittled down here. I lost four again. They lost five. But still, this is, this is not great. They're going to whittle me down to, like, no fucking endurance. 20 and 15. I'm down to 18. They've got seven. Come on. Let's end this. Let's end this right now. Yes. Good. Still, though, I hate the fact that my endurance got that low. Alright. I won. I'm gonna start healing myself. That's one point of healing. So much for Lone Wolf being a good teacher. Seriously given you apparently have none of the skills from the lower ranks, it seems like you just went welcome to the Kai. Do you have difficulty not swallowing your own tongue? No? Congrats, you're a grandmaster. I know, right? You leap swiftly over the bodies of the slain galers and rush into the guards' room to retrieve your confiscated equipment. You may now erase the asterisk from your action chart. I never even made any asterisks, so how do you think about that? Ha! Such a rebel. As you are sheathing your Kai weapon into your belt, you hear the sound of footsteps descending a flight of stone steps at the far end of the corridor. More Gaelers are approaching. They have been drawn to investigate by the dying cries of their brother guards. Well, now that I have my sword, these motherfuckers better not step, because if they do, they'll get killed. Desperately, you scan the walls of the guard room for some means of escape, and suddenly you see that there is one other exit from this room, a heavy oak door which is banded with strips of black iron. You had to do that because all of those two out of three extra peasant babies running around. <laughs> oh, yeah. Alright, I'm going to heal myself again. I healed myself for two of my two of my ten points. You run to the door, pausing only to pick up a nail that you see lying on the floor. Using this nail, you attempt to pick the lock and open the door before the approaching galers reach the guard room. Uh, I don't have Grand Nexus, so I guess even though I do fucking have Nexus and Mind Over Matter. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter? It doesn't matter because it minds. Because mind is over matter. What? Shut up, Josiah. You're being dumb. Alright. Uh, pick a random number here. Okay. Oh! This time I rolled well. Got a nine. Alright, that's three. After only a few seconds of manipulation, the lock clicks open. You discard the nail and then reach for the handle and twist it. To your relief, the heavy door creaks open to reveal a flight of spiral stairs which ascend, ascend into darkness above. 
Hurriedly, you climb these stone steps and come to a landing where several corridors converge. Some are occupied by Gaylers and other officials of Sescatera's Citadel who are going about their duties. Then you hear the sound of footsteps ascending the spiral stairs behind you. And this sound reminds you of the pressing need to keep moving. You draw upon your Magna Chi disciplines of hunt mastery and pathsmanship to help you choose the best route. And to your surprise, in so doing, you discover a secret panel in the wall at the head of the spiral staircase. You reach out and press a raised stud, and the concealed panel slides open to reveal a narrow passageway beyond. Quickly, you enter this passage, and the panel automatically clicks shut behind you. <laughs> Get the sense that the Grand Master Program at Kai University of Fryland has a big-ass asterisk next to it, and in small print it says Grand Master of Differently Abled Studies. <laughs> I'm differently abled. Differently abled is the best. Fire snake rolls a natural nine for lock picking. Hell yeah! I'm all about that larceny, yo. Okay. Click shut behind me. All right, here we go. Number four. Number four. That's my fourth one. The secret passage is festooned with cobwebs and shows little sign of having been used for many decades. It twists and turns for several hundred yards before ending at a blank wall of crumbling plaster. Closer inspection reveals another panel, one that is controlled by a lever set into the web-strewn ceiling. You pull this lever, and the panel squeaks open to reveal a sumptuous chamber hung with rich and colorful tapestries. Incense smolders in silver bowls, and the perfumed air is filled with the chirping sounds of exotic caged birds. Bards in D&D, um, well, they don't automatically have Thieves' Tools proficiency in 5th edition. But they could, they have lots of skills, so they could be good at lockpicking or pickpocketing. I think the original bards, back in AD&D, or 2nd edition AD&D, they had, the, they had lockpicking ability, but they might not have been quite as good at it as actual thieves. I think originally, though, as a bard, you had to be some other classes first. Like in 1st edition ad and I think you had to be a thief first, along with some other classes, before becoming a bard. Cautiously, you enter this luxurious room and see that it is one of several antechambers which adjoin a larger hall. Seated upon a padded chair in the middle of this hall is a young, dark-haired woman who is dressed in flowing white silks. Her head is bowed and she appears to be upset. She is sobbing quietly. Wait, did I find what's her name from the last book? The one that was taken? Is that who this is? Fire Snake's lady friend. Araya, of course you remembered her name. Yeah, of course I visited Barrakeesh. One night in Barrakeesh, Anna. No. Doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Well, I knew you were going to see her again. It was so obvious that you were going to see her again. I didn't know it would be this soon. Or here. She's sobbing quietly. What's up, Oriah? Alright, so this is my fifth point of healing. I think it's the last one I'm going to use for the moment. Your heart misses a beat the instant you recognize the face of this unhappy young woman. It is Oriah, the highborn daughter of the Funtal of Fiofidali the runaway who traveled with you aboard the Pride of Summerland on its ill-fated voyage out of Barrakeesh. Ever since she was abducted in the mountain town of Kilij, you thought it unlikely. The mountain town of Kilij, the fucking killing village. You thought it unlikely that you would ever see her again. 
Yet here she sits, alone and dejected in the hall that is overflowing with an abundance of riches. Or is she a hellgast? <laughs> when that slaver archer guy mowed you down. <laughs> yes, that's basically what happened. Where I was forced to play The Price is Right Losing Horn. Uriah! You whisper hesitantly. That didn't sound like a hesitant whisper at all. Hardly daring to believe that it is really her. She raises her head and her eyes widen with shocked surprise when she sees you. Then a smile filled with hope and joy lights up her tear-streaked face. She leaps from her chair and comes running to you to throw herself into your arms. So she's happy to see us, I guess. Oh, Grandmaster, she sobs. I never thought that I'd see you again. How did you know that I was here? You tell Araya of what has happened since you arrived in Gold Tabris, and that you had no idea that she was here at all. Don't say that! You, you, I'm here to rescue you, is what you say. You don't say, Oh, I had fucking no idea you were here. This is just a random accident that I stumbled upon her. No. How did I know? I have my sources. I've been, I've been really beating the pavement all over all kinds of cities trying to find you, of course. It's all I've done. I haven't even slept. I've just been trying to find you. And now I finally have, on purpose, deliberately, for sure, I came here because you're here. That is definitely what happened. Yes. <laughs> That's what you say. You're not <laughs> like, lol, what? I, no, I, it's a total accident that I ran into you here. Weird. This is weird. Um... You tell her that you had no idea that she was here at all. She explains that after she was abducted by slavers in Killage, she was sold to Sescaterra, who brought her here to this citadel. She is to be kept imprisoned in this hall until their wedding day one month from now. Wow. Apparently she's being forced to marry. Let us escape from this place together, you say, but she shakes her head. No, it cannot be. Sescaterra is holding my friends. They're his hostages. If I leave the Citadel before our wedding day, he will put them to the sword. I cannot leave, but I know how I may help you to escape. Come, Grandmaster, follow me. You know, you can call me Fire Snake. You ain't gonna keep calling me Grandmaster. I'm just saying. I don't stand on ceremony. Besides, my Grandmaster title is a little bit dubious. Let's just put it that way. Driven here by my lack of actual Grandmaster skills, I know, right? Oriah takes you to another antechamber where she opens a door concealed behind a hanging tapestry. A narrow torch-lit passage lies beyond this door, and together you follow it until you arrive at a domed alcove. Here, Oriah touches the head of a marble statue, and the alcove swivels open to reveal a balcony encircling a large hall. Peering over the parapet, you see that it is the main entrance hall to Sescaterra's citadel. Its polished stone floor lies some 20 feet below the balcony, and its doors are guarded by two impressive warriors. They are attired in gold armor which glimmers in the weak rays of sunlight that are now filtering into the hall through its stained glass roof. Sounds like a cool place. Sido says, Meanwhile in Somerlin, Lone Wolf watches as the women pregnant with triplets near his birth. Anxiety racks him as he watches the woman strokes her belly, humming happily. <laughs> you must hurry, Fire Snake. He whispers through gritted teeth. You must hurry. <laughs> it's fucked up, Sido. It's fucked up. I'll be damned if all three of those infants will be born healthy. <laughs> Not on my watch. Um... Wait a few moments, whispers Araya. They are the night guards. Dawn is breaking and soon their watch will be over. There is always a lapse before the morning guards come on duty. The doors will then be unmanned and you will be, you will be able to escape from the citadel without being seen. Wait, if she has this whole escape thing figured out, why the fuck hasn't she escaped? I don't trust this. Minutes later, just as she predicted, the warriors march away and leave the doors to the citadel unguarded. Oriya wishes you good luck, but as she leans forward to kiss you fondly on the cheek, a stern voice suddenly shatters the silence of the hall. Oriya, what deceit is this? 
You spin around and see a tall, broad-shouldered man clad in a high-necked robe of purple silk. He has emerged from an archway, and he is standing near the parapet rail at the far side of the balcony. Sescatera! gasps Uriah. She snatches her hands. Oh yeah, because Sescatera will kill her friends, right? Good call, good call. She snatches her hands to her mouth, and then she swoons and faints. Seriously? Seriously, Joe Deaver? She's got a swoon and faint? She, she fucking has... She, she succumbs to the vapors? Is that what's happening right now? Are you, are you being serious? You catch her as she falls, and you lay her carefully down upon the floor. Man, Anita Sarkeesian would not have good things to say about this lone wolf book. Sescatera shouts for his guards until he notices that the hall below is empty. He curses their absence, and then he begins to move around the balcony towards you. He is unarmed, but not for long. He grabs a ceremonial weapon from a stand of armor and quickens his pace. As he levels this deadly spear at your chest, you see that his eyes are filled with a blind, jealous rage. Snock's move Fire Snake also swoons and fades, thinking it's part of the escape plan. <laughs> Wolf, he's not the hero Summerlin needs, but he's also not the one it deserves. Oh man, Fire Snake is kind of lame compared to Lone Wolf. All right, yes, I've been to Bisutan. One night in Bisutan, and no, also still doesn't work. As he stalks closer, Sescatera suddenly realizes that you are not a native Shadokin. What gave it away? <laughs> Your fair skin and Kai clothing reveal to him that you are a Northlander. Wow, nothing fucking gets by this guy. Real fucking Adrian Monk here. By the ghost of Agarash, he hisses through his gritted teeth. You're the cur who slew my brother, Darasun. And now you come here to my citadel to steal my bride. By the gods, you'll pay for this with your life. Yeah, yeah, now I'm going to kill you. I'm going to send you to meet your brother, son. Which honestly makes his resemblance to Steven Seagal all the more jarring. Details, details, Noxmoo. He just did somehow. He's a villain. He made it happen. Sescatera lifts the spear in his right hand and spins it by the haft. It is an impressive display of control, which leaves you in no doubt that he is a formidable fighter, at which point I just pull out my fucking pistol and shoot him. Vengeance will be mine! He screams. Alright, well... It's time to do this. I do have a bow, and I wish to use it. Shit, if I just want- This could be that scene! Instead of the bow- Instead of the pistol, it could be the bow! This could be that scene! Oh my god, that would be amazing. If this guy does his whole fucking spinning his spear around doing this whole expressive weapon display, and I just pull out the bow and fucking one-shot him, that will be hilarious. Come on, I need a roll. I need a fucking Alton beating roll here. And I do have Grand Mas Weapon Mastery, but unfortunately not with bows, so I don't get to add five. You draw an arrow to your bow and take aim at Sescatera's head. His dark eyes widen with shock when he sees you release the bowstring, but as the arrow comes speeding towards his face, he recovers his composure and attempts to bat the missile aside with the blade of his spear. But then he realizes that's actually unbelievably hard as fuck, and unlike the fact that you see that shit in the movies and TV all the time, you really can't do that, probably, unless you're like some sort of crazy person who's practiced it for fucking hundreds of hours. So actually, he fails and dies. It'll be hilarious regardless of the result. Oh my god, I hate you. Okay, so here we go. Oh, I have to get a nine. I have to straight up roll a nine, which I just did a little bit ago, but I'm not gonna roll another one, probably. Come on. Come on. It's time. For nine, it's nine time. Let's do this. That's not a nine. That's a four. Fucking fuck you, roll random number button. I'm sick of your shit. I got a nine eventually, but that doesn't count. I don't get to one-shot this guy. 
So track three from this roll for each time you have sang Mighty Duodon in this adventure. <laughs> God, his combat skill. What? Sescaterra succeeds in fending off your arrow, and with breathtaking speed, he lunges forwards and cleaves your bow in two with the blade of his spear. Delete this weapon from your action chart? What is this shit? What is this shit? I just got my bow taken. That's not even a word. I had a friend that used to say that all the time, and I'd always be like, that's not a word, dude. He always said tooken instead of taken. And I told him a million times it wasn't a word. And now I'm saying it. You drop the sundered halves of your shattered bow and leap back to avoid a sudden whirlwind flurry of thrusts and sweeps that threaten to decapitate you. Hurriedly, you unsheathe your Kai weapon, and the clang of striking metal echoes throughout the hall as you parry Sescaterra's relentless rain of blows. Then the sharp report of your colliding weapons is answered by the dull ringing of a bell in a distant part of the citadel. It is an alarm bell, and it is announcing your escape from the Dungeons of the Gale. Alright, so here we are against Sescaterra with Medallion of Weapon Skill. He's got a ludicrous combat skill. So basically this is sort of like if Harrison Ford ended up going to shoot the warrior and instead shot himself in the knee. I used to be an archaeologist like you, till I took a bullet in the knee. Um... I don't know if it's night or day. I'm underground, aren't I? I don't think I get daylight bonus here. But, do you know how screwed I would be right now if I hadn't taken Weapon Mastery? My combat skill would be 39. 39 versus 53. I feel like I need to drink this potion of Alather. I feel like I need to drink it. That'll make his combat skill effectively 51. This is gonna be ugly. This is gonna be ugly. Conduct the combat normal way for two rounds only. Oh, good. If you're still alive after two rounds, see, they're expecting you to get your ass kicked here. Alright, here we go. Round one, 23-42. Oh! Took 10 off of him and didn't even get hurt. That's sweet. 23-32. Come on. Oh my god, I did it again. I'm kicking this guy's ass. Fuck your after two rounds thing. Let's go. I want to go the whole... I want to go the distance. I want to go the distance here. I just took 20 points off of him and didn't even take any damage myself. Man, that potion of Alather really got it done. Alright. Um... But then we have to end the thing and turn to section 215. Your second blow has gashed Sescaterra's face. It is a minor wound, but it is enough to make him break off the combat. He staggers backwards, clutching at his injured cheek with his left hand, and you see blood begin to trickle through his fingers. Then there is a noise over on the far side of the balcony, and moments later three citadel guards come rushing through the open archway. Kill him! shouts Sescaterra, and he presses, him, presses himself flat to the wall so that they are able to get to you. Fucking Kai Alchemy. Looking down into the hall, you can see that the main doors are still unguarded despite the incessant ringing of the alarm bell. <laughs> Fearing that your only route of escape may soon be sealed off, you sheathe your weapon and leap over the parapet. Octomy says, in before Sescaterra is the new Kadak. I know, right? This isn't going to be the last time I fight this guy. We all know it. Alright, I guess the battle's over. I wasted my potion. I'm going to drink one of these right now. No, I don't have Kai Alchemy. Fire Snake just YOLO this? I guess he did. I mean, I don't know how far he left, but he's got this covered. You roll as you hit the hard stone floor of the entrance hall below in order to lessen the breathtaking shock of impact. No, don't... I can't take any more damage right now. I just can't. 
And no, I don't have Grand Hot Mastery, god damn it. Alright, let's roll. An 8! Hey, there we go, there we go, there we go, there we go. Maybe I won't take too much damage. The actions you employ to lessen the risk of injury prove successful. With nothing more than a bruised shoulder to show for your daring leap, you are able to spring to your feet and escape through the main doors at a run. See, that reminds me of a thing that happened in my life. I was, uh, I was learning Kung Fu for a little while. I was going and, and studying Kung Fu, and I had this teacher. And one day he made me learn this forward roll, this forward diving roll, and he made me practice it like, I don't know, fucking 200 times or something. Forever. For fucking millions of times I had to practice that forward diving roll. And then, like, I don't know, months later, at the time I was working as a pizza delivery guy, months later, I was, when I, after I'd already stopped doing kung fu and everything, I was delivering a pizza, and after I delivered the pizza, I was walking back to my car, and I started going down this flight of stone stairs. I was at the college. I was at the University of Nevada, Reno, delivering a pizza, and there was this flight of stone stairs that I had to go down to get back to my car, and I tripped on something, and I fucking was falling straight down the stairs, like, and I was going to fall right on my fucking face at the bottom of the stairs, like, it was just, I mean, I was completely falling through the air, and I remembered how to do that roll in the split second moment, and I did that fucking roll when I hit the ground down there, and I was completely unharmed, and I got up and rolled immediately to my feet, and wasn't hurt at all. And I was like, oh my god, that was so badass, I'm a fucking ninja. That was the only time I ever actually used my kung fu skills. But uh, it saved me from obvious uh, injury that I, that I would have otherwise sustained. So there you go, martial arts, they're worth it. In case you trip on some shit, martial arts can save you. I learned that from my weeks as a trapeze. Yeah, <laughs> he learned that from his time spent with Cirque du Soleil. Once outside the main doors, you hurry across a wide stone bridge that spans the dry moat encircling Sescatera Citadel. Ahead, you can see a cobblestoned plaza which is flanked on three sides by municipal buildings and shops, and on its fourth side by barracks and stables. The sound of the alarm bell is beginning to awaken interest in the plaza. Faces peer from windows, and you can see men running to and fro inside the barracks compound. Then the gate to the stables swings open, and suddenly there appears a man on horseback. He is one of Sescatera's guards, and he comes galloping towards you with a lance leveled at your chest. You skid to your halt and quickly focus on the rider's horse. Using your Magnakai discipline of animal control, you command the horse to jump in the air. This has the effect of startling the horse, and in its confusion it begins to buck and twist. The rider is thrown from his saddle and left sprawled unconscious on the ground. Well, that was pretty easy. Now you use your Kai skills to calm the startled horse. Hey, I could do that with bardsmanship, you know. Just saying. I didn't lose three endurance points delivering pizza, yeah. That's why I picked this Kai weapon, because it's the Circus of the Sun. Yeah, that is it. <laughs> Soleil Strike. I don't know how you say strike in, in um, French, but... As he settles down, you leap into his saddle and escape from the plaza at a gallop. The incessant sound of the alarm bell follows you through the early morning streets of Gold Tabris. Okay, hold on. This alarm bell has been ringing for a long time now, and I just want to point out, they don't have electronic alarms and shit in this setting. That's an actual bell. An actual person has to have been standing there, furiously ringing that thing all this time. I mean, I can just imagine, like, ten minutes, he's like, can I stop ringing this yet? They're like, no, keep ringing the bell. <laughs> keep ringing it. When do I get to stop ringing? Seriously. The incessant sound of the alarm bell follows you through the early morning streets of Gold Tabris. Even as you reach the entrance to the harbor, more than a mile from the citadel, you can still hear it echoing over the rooftops. You look back over your shoulder and see that you are being followed by a dozen riders. They are all citadel guards and they have been ordered to stop you at all costs. 
As you gallop along the harbor wall, your heart sinks when you see that the Azan is surrounded by soldiers. You race past them before they have a chance to load and fire their bows, but you soon come to the end of the harbor wall where you are forced to a halt. The bridge which spans the harbor entrance is too narrow to cross on horseback, and so you abandon your mount and hurry across it on foot. You are nearing its center when you see a trading ship passing directly below. It is leaving the harbor. Suddenly an arrow pierces your cloak and makes you freeze in your tracks. The soldiers are firing at you, and to your dismay you see that they have sealed off both exits from the bridge. As they begin to move towards you from each side, firing as they advance, you climb onto the parapet of the bridge and attempt to leap onto the deck of the passing trader. Oh, I'm just jumping onto any old random boat now. They had to call the other guards for reinforcements to ring the bell. Yeah, we're gonna need reinforcements over here. Dude is getting tired. His arm's getting tired from ringing this bell. Um, Frapp is strike, Frappuccino, hmm, not so much, Frapp, so I could call my sword, Frapp Soleil, <laughs> my fucking sunstrike sword, Frapp Soleil, strike of the sun. Uh, alright, so they're firing at me. I'm gonna leap onto the deck of the- Magi Magic, finally! Fuck you, Kai Alchemy! Uh, take it, Kai Alchemy. I don't need you. I will survive. As long as I know how to love, I know I'll be alive. Is that how it goes? Anyway, I'll survive. Without you, because I got Magi Magic. Let's do it. Let's magic magic this shit up. About to pull some Gandalf shit. As you leap from the parapet of the harbor bridge, you utter the words of the old kingdom spell Shield to help protect yourself from the arrows that are whistling. Oh my god! Fire Snake just used Quen. Saito should be so happy right now. Fire Snake just used Quen. God damn it, Fire Snake. You just screwed up my no Quen playthrough. Spell shield to help protect yourself from the arrows that are whistling past on all sides. It is a precaution that undoubtedly saves your life, for one of the arrows shatters against this invisible barrier as it comes speeding towards the side of your head. Now you're one of us. Yeah. Well, come on now, go! Ma Wait, it's Kai Alchemy. Come on now, go, Kai Alchemy. Just walk out the door, Kai Alchemy. Just turn around now, Kai Alchemy. Because you're not welcome anymore, Kai Alchemy. It's not the best rendition, really. You hit the moving deck and your legs crumple beneath you. Why didn't I do a cool roll this time? Barely winded by the fall, you have difficulty in standing and are barely able to rise to your knees. Instinctively, you reach for your weapon. You are feeling vulnerable and are fearful that the crew of this traitor may attempt to throw you overboard before you fully recover your senses, and you are ready to start butchering random merchant sailors for no reason, if need be. Yet to your surprise, you hear that they are cheering. Your daring escape from Sescaterra's guards has impressed them immensely. A tall man with wavy gray hair takes you by the arm and helps you to your feet. He hands you some coins that fell from your belt pouch when you hit the deck, and you thank him for his kind assistance. You notice that he is wearing the five stripes of a merchant captain of Cyan on the sleeve of his blue jacket. Oh my god, they're the blue stripes. I've just been rescued by fucking... by... by, um... Vernon Roach. It's the blue stripes. Captain, it's another bard. Throw it overboard with the rest.
Weren't you the one who tried to hurt me with that discipline of the Kai? Did you think I'd crumble? Did you think I'd hit zero EP and die? <laughs> I will survive! Ah, <laughs> uh, good one, Saito. A little, a little too many syllables, maybe, but still good. Alright, so, sleeve of his blue jacket. You must have ruffled Sescatera's feathers good and proper for him to have turned his guards on you like that, he says with a wry grin. Then he faces his crew and says, Anyone who can achieve that can't be all bad, eh, lads? The crew cheer again. It is plain by their reactions that they are glad to be leaving Gold Tabris and its tyrannical ruler. The captain hands over the running of his ship to his bosun, and then he helps you to his cabin where he pours you a reviving draft of Sienese Ale. How, how reviving? How many endurance points do I get back? Let's talk about endurance points right now. No? God damn it. This brew has a peculiar gray-green color, but it tastes delicious. You soon learn that you have jumped aboard the Sea Sprite, a Sienese merchantman under the able command of Captain Radyard. It is carrying a cargo of fine wool and linen, and is bound for the port of Masama on a voyage that should take eight days. Radyard had expected to sell half of his cargo in the Gold Tabris market, but the heavy mooring charges and the unfriendly mood of the natives there had prompted him to make an early departure. His native homeland, Sien, has traded with Somerlin for centuries. Radyard much admi admires your land and its people, and he is happy to allow you to stay on board his ship. You are thankful for his hospitality, but you feel you should offer him some form of payment for your passage to Masama. I do not possess the sea and crown. Where the fuck would I have gotten that? Would you like some... Would you like a straight up Yang, Yang doll, yo? Perhaps I can interest you in this lantern. Take a handful of coins from your belt pouch and offer them to Radyard as payment for your passage to Masama. But the jovial captain declines to accept them. There is plenty of room on his ship, and he is happy to allow you to stay aboard for free. He refills your glass with ale, and then he proposes a toast. It is one that you readily applaud. To the long and continuing friendship of our peoples! To Summerland and Sien! Yay! I readily applaud. When you and the captain return to the main deck of the Sea Sprite, Gold Tabris is little more than a tiny speck shimmering on the far horizon. Hold on. I want to look at the Hooray for Nationalism. <laughs> Slido. Where's the map? Where the fuck is the map? Where's my fucking map? Okay, Gold Tabris. Man, we have a long fucking way to go. A long way to go. Look, we've got to go from here, Alzian, okay? Across this entire map, and across almost this entire map. And we're just now leaving here? Oh my god, we have so far to go. We have a long-ass journey just to get to Masama, and then once we're at Masama, we still have a whole other map to cross! Nang. Hey, there's Nang. I wonder if I'm gonna go there. I have their doll. Gold, Gold Tabris is little more than a tiny speck shimmering on the far horizon. Your daring leap from the harbor bridge is still the talk of the crew, and they are eager to shake your hand when Radyard proudly shows you around his ship. The CNEs are a friendly crew with a keen sense of humor that they readily share. You enjoy being in their company, and the next three days at sea pass effortlessly. That's not a good sign. It was an eight-day journey, and they just told me three days pass effortlessly. That means five days are going to fuck you. On the evening of the fourth day, Radyard drops anchor off the coast at a place called Castro's Door. Apparently it's the entrance to Cuba. See what I did there? It is a narrow strait that runs between the jungle mainland and the Isle of Cobra. The Isle of Cobra? 
Is that where Cobra Commander lives? So you send G.I. Joe to attack this place because it's the Isle of Cobra. Yeah. All right. The night is calm and clear, and the stirrings of a warm southerly breeze promise fine sailing for the following day. Yet despite these good omens, you awaken next morning feeling ill at ease. As you are leaving your cabin to go on deck, suddenly you hear the lookout in the crow's nest shout a warning that chills your blood. Man of war off the starboard bow! I didn't get your reference, Saito. I didn't. Oh no, they're reusing the fucking same uh, illustration. That's not good. You climb the stairs to the foredeck and scan the horizon for signs of a pirate raider. Less than a mile away, you can see a huge vessel with a purple mainsail sailing towards the strait. Captain Radjard appears at your side and he views the approaching craft through his telescope. Way anchor, he orders. Unfurl all canvas. I want every ounce of speed shall give us lads. The captain's urgent orders stir the crew into a frenzy of activity. As they set about their duties, you ask Radyard what is wrong. Without taking his eye from his telescope, he says, That Sescatera's flagship, the Triassus, I'd recognize her sails anywhere. That scoundrel must want you badly to have sent the parade of his battle fleet after the likes of us. With all canvas lowered, the sea sprite cuts a rapid course through the glassy blue waters of Castro's door. Yet, the Triasis has the advantage, and relentlessly she closes the gap until no more than 30 yards of water separate her from the sea sprite's starboard beam. The CNEs cajole and curse and wave their fists at their pursuers, but their bravado soon crumbles when they find themselves staring into the muzzles of a double row of wide-board naval cannon. A warning shot from a swivel gun wh whistles through the sea sprite's rigging, and then you hear the voice of Saskatera himself. Surrender the Northlander to me, Captain! He shouts through a loud hailer. What the fuck is a loud hailer? I assume it's basically like a... Basically like a... a like a... Like a loudspeaker? Like a... What do they call those things? A megaphone? Like a megaphone? Or I'll have my gunners blow your ship out of the water. Radyard glances at you with fear in his eyes. He knows that he cannot outrun the Triasis, and he also knows that Sescaterra is not a man who is given to making idle threats. They're about to throw me overboard and go full steam ahead. You're right, Noxmu. I will... Hmm... I will volunteer to surrender to Sescaterra in order to save Captain Radyard and his ship. I'll be heroic like that. Radyard is clearly impressed by your act of selflessness, and he thanks you. He orders his crew to hoist the sails, and he tells his bosun to wave a white flag from the stern deck to signal to Sescaterra that he is complying with his command. A longboat is launched from the Triasis to collect you. It is carrying an officer and six marines, each armed with a half-pike and a boar pistol. You present yourself to the officer, and he ties your hands with cord before placing you aboard the boat. Radjard and his crew watch grim-faced as the longboat pushes off and begins its return run. Four of the marines are rowing, whilst the officer and the other two watch you closely, the tips of their shortened naval pikes never wandering far from the vicinity of your heart. You turn to look to the jungle shore, less than half a mile distant, and suddenly a bold plan springs into your mind. If only you had Kai Surge, which I don't. I'm going to heal myself a little bit more right here. Kill myself a little bit more. I don't have Kai Surge. Can't I Bardsmanship or Astrology or Herbs Master my way out of this? 
Gold equals unbelievably stupid, pretty much. You coil yourself up tightly like a wound spring in preparation to leap from the longboat. The officer is nervous, and when he sees you shifting in your seat, he panics and overreacts. The instant you make your move to leap over the side, he lunges at you and attempts to plunge his half-pike into your chest. And just do a little bit more of this while we uh, have a chance. Grand number if I have Grand Hunt Mastery, but I don't. That'll probably insta-kill me. So let's get this five or higher, please. Yes, I got it. I have not yet died in this book. I shouldn't have said that, though, because now I'm totally going to die. As you tumble, I'm going to do one more heal real quick. I have two points left. Two points. As you tumble over the side of the boat, the tip of the officer's half-pike misses you by inches. Upon hitting the water, you sink like a stone, but your Magna Chi discipline of Nexus soon frees you from the cord that binds your wrists, and you are able to strike out for the distant shore. Only once you have passed beyond the shadow of Sescaterra's flagship do you dare come up for air. As you break the surface, you notice that the crew of the Triasis are scouring the sea, straining themselves to catch a glimpse of where you are. A marine on the prow deck spots you, and to your surprise, Sescatera's crew begin to laugh and jeer. Oh, this isn't good. YouTube will remove this video for copyright infringement for singing Mighty Duodon, even though it's not really a song, because YouTube is all of the dicks. Yeah. I've never actually had a video pulled down or removed or whatever. I've got lots of copyright claims on a lot of my videos where the owner of whatever song is played in whatever game or whatever, they get to monetize my video because of their copyright. But I've never actually had one where they said the video had to come down because of it. I've uploaded a lot of videos. You're trying to fathom the reason for their laughter when suddenly you are struck in the back by a heavy, powerful blow. Mm, oh, good. No matter what you roll, you're going to take some damage. Alright, come on. I need an odd number. Odd, 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 odd. Zero is not odd. Apparently. How is zero even odd or even? I guess zero must be even because one is odd. Damn it! I just took five. I just took a five piece. I can't be. I can't. I don't just have health to spare here, guys. I can't be taking damage. I don't have the heals. All right, well, let's see what happens. Now, do you have Nothosaurs and Pleosaurs terrified me as a kid? If I had ever even heard of those things as a kid, they might have terrified me. I don't know, but I didn't. If I had ever even heard of those things, now <laughs> I've heard of Pleosaur. I've never heard of Nothosaur in my life. Yeah, you're right, there it is. It's time for some dinosaur killing. The shock of the unexpected blow knocks the air from your lungs and somersaults you down into the water. You draw upon your Kai skills to numb your pain and gather your senses, and as your vision clears, you discover that you are still in one piece. However, the satchel containing the Moonstone is no longer slung around your shoulder. I just lost the Moonstone. Failed the quest. The strap is broken, and you glimpse the bag sinking towards a coral reef five fathoms below. Suddenly you sense movement in the water and you twist around. Speeding towards you comes a marine monster. It is returning after having rammed you in the back. It resembles a gigantic crocodile, but one with a blunt-muzzled head and scales of dull gray horn. As it closes for the kill, its great jaw swings open, revealing a ghastly red maw lined with dozens of dagger-like fangs. This doesn't seem good. Seems like Lone Wolf could handle this, but I'm not so sure that Fire Snake can. Wish to try to reach the surface and fill your empty lungs with fresh air? Or decide to unsheathe your Kai weapon and prepare to defend yourself? Oh, man. This isn't good. I feel like I gotta get air first, right? But something bad is gonna happen to me if I go for air. It's just gonna 
grab me and bite me and maul the fuck out of me. Fuck it, I can hold my breath. I'm a Kai Grandmaster. I got my Kai Grand Mastery degree from the University of Arizona. I'm good to go. Here we go. Let's do this. You steel yourself to attack the creature as it spreads its massive jaws and gets ready to devour you hold. Nagumusa. That's 40 combat skill and 50 endurance. The creature is immune to all forms of psychic attack. Unless you possess Grand Nexus, reduce your combat skill by 4 due to your desperate lack of oxygen. You are unable to consume any potions prior to the combat. If the Kai weapon you wield is Ulnarius or Spawn Smite, you'll benefit from the bonus. Yeah. This isn't great. This isn't great. My combat skill is going to go down. I don't have a lot of endurance. I don't know that I really... This really counts as being in daylight. Although, light from the sun does go down into water. And I'm kind of up, I'm kind of near the surface, so I think I'm in daylight. I think I'm in daylight, guys. So I'm going to reduce... But I have to give him 4 because of this. So he'll, he'd have 44, but then I'm going to reduce him by 1, so he'll have 43, essentially. Good news is you can still beat this guy. The bad news is that by the time you surface, you'll be mentally retarded due to brain damage. Hold on, dude. If Lone Wolf can survive underground without water for 15 days, then I should be able to survive for a fucking few minutes with... You know what I'm saying? Alright, let's go. There we go. This isn't gonna. This is gonna be bad. This is gonna be ugly. I'm gonna take a ton of damage here, if I even win. Yeah, but I'm a grandmaster too. Just not as good as Lone Wolf. They're 25 and 50. Go. I lost three. He lost six. Okay, I can live with that. 22 and 44. I lost three. He lost six. All right. 19 and 38. Here we go. I lost two, he lost eight. That's really good. We need more like that. 17 and 30. Ooh, I lost four, he lost five. I don't like that very much. 13 and 25. Come on, come on. Yes! I lost none. He lost 14. That's what needs to fucking happen. Come on. Let's just take him out right now without any further endurance loss. 13 and 11. Yes! Took him out without further endurance loss. Woo! I mean, I'm still, my endurance is really low, but still, though. We, we win against the fight. We just killed a dinosaur. Just killed a dinosaur. Killed it. I killed it with Frap Soleil. I win. Better start healing up. And as soon as I fucking get to the top, I'm gonna drink this also. Healing points one. The monster rides in its death throes, spreading its blood like a huge crimson cloud through the warm tropical sea. For a fleeting moment, you surface to take a breath. Then you dive through the cloud of blood and retrieve your lost satchel from the coral reef. Having regained your precious charge, you stay submerged and swim towards the shore. Aching and close to exhaustion, you crawl from the sea and work your way slowly up to the beach to the cover of a fallen toa tree. Here you lie upon the wet sand and look out at the two ships standing half a mile off the coast. The longboat from the Triassus is circling the blood-stained water, and its crew appear to be searching for your remains. Time to pick a random number. I got a four. That's probably not good. This is uncharacteristically badass of Fire Snake. I know, right? He handled some business. What? What? I'm going to use my last point of healing. I now have none. Oh, 
While you are observing the longboat, you repair the broken satchel strap and check the condition of your backpack and weapons. Whilst doing this, you discover that you lost one backpack item during your underwater battle. Erase the third item on my list. Oh, it's just the rope. I can live with that. I thought I was going to lose one of my musical instruments. I was going to be unhappy. It's like the Electro Spider of Doom. This wasn't as bad as the Electro Spider of Doom. Although I'm now at 19 Endurance and have no more healing whatsoever. No potions, no fucking curing points, so... That's not good. Soon the longboat abandons its search and returns to the Triasis. You watch as both ships unfurl their sails and depart from the coast, the Triasis heading north and the Sea Sprite sailing south. Suscaterra must be satisfied that you perished during your encounter with the terrible Nagumusa. Your only regret is that Captain Radyard and his crew probably believe this to be true as well. When you can no longer see the two ships, you take out your map and unfold it on the sand. Map. So... I'm crazy fucked here. We just went through Castro's door. Let me turn that cover off. Just went through Castro's door right here. So I just... I'm on the shore here somewhere probably. And I've got a long way to go to get to Masama. Like how it seems as if Devers made it far easier to suffer damage while also limiting the amount you can heal. Hey, you want a shitty main character? No? Well, what if I throw in devastatingly nerfed healing? Ha! Just kidding, I'm not asking. Yeah, I know, these books are harder. Okay, we looked at the map. Aided by your Kai tracking skills, you determine that you have come ashore at a tip of a mainland peninsula at a point close to the Isle of Cobra. The nearest city is Masama. It lies over 300 miles away to the southwest, beyond a wide expanse of dense jungle and hills. The thought of traversing this uncharted territory, alone and on foot, is one that fills you with dread. But you take comfort in the knowledge that you survived your battle in the sea, and that you still possess the Moonstone, and most importantly, that we got to the cover art and handled that shit. Yes, we handled the cover art situation. You were tired and hungry after your, your ordeal. Unless you possess the discipline of Grand Hunt Mastery, you must now eat a meal or lose three endurance points. Fortunately, I have a couple of meals, so I'll eat one meal. Yum yum. You set off along the shore, keeping the waters of the Gulf of Serpents in sight to help you gauge your progress. The jungle bordering this coast is teeming with wildlife, yet you detect no sign of tribal inhabitants. After your encounter with the natives of Dlashda Ralzua, you decide that perhaps this is a blessing. You spend the first night encamped on the beach, and then you begin your trek early the following day. <laughs> not side is everyone on the Isle of Cobra is required to scream COBRA whenever they're about to do something. No shit, right? If you'd like to use your cell phone to call up Bainton for a sky taxi ride, turn to page 211. That would be nice, man. That would be so good to have the sky ship come pick me up. Fine weather, wild game, and an abundance of freshwater streams make your trek far easier than expected. On the fourth day, you happen upon an ancient track that climbs into the hills and joins a newer trail. Your tracking skills reveal human footprints, but your excitement wanes when you determine that they are more than six months old. Steadily, the trail climbs higher into the hills until you lose sight of the gulf waters. As darkness approaches, it begins to rain. Within an hour, it has become a torrential downpour that turns the trail into a fast-flowing stream. It becomes impossible to continue, and so you search for somewhere dry to spend the night. Your tracking skills lead you to a cave, but when you enter, you realize at once that you are not the only creature seeking shelter here tonight. Oh, damn it. Animal mastery, really? 
Can I please use bardsmanship here? You see the glint of amber eyes at the rear of the cave, and you detect growling, loud enough to be heard above the noise of the pounding rain. Your instincts tell you that there are two creatures lurking here in the recesses of the cave, and that they are both hungry, scared, and potentially dangerous. Yes, I can use bardsmanship! Thank you so much! It's about time. Alright, I'm gonna bard this fucking shit. I'm gonna bird it up. Here we go. I bust out my flute and my lyre. Play some songs. Me and the animals are just cool. We're chilling. What? What? They just said to me, Hey, you wanna use bards of a chip? Ha <laughs> ha, sucker! Just kidding! Bards are crap! <laughs> I just got fucking owned! It actually gave me the option to use the thing, and when using it, you still gotta fight! You take up your instrument and begin a soothing ballad that you hope will calm these hungry creatures. Unfortunately, the sound of your playing has an adverse effect upon them. They react in anger and immediately attack. Hurriedly, you drop your instrument and draw a weapon as two wolf-like animals come bounding towards you from the rear of the cave. Now that was some bullshit right there. That was some fucking hostile adversarial DMing shit right there. Come on. Creatures are especially susceptible to all forms of psychic attack. Double all bonuses if you possess Kaiser. Yeah, but I don't. Wait, look at the note. It's the cho- as the colo- it's fucking cholos. What's up, cholo? The ch colo is especially susceptible to all forms of psychic attack. It seems reasonable that you may double all bonuses. Yeah. 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 I don't think it does, because look. That Mind Blast is talking about is the Mind Blast that's mentioned here. Under Kai Surge, see it says right here. Grandmaster of the option of using a weaker form of Psychic Attack called Mind Blast. But that's only listed under Kai Surge. So I don't think... I don't think I'm supposed to use Mind Blast. I'm just gonna fucking fight him. Guess what? It's also not daylight. It's also not daylight. Okay. Oh, I can't believe I just got fucking rolled on the bardsmanship. They fucking... At the beginning of the book, they tell you, Hey, guess what? You can now use your bardsmanship to calm animals or whatever. And it sounds like, hey, this is an incredibly lame and useless thing, but every once in a while it might come in handy. Then you get to this point, and you're like, finally, yes, I get to use it. And they're like, haha, no, sucker. No. Actually, you just made things worse. Alright, here we go. 19 and 28. Good. They lost 11, and I lost none. Let's do that again. 19 and 17. Yes, they lost 16... I lost none. Doesn't seem like a thing that could actually happen. I'm at plus four. Oh, it can happen if you roll a zero. Okay, good. Come on, 19 and one. I don't want to lose any endurance here. I lost one point. Okay, I can live with it. Firesync should have sang some more mighty do it on. God damn it. If you have the silver bow of do it on, the fucking colo are so impressed that they don't even attack you. Alright. I won, but I'm hurting. I'm hurting. You wipe your weapon on the scraggy bodies. That's not a verb. I mean, an adjective. Come on. Scraggy? Is that really... We're going with that? Alright. Scraggy. S sounds like a rapper. Scraggy bodies of the slain Colo, and then you drag them out of the cave by their tails. Your encounter with these wild animals leaves you feeling anxious for your safety, and you spend a restless night in the cave listening to the rain and the sounds of the surrounding jungle. 
During your lonely vigil, unless you possess the discipline of Grand Hunt Mastery, you must eat a meal or use- Wait! Wait! I just literally killed two animals! Why can I not eat colo meat? Why- Why can't I- I don't need to hunt! I have two dead animals right here, they're wolf-like it said. That sounds like perfectly good mammals, ready to be eaten. Damn it, Saito. Damn it. I mean, I have a meal, but still. I shouldn't have to use it. I should be able to just eat some fucking colo and call it a day. Alright, here we go. By dawn, the heavy rain has ceased, and you get ready to continue your trek. As you leave the cave, you notice that the bodies of the colo have disappeared. Tracks in the mud show that they have been claimed during the night by larger nocturnal predators that thrive in this untamed jungle. The rains have transformed the hill track into a muddy ditch which makes the going difficult. Yet it is still the quickest way through this territory and you stay with the track until it comes to the bank of the swollen river Aka. There was once a bridge at this point, but your Kai tracking skills inform you that it has been washed away during the night. You are about to set off along the bank in search of somewhere to cross when suddenly you hear a desperate cry for help. You turn and see a man being swept downstream by the river. Is it a man or a hellgast? His head is barely above the surface and you can see at once that he is near to drowning. Oh, I can use elementalism. That's cool. Watch, now I turn to it and it's like, no, actually you try to control the water and it just drowns the dude and it comes up and slaps you in the dick. And it, your life sucks because you used elementals, and that's pretty much what they just did to me with the bardsmanship. All right, so <laughs> we're gonna use it though. It's motherfucker. You direct your Kai powers at the river in an attempt to divert its current and send the drowning man towards the safety of the bank. However, the current proves too strong to be altered using your. Di See? Every time I try to use one of my abilities, they're like, no, uh-uh. The current proves too strong to be altered using your discipline of elementalism alone, and you are physically and mentally weakened by the exertion of your attempt. Lose three endurance. Are you fucking kidding me? Twice in a row, you just screwed me when I tried to use an ability? This shit doesn't happen to people with Kai Alchemy. Having discovered that you cannot help the drowning man using your Grand Mastery alone, you are forced to resort to more direct and conventional methods. As he goes under for the last time, you dive into the muddy water and swim across the surging current. Guided by your sixth sense, you locate his body and then pull him to the surface. You fight to maintain your grip as the powerful current sweeps you downstream, and you are propelled along for more than a mile before it finally deposits you on the opposite bank. As you drag the man from the water, you notice a group of huts in the distance. You are about to haul the unconscious man over your shoulder and set off towards them, when suddenly you detect that he has no pulse. Using your Magnakai Discipline of Curing, you are able to restart his heart and empty the water from his lungs, yet you are unable to restore him to full consciousness. The sudden sound of voices makes you look towards the huts where you see a group of natives pointing excitedly in your, your direction. And then it turns out they're cannibals, right? They are all wearing jerkins and loincloths made from animal hide. Or is it human hide? Clothing that is identical to that worn by the man you have saved from the river. You call to them and wave your arms to attract their attention and they quickly respond. You are expecting them to be pleased that you have saved one of your kinsfolk, one of their kinsfolk. But as they come closer, you are shocked by their unexpected response. Damn it. Damn it. That is really trolling doing it twice in a row, Noxmu. I mean, that's just fucked up. Joe Deaver is a, ma is a bad person. If you would like to take a moment to reflect on your poor discipline choices, turn to 20.
not just cannibals, but undead cannibals with psychic powers that will decrease your CS by half unless you have Kai screen. Yeah, I won't be surprised. I will not be surprised. Turn to 20. The natives are angry. They come running towards the riverbank, screaming and slashing the air with their primitive weapons. Their leader shouts at you, and although his dialect is unfamiliar, you are able to understand enough to, to hear that the man you have saved from the river is a thief and a murderer. He escaped from the settlement last night during the rainstorm, and the leader is accusing you of being his accomplice and of helping him to escape. He says that the river gods have brought you back to their village to pay for your crimes. You attempt to protest your innocence, but the leader refuses to listen. He confiscates- What? Why do I allow this? F some fucking random indigenous people with spears and loincloths? How much combat skill could they actually have? Why can't I just chop some of these people down and be like, what now? Okay. He confiscates all of your equipment, including your Kai weapon, your belt pouch, and your backpack, and the satchel containing the Moonstone. And then he has his men march you away to their village where you are locked in a hut. I'm in jail again? Jesus. Fire Snake gets incarcerated more often than I do. This is ridiculous. This is just some bullshit right now. They're probably gonna feed me Nutra Loaf, too. You don't ever want to eat Nutra Loaf, just in case. If you're wondering uh, what the fuck is Nutra Loaf, you don't even want to know. It's not good, is what it is. It's something that's technically legal to feed to prisoners, and that's about that's that's the best thing you could say about it. Um, locked in a hut. How do you lock up a hut exactly? I mean, what kind of hut? What's this hut made of? Shouting through the closed door, he tells you that the village elders will meet tomorrow at noon to decide your fate. A few hours later, you overhear two guards outside the hut, and you are shocked to learn that the man you saved from the river has since been executed. They say that the elders of the village decreed that he should be weighted with rocks and thrown back into the water. You have no wish to su suffer a similar fate, and so you quickly set about finding a way to escape from this hut. Well, I do have magi magic. Wait, in before, lol, your magi magic doesn't work, and here's some damage. Or something else worse happens to you. Kai Alchemy probably works awesome. I'm gonna use Magi Magic then. Turn to three. This this bodes well. You concentrate on the wall of the hut at a point directly opposite the guarded door, and then you summon forth the old kingdom power word, Glor. Wow, that sounds fancy. The concussion of your spell word hits the wall. Wait, did I just Fusro Da this fucking shit? The concussion of your spell word hits the wall and punches a ragged hole through its bamboo timbers. You run at this hole and charge the weakened wall with your shoulder. It cracks and splits open, enabling you to force yourself through the gap and escape. Yeah, basically like Ard. Kai Alchemy. <laughs> Nox Moon says, Kai Alchemy, the hut turns into gold and the natives worship you as a god. Yeah. Pretty much. Oh, hey. Night has fallen since you were first imprisoned in the hut, and you are able to use the cover of darkness to avoid being seen. You are anxious to escape from this place, but you are not prepared to leave without first retrieving the Moonstone, your weapons, and your confiscated equipment. Yeah, I can't leave the Moonstone here. Well, it would still have a door that would open. It would just be a door made of gold. You allow your Kai Sixth Sense to guide you to where your Kai weapon is being stored. It is a large wooden shack at the center of the settlement, and it is occupied by the village elders. Soon, the news of your disappearance prompts the leader to order a search. You stay hidden until the shack is empty and the coast is clear, and then you enter it by means of an open window. Inside, you discover all of your confiscated equipment, as well as several other items which could prove useful during your quest. Okay, a bow. I need a new bow, because my other bow was chopped in half by Spear Guy. 
I've got I've got plenty of arrows. Actually, I should have used an arrow when I shot. Whatever. But now I'm up to six. A spear, a rope. I need a new rope because I lost my fucking rope in the dinosaur fight. Fish hooks, rice wine, soap. Ooh, a crystal prism. I want that. I've already got a lantern. Alright, uh, we'll take some fish hooks. And some soap. And a bottle of rice wine. Because I can. Because I can. Got my straight up Nang doll yo back. Take all the things and then burn, bury, destroy the rest. And then creep around in the dark and fucking murder every one of these people in their sleep. Having restored your equipment, you leave the shack and make your way into the jungle. Your Kai skills enable you to avoid the villagers and make a swift escape westwards into the hills. Lone Wolf is counting on Fire Snake. Lone Wolf doesn't want to live in a world where at least a third of the population isn't dying from STDs. Do you? Good call. Three miles from the village, you discover a jungle trail. You keep to this trail and stay on the move all night, foregoing rest in order to distance yourself from the hostile natives. Shortly before dawn, you crest a wooded ridge and see the port of Masama in the distance. It lies astride a wide river that is dotted with many trading posts and fishing boats. As you approach the port, your muddy and disheveled appearance attracts jibes from the children of Masama. Stung by their rude remarks, you decide that you are in desperate need of a bath. I do have some soap. So you go down to the riverbank to wash away the worst of the grime. And I do have some soap. I need a towel, though. That's what I need is a fucking towel. While you are here, you notice that the two halves of the town are connected by a series of wooden bridges. The opposite side of the river is home to the business district. Here are wharves and warehouses and a quay that is filled to overflowing with trading ships and barges. The sea sprite was bound for this port, and although you cannot see her moored among the scores of ships at the quay, you decide to go there and check if Radyard and his crew are still in port. Hey, that'd be convenient. You cross the river by bridge and enter a market square bordered by warehouses, taverns, and busy trade emporia, that are crowded with foreign crews. As your keen eye wanders around this bustling scene, you try to decide where first to look for Radyard and his men. Free Traders Tavern, I have had really bad luck with taverns and inns. Really bad luck. Warehouse and Trading Post, or Liama's Emporium. Let's check out the Emporium. I'm all about Emporiums. Maybe the Emporium will have some healing potions and shit. You enter the, the crowded emporium and marvel at the sheer variety of goods that are for sale. Lencian silverware, spices from Maitan, animal hides from Southern Karnali, to name but a few. There is even pottery and ironware from your homeland, all stacked side by side upon the shelves and counters that fill this busy store. This is like a Pier 1. You make your way to a counter and ask a moon-faced youth in a leather apron if he knows the whereabouts of Radyard, the master of the sea sprite. <laughs> yeah, because some dude that just works at the Emporium knows the whereabouts of all the random sea captains that might happen to fucking dock at the city. Th that's, that's, this is the guy you ask directions of? Some fucking kid that works at the grocery store? Some fucking, like, bagger? Alright. Look, nobody wearing an apron knows anything. Master of the Sea Sprite. He has never heard of the captain, but he is eager to help and he does not want to lose your custom. He invites you to look around the Emporium while he goes and asks his employer. You browse along the shelves, and although you find many of the items fascinating, there are only six that you would consider purchasing. A hammer, a coil of rope, 
A silver-backed mirror. A blanket. What a blanket! A steel flask and a pewter goblet. Why the fuck would I buy a pewter goblet? Seriously. The youth returns shortly and you see him shaking his head. He is unable to help you find Radyard and his crew. Yeah, well that's not a surprise to me. I will inquire about the prices of the items I have noticed. Oh. The youth takes a list from his apron pocket and reels off the prices of the items as you point to them on the shelves. All items must be paid for in nobles. Gold crowns are not accepted here. No! No! What? I don't have nobles, and I found a blanket. I don't. Uh, I don't have. I don't have nobles. I don't have... No! 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 I don't have nobles. How ignoble? Nice one, Nox. Alright. It, des it didn't deserve a horn. It deserved an actual Darth Vader now. It deserved an actual Darth Vader now. I had to fucking, like, Google that shit. Ah, uh, okay. I can't do it. Look, why wouldn't they take crowns? I have a lot of crowns. I'll give you a bunch of crowns. Look, I'll trade you some rice wine and fish hooks and soap. And I'll play you a song. I just want that blanket. Just give me the blanket. The youth thanks you for your custom, and as you turn to leave, he suggests that you ask after Captain Radyard at the warehouse. You thank him, and you take his advice. I just got trolled again. Just got trolled again. They teased me with a blanket. Teased me with a blanket. Alright, let's move on. Heartbroken. Forlorn, bereft, bereaved. Wait, what did I just do? Oh. Inside, you discover that the building is filled with vast quantities of raw and basic commodities such as metals, grain, cloth, timber, and leather. As you ex inspect these basic materials, you come across several crates of linen that are branded with a crown and star, the mark of Sian. Your Kai senses tell you that it could be part of Radyard's cargo. Your Kai senses tell you that, really? I mean, we know he's from Sian. Of course it could be part of his cargo. <laughs> Fucking anything we found could be part of his cargo. You don't need Kai senses for that. Monster on the cover should have that classic internet troll face. It really should. The owner of the warehouse approaches and asks the nature of your business. He has an oily smile that you could find easy to dislike. You ask if he knows Captain Radyard, and his slippery smile turns into a scowl. I charge for information, he snaps. Hand over three nobles or be on your way. Oh, what? Apparently I can pay this guy in crowns? Like, no big deal? No, I ain't paying him fucking shit. I'm pissed. Wait, no. My health is kind of low. I can't really be getting in a mess right now. Fine, I'll pay him. The owner pockets the coins and then he gives you a sly smile. Roger upped anchor and sailed two days ago. He's gone back north to see it. It looks like you got here too late, friend. I'm not your friend, pal. Thanks for nothing, you say as you walk out of the warehouse and return to the square. 
As you were looking around and wondering where next to go, you suddenly noticed that there is something happening at the end of a street that leads away from the quayside. You decide to investigate, and you soon discover that the street leads to a large courtyard. Here, the women of Masama are selling their wares, spread out upon gaily decorated market stalls or any of their wares hailing potions. Unlike at the warehouses and emporia at the quayside, the people who attend this market all appear to be natives of the city. As you pass by one stall, you overhear two women talking about a place called Ketezi. One of them is insisting that the whole city has been placed under a curse. You are about to turn back and ask her more about this city when suddenly you are approached by a tall woman who is swathed from head to toe in a fine blue robe. Anxiously, she asks if you are a healer, and her piercing gray eyes continually dart to the satchel slung over your shoulder. It is as if she knows that you are carrying the Moonstone. She knows too much, I've got to kill her. Surprised Southern Magnamon hasn't been nuked yet. Yeah, it's full of assholes, isn't it? Lone Wolf would have had the option here of knocking him out and then burning the warehouse down with him still inside. Oh, okay. I feel like Lone Wolf was like fucking Jack Bauer from 24. And Fire Snake is more like... Castle from Castle. Your Kai Sixth Sense tells you that she means you no harm. You sense that she is greatly troubled, and when you ask what is wrong, she says that her daughter, Harney, is gravely ill. She pleads with you to come and help her, and although you deny that you are a healer, you feel compelled to answer her desperate plea for help. Well, I do have fucking Magna Kai curing. Isn't that good enough? You miss that sociopathic rapscallion. <laughs> oh, what a scoundrel. All right. The woman leads you through the shabby streets of Masama to her house on the boundary of the town's wealthy quarter. It is a two-story dwelling, modest in comparison to others nearby, yet richly appointed with servants, a stable, and a fragrant orchard of Gaian trees. You are ushered upstairs to where a young girl lies in a darkened room. She has a fever and a sickly gray pallor that makes her look more than twice her age. You recognize at once that she is suffering from Mysua. It is a disease that is spread by swamp flies and it is not uncommon among the jungle dwellers of Shatakai. Damn it, Jim! I'm a bard, not a healer! Nice. Using your Magna Kai curing skills and aided by the presence of the Moonstone, you are able to neutralize. See, the Moonstone's willing to heal anyone but me. You neutralize the infection that has ravaged this young girl's body. Within a few hours, her fever has disappeared and a healthy color returns to her face. She shows every sign that she will make a complete recovery. Her mother is overjoyed and she thanks you repeatedly. She insists that you stay here as her guest, and she provides you with your own room overlooking the river. Well, this turned out okay. Sidus says, what I don't get is you can heal others with your skills even when you've exhausted the 10-point limit. Why can't you keep healing yourself? Right? That's what I'm saying. Because Joe Deaver hates me. Over a delicious evening meal prepared by her servants, you learn that her name is Tio Sana. She is the widow of a wealthy trader who was killed at sea when his ship was attacked and plundered by buccaneers. The Buccaneers of Shattakai. It's the name of the book! When her only daughter recently fell ill with fever, she feared she was going to lose her as well. She rarely goes to the market, yet a strange compulsion made her go today. She cannot explain, but the moment she saw you, she knew that it was within your power to save her daughter's life. You retire early to bed and sleep soundly. You may restore six endurance points. That's good. Thank you. Unless you have bardsmanship, in which case you can't. No. When you rise at dawn, you are feeling fresh and eager to continue your journey to the Isle of Lorne. 
In appreciation for saving her daughter's life, Teosana gives you a horse. Gladly, you accept her generous gift, and you bid them both a fond farewell before you set off along the Dragon's Tail, the name given by the natives of this region to the overland route from Masama to the city of Katezi. Wait, why am I going to Katezi? They just said the whole city is cursed. I'm consulting my map. Hold on. Map consult. Here we go. Well, finally I've made it onto the second map. Barely. Oh my god, so many places between here and fucking the Isle of Lorne. Where is this city of Gatezi? Oh, there it is. It's right there. Can't I get just take a ship or something? Of course, ships haven't worked out well for me so far, but still. Gatezi. It's not that... It's not that... So much further to go. Okay. Moonstone doesn't like my music, so it doesn't heal me. You think the Moonstone doesn't heal Fire Snake because it wants Fire Snake to fail, as anything good would want when dealing with somebody whose raison d'etre is increasing infant mortality. <laughs> no, but the natural order, dude. The natural order. After consulting your map, you estimate that it should take you no more than two days to reach Katezi. The weather is settled, and the Overland Trail proves far smoother than its given name implies. By mid-afternoon, you have covered more than 50... What? Am I on a horse? How the fuck have I covered 50 miles by mid-afternoon? That is not a thing that people can do on foot. Oh, where did it say she gave me a horse? How did I just totally miss that? Does it say she gave me a horse? Oh, right here. Tiosana gives you a horse. Okay, wow. How did I miss that? Okay, she gave me a horse. Cool. By mid-afternoon, you have covered more than 50 miles on the horse that Tiosana gave you. And you are pleased with your progress. You are passing through a range of forested hills and gullies when you come to an unexpected fork in the trail. A signpost says that both branches of this fork lead to Katezi, yet it does not give any indication which is the shorter or the safer route to take. Left. It's always got to be left. Left fork. Yeah, I know, the whole disturbs the natural balance thing seems a little bit shady to me, too. Well, keep in mind, they already banned the Moonstone from this world earlier, when the Moonstone was originally here, and the Chianti were here, and they're like, No, no, the Moonstone is way too good. You've got to get it the fuck out of here. Go to the Isle of Lorne. So, I don't know what their deal is, like... Natural balance being presumably a cruel, shitty world where people need the Kai to keep them alive from the horrors that inhabit it, I guess. I mean... Yeah, it's, it's a little bit weird why we're getting rid of the Moonstone, but... We're taking the left fork, though, I know that much. A little way past the fork, the trail passes around a rocky escarpment and ascends through dense jungle to a forested ridge. Beyond the ridge lies a deep gorge, spanned by a sturdy rope bridge. The floor of the bridge is laid with shorn timbers that are wide enough to allow a wagon to pass. You ride onto the bridge, and you are halfway across when its timber floor begins to sway violently. Quickly, you dismount and use your Kai discipline of animal control to calm your startled horse. There seems to be no reason for the bridge to be pitching back and forth, but when you look over the side, you catch sight of a rope that is attached to its underside. This line descends to a crevice in the wall of the gorge, and it is being repeatedly pulled taut and then released. From out of the crevice, there issues a commanding voice. Throw your money and possessions into the gorge! When you hesitate to obey, the voice says, Do it now, or you'll never get off the bridge alive! Ooh, do I want to use elementalism or magi magic? Hmm, well, 
Elementalism fucking failed me the last time. So... Yeah, because who would pray to Kai and Ashir if the world was super awesome? That's what I was thinking, Saito. If everything was too good, then they wouldn't need the gods of good. Gods are like, whoa, job security here. We, the world has to remain kind of shitty f so that people will turn to the gods. Um... Maybe the moonstone in this world is, is an allegory for scientific progress. Oh shit, we just got deep up in here. Um... If you don't trust the author anymore and don't want to use any of your skills, turn to... I know, I kind of don't. Yeah, hmm. Ashira and I were talking about your Moonstone proposal, and we're gonna need you to transfer it to the Isle of Lorne. If you can give me those TPS reports, that would be great. Yeah. Fucking Kai is some fucking middle manager. Alright, I'm gonna use Mad J Magic because it hasn't failed me lately. Elementalism has. You summon the energies of the Old Kingdom spell Power Word. Here we go with more Fusrada. And project them at a shelf of loose rock that overhangs the crevice. It shudders as the concussive energy of your spell slams into it. Moments later, it collapses and comes crashing down, severing the rope like a guillotine as it tumbles past the crevice to disappear into the gorge below. As the floor of the bridge ceases to sway, you quickly remount your horse and coax him across to the far side. You can hear angry voices echoing from the gorge as you spur him to the gallop and escape along the jungle trail that continues beyond the bridge. Ha, ah, nice try, suckers. You didn't know. Bet you didn't know I had magi magic. They're like, oh, look at this spoony bard. We can get him to pay. Uh-oh. I'm out of meals, aren't I? I am. I'm out of meals. Damn it. You ride the trail for more than an hour before you come to a shallow ford across a, a fast-flowing stream. After resting here to let your horse drink his fill, you press on and enter a region of jungle highlands. Night draws in, and you halt to make camp among a cluster of wind-worn boulders close to the trail. The area is carpeted with thick grasses that make ideal fodder for your horse. After making sure that his reins are securely fixed to a rock, you settle yourself down to rest. Unless you possess the discipline of Grand Hunt Mastery, before you go to sleep you must eat a meal or lose three endurance points. I'm going to have to lose the three endurance. That sucks, because I don't have any more meals. Could I just sustain myself on rice wine? Apparently not. You are awoken in the middle of the night by a hideous cry. Your horse is startled and terrified by this gruesome sound, and he tugs frantically against his reins. Seconds later, you are up on your feet, your keen eyes scouring your surroundings for some sign of the threat. Your Kai skills are alerting you to an eminent and deadly danger, a hidden enemy who possesses a strong magical aura. That's a horrible idea, Saito. I'm not going to take some meat off the horse and then heal it back to full. You unsheathe your Kai weapon and crouch behind a boulder. Suddenly, the air before you shimmers and takes form, causing you to gasp in disbelief. <gasps> Something is growing out of the very darkness itself! You glimpse its misshapen head and hunched body, then its outline seems to waver. It flickers and sparkles as if it is caught between two planes of existence. Suddenly, there is a brilliant flash, and a sparkling arc of energy leaps from the shimmering mirage to come speeding towards your face! No, I don't have Grand Nexus. This is about to hurt. But infinite meat! Wow. That reminds me of the infinite oregano thing. 
which is really funny. Hold on. Infinite oregano. I'm just gonna link this here because it's fuck it's fucking funny. I have to stick with the dairy for my meat needs. Alright. Alright, I do not have Grand Nexus, so I'm about to take it to the face, I have a feeling. Oh my god! What? This is this book is kicking my ass. This is so unfair. The bolt hits you and a brilliant flash of white light obliterates your senses. Lose eight endurance points. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be able to finish this book. For a few moments you lose consciousness. Then your senses return and you struggle to your feet. Stunned and disoriented, you shake your head in an effort to clear your blurred vision. Images swirl before your eyes, weaving and coalescing to create a fearful sight. The flickering night creature has fixed itself to the neck of your horse like some nightmarish vampire. Tethered by his reins, your mount is unable to escape from the leech-like maw of this supernatural creature. Wow, some sort of vampire creature is kicking our ass. So, do I want to... Let you heal six endurance at the woman's house, so I'll take eight endurance here. I'm waiting for the book to tell you to cause actual physical harm to yourself. Haha! <laughs> uh, well, I could use Magi magic, maybe. Hopefully that doesn't make things worse. It's the Chupacabra! Oh my god, it is! No, not the Chupacabra! Magi magic. I am so fucked. You focus on the creature and utter the old kingdom word of power. GLOR! He could have picked a better word for the word of power. The supernatural beast shudders as the force of your spell word strikes, but it quickly recovers and continues its terrible attack upon your horse. Desperate now to save your weakening mount, you rush forward to strike the beast with your Kai weapon. Oh my god, I'm screwed. I only have 10 endurance. No way to heal, and now I gotta fight something. That um, and it's not, and it's fucking nighttime. I gotta fight a zoog. This is gonna kick my ass. I have ten endurance going in. Hide the cows. You need them for the barbecue later. Noxmoo doesn't like it when you talk about eating cows, I don't think. It's not amusing. 10 and 32, here we go. Wow, I've already lost fucking 4. And he lost 4, that's not good. 6 and 28. Nope, I'm dead! First death of this book. Won't be the last. Won't be the last. All right, let's give it another try. Let's give it another try. Yeah, being killed by a zoo is you'd be killed by something with that stupid of a name. No kidding, right? 10, 32, 5 and 30, 3 and 23, dead again. Let's try again. Six and twenty-eight, five and twenty. Dead again. That's three deaths. Alright, we gotta back this shit up. We gotta back this shit up. Uh 
I don't think there's any way to avoid... Oh, I could take the right fork instead. I go back to here. I still had 21 endurance. These New Order books are super long. I know, right? Any potions? No, I have no more potions. I have no potions. Alright, let's take the right fork then. Maybe we'll be able to survive going that way. Two miles beyond the fork in the road, you come to an area of low underbrush that is spotted with tiny blue flowers. Swarms of white butterflies hover in the air above them, attracted by the perfume of these delicate little plants. Yay, I finally get to use herb mastery. What the fuck? Maybe I can turn these into healing or something. Herbs. Herb mastery. Yes, finally. Your grand mastery skill warns you that these seemingly innocuous plants are lyra. Their petals contain a powerful narcotic which can be ground down to a fine powder and used in potions to make a person susceptible to mental suggestion, mind control. There are sufficient plants here to produce two potions of lyra. If you wish to keep one or both of these potions, record each one on your action chart as a backpack item. Shit, yeah, I want some potions of lyra. That'll fill my backpack. Too bad they won't heal me, though. I'd rather have healing potions. Enigma Soul! Hey, good to see ya! What's going on, Enigma Soul? How are you? Where the hell can you get some of those lure plants? Fun times? Yeah. They sound really ethical to use those. Good news is the Zoog won't be able to control your mind while it's murdering you. Yeah. This is going poorly. I just died a bunch of times. I had to go back and pick a different path because I couldn't beat the thing on the one path. You ride the trail for more than an hour before you come to a shallow ford across a fast-flowing stream. After resting here to let your horse drink his fill, you press on and enter a region of jungle highlands. Night draws in and you halt to make camp among a cluster of wind-worn boulders close to the trail. Wait a minute. Is this, did it take me to the same thing? It did, 177. The area is carpeted with thick... It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Either path you take takes you to the same place. Yeah, now we get attacked by the fucking Zoog again. Don't have Grand Nectus. Alright, last time I used Magi Magic. What if I don't use Magi Magic this time? Let's see what happens. Got your work done early today? That's awesome. That is really good. Alright, I'm not going to use Magic Magic this time and see what happens. Wait. Oh, I lost my 8 already, though. You can't avoid that, apparently. Spurred on by the pitiable sounds of your stricken horse, you fumble for a weapon with which to attack this creature. Alright, maybe I can kill it with the bow. Enigma Soul sounds perfectly ethical to me. Mind control is totally consensual once you redefine what they're willing to consent to. Yeah, you could get them to, re like, retroactively consent to it once you're controlling their mind, right? Alright, I possess a bow. Let's, let's use it. Oh good, that worked out well. You raise your bow and quickly fire an arrow at the side of the creature's shimmering head. Yet it seems to sense the approaching shaft and the beast destroys it with a bolt of energy that emerges from the center of its being. Desperate now to save your stricken mount, you rush forward and attack the creature with your Kai weapon. Wait, so you only get an illustration of the Zoog? Wow, look at that thing. Wow, look at that thing with its like sucker mouth just sucking on the horse's neck like that. Shoot an arrow, and it's like, nope. Psst. I gotta fight it still. 
Well, we're going to try to fight it a few more times here. like a mind flare cross with a tick yeah kind of can't run a, can't run away while it noms on the horse apparently I need this horse I don't I don't know that I can beat it with 10 endurance here we go round th three rounds dead let's try again so now I've died four times now I've died four times I just need to get like some lucky rolls in a row. Ooh, ooh, oh, oh! We got it down to ten. Five and ten. Yes! I actually beat it on the fifth try? On the fifth try. Yes, the fifth try, I finally beat the Zoog. Sing at the Zoog. Yeah, that, that'll work out. I think my soul may have played a bard in D&D that used repeated casting to modify memory. To brainwash a party member of the course of months. Well, you know, sometimes you gotta do these things. Hashtag bard life. Ready for the ability to manipulate time and space, yeah. Like, as if I can finish the whole rest of the book with five fucking endurance, though. If I have to fight anything else, I'm completely screwed. As you deal the creature the killing blow, its body crackles and disintegrates into a million motes of light that dissolve into the darkness like a swarm of flee fleeing fireflies. You rush to aid your horse, who is lying motionless among the boulders, but sadly you discover that it is already too late to save him. Fear and uncertainty, uncertainty haunt you as patiently you await the dawn. The being that attacked and slew your mount was not of this world. It was a creature born wholly of evil magic. With a gnawing sense of dread, you leave at first light and follow the jungle trail to the west. The forest and vegetation are teeming with life, yet as you go deeper into the jungle, so the sounds become fewer and more distant. By midday, you have covered 20 miles and arrived at a place where there are no sounds at all. The eerie silence surrounds you for several miles further until your Kai hunting skills detect a faint noise. It drifts towards you from among the, pow the towering trees to the right of the jungle path. Cautiously, you leave the trail and make your way towards the source of this solitary sound. And I don't have a simulance. Yeah, right, I'm trying to save my horse and the horse dies anyway. Joe Deaver hates me in this book. <laughs> Doesn't have some weird perverted hypnosis brainwashing mind control fetish. No, absolutely not. What the hell are you talking about? She's a perfectly sweet and innocent girl. Yeah, totally. No, that seems to fit your, your personality as far as I understand it. You're so innocent. So innocent and not into any weird sick shit. In my experience, most gamers are into some weird sick shit. Alright, so... Grandmaster Discipline. I don't have it. I've got to turn to the loser section. Using your camouflage skills and the natural cover afforded by the jungle ferns, you stalk ever closer to the source of the strange sound. You sense that the source is evil. Yet still, you feel compelled to discover what it is that lurks at the heart of this eerie forest. The fuck I do? No, I'm not compelled to discover shit. I'm, to, I'm compelled to discover walking the fuck away from this thing. I'm compelled to notice that I have five fucking endurance left and I can't possibly get another fight, so I don't want to investigate any source of evil. But no, and also I don't have grand passmanship, so I'm about to take pipe, I have a feeling. No, this doesn't look good. Suddenly, your Kai Sixth Sense alerts you to danger, located somewhere above. You look to the canopy of branches and see the outline of a man lying in the boughs of a nearby tree. His limbs and torso are daubed with forest colors that keep him hidden. You hear a faint noise, and then you freeze with fear when you recognize it to be the sound of a blowpipe. Oh, good. Some asshole in a tree shooting a blowgun at me. All right.
Well, this is gonna this is gonna end well. Pick a random number. Basically, I don't have Grand Hunt Mastery, so basically, if I don't roll a five or higher, I probably die here again. Fire Snake has the exact opposite of a self-preservation instinct. No kidding. It's fucking spoony bards. Here we go. I got a five. Exactly a five. Okay, thank you. A little bit of RNG uh, relief here. Um, here we go. Five or higher. Instinct and years of Kai training make you throw yourself to the ground. The blowpipe dart passes within inches of your scalp and then embeds itself in the stem of a broad-leafed plant. Black fluid oozes from the puncture hole made by its tip, and you watch a gas as the plant rapidly shrivels and dies. Alright, let's use the bow. Wait, la by the way, I did al already use it and lost an arrow, so... I'm gonna use the bow against the sniper. Speedily, you draw and fire your arrow, sending it thudding into the chest of the sniper before he can reload his deadly blowpipe. The man tumbles out of the branches to land heavily upon the exposed roots of the tree. You hurry to his lifeless body and discover, to your disappointment, that his blowpipe is broken and his poison darts are somewhere in among the boughs above. After you have hidden his body in the undergrowth, you move deeper into the jungle, guided and drawn by the strange noise. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm really not. I turn around, I leave. Took years of Kai training to teach Fire Snake to get out of the way of dangerous things. Yeah. Not just everybody thinks of that, you know. Oh, oh, good. As you draw closer to the sound, you detect that it is a strange vocal chant. A low ululation that sends shivers coursing down your back. You feel that you are very close to the source when suddenly, through the trees ahead, you see a clearing where a large crowd of tribal natives are gathered. From the cover of the bordering undergrowth, you watch a crow-faced man in tattered black robes standing at the center of this crowd. He is uttering the chilling chant. Before him, on a stone altar, there lies the decaying remains of a body encased in rotting swathings. Your Kai senses reveal to you that the robed man is a Katezi shaman, an evil necromancer who has enslaved these natives with his power. You sense also that it is the same power that was used to create the creature that attacked and slew your horse last night. I also sense that I should leave this fucking thing alone. Nox Mu. Nox is the primordial goddess of night in Roman myth. Mu is what a cow says, therefore you are the night cow. This is like a nightmare, only with more dairy. Suddenly, the terrible sound of the chant ceases, and the shaman shrieks with rage. He points to where you are hiding, and your heart sinks. He has detected your presence. He pounds the altar with his fist, and to your horror, you see the decaying remains begin to shift and stir into life. The shaman intones a dark spell, and the grisly corpse leaves the altar and comes stalking towards you, its fleshless arms outstretched. Waves of psychic energy buffet your mind. They paralyze you and keep you from escaping. You summon your psychic Kai defenses and break this powerful spell. Yet it is now too late to turn and run from the shaman's horror. It is almost upon you. Instinctively, you reach to your satchel, for you sense that the Moonstone is all that can save you from this creature's ghastly embrace. Finally, I get to use the Moonstone for something. All this time, I'm like, why don't I use the power of the Moonstone to deal with this shit? You pull open the flap to reveal the magical stone, and the effect is devastating. I remember that game, Nox. I didn't actually play that much of it. I just played a little bit of it. it seemed okay, though. I'm a little bit weirded out by the hair on this skeleton. Why does it have so much hair if it's a skeleton? What's going on with that? It's pretty cool looking though. There's the, the jiggity ass shaman in the back. Pull out the moon and the effect is devastating for you. Oh yeah, I won't be surprised. This is Joe Deaver fucking, fucking with me again. 
Trollface.jpg. Here we go. The corpse creature implodes the very instant that it is struck by the radiant light of the moonstone. Air and loose earth rush past you to be sucked into the vacuum formed by its sudden destruction, and you are forced to cling to the ground for fear of being dragged into this crushing vortex. Then, with stunning abruptness, the swirling vacuum shoots skywards and vanishes among the clouds. Hmm. The shaman howls with mortal terror and flees into the jungle, his power destroyed. The natives stagger drunkenly as if suddenly they have awoken from a trance. They fall to their knees and begin to worship you, for they recognize that you have broken the shaman's spell and they are in awe of your power. Are they going to like worship me as a god now? Thanks, Kai Senses, for determining who this guy was. You know what would have been even better? If you warned me at the Zoog, or the old guy with the balloon, or Orias Creepy Suitor, or any fucking thing that was going to hurt me. You allow the natives to escort you to Katezi, their coastal city, where you are treated like a hero by the impoverished populace. You learn that Katezi was once a thriving port before the arrival of Ulanga the Shaman. He used his power to overthrow the tribal chieftain, enslave the people, and drive away the traitors. For a year he has been the bane of this port and its poor citizens, but now he is gone and the people are eager to celebrate his demise. They smash the many statues and likenesses of Ulanga that stand in every public square, and they sing and dance through the streets. At a ceremony held in the city's main square, you are bedecked with garlands of flowers and presented with three special items. Wow, I'm getting the hookup now all of a sudden. <laughs> Honestly, if Kai senses were worth a damn, they would have warned you immediately to give the Moonstone back when Lone Wolf presented it to you. Yeah, your Kai senses tell you that going on this quest is a bad idea. Okay, so I got a pouch of Sayo to dust. Restores 10 endurance points, one use only. Using it right the fuck now. To give me 10 endurance back. I got a Talisman of Defiance. Adds plus 2 to combat skill. That's amazing. Talisman of motherfucking defiance. Wait, I should probably actually. I, I should probably. I need to. I need to. I need to notate that this gives me plus two combat skill. I'm up to forty six, and I got the Eye of Laws. Trademark. Control over poisonous snakes. I like the sound of that. That fits my character. All of the above are special items which you keep in the pockets of your tunic. Record them on their action chart and note their special properties. Alright, so I feel like I'm doing okay now. I got healed for 10. My combat skills higher. I can control some poisonous snakes. Maybe I've got a chance of finishing this. Kind of want to have a character whose power is a lame version of Spider-Man Spider Sense, which only detects minor annoyances and inconveniences instead of real danger. Now that'd be hilarious. Yeah, that would be funny. Hey, Boss Pie, how you doing? Good to see ya. Man, Nox Moo is here. Enigma Soul, Boss Pie, and Saito. This is like my fucking greatest hits of, of stream viewers. The whole team. Okay, here we go. The celebrations go on throughout the night, but you are able to find a quiet place to sleep for a few hours before dawn breaks over this happy city. When you tell the people that you must leave and continue your journey south, they are saddened by the news. They want you to stay as their new chieftain, but you persuade them that they must choose a new leader from among their own tribe. Before you leave, they provide you with a mule and some food. Oh, yay, three meals. That's great. I gotta get rid of some stuff, though, because I'm carrying to Okay, fish hooks, get out of here. 
Soap, get out of here. Rice wine, get out of here. I'm taking meals. Meals, meals, meals. Not getting rid of the Nang doll, though, of course. I paid seven good crowns for that. Yeah, five passages later, gonna face a humongous snake that is not poisonous. Would not surprise me. Pulling a Deaver. By mule, you expect the overland journey from Katezi to Kano to take no more than three days. It is a rough, potholed trail, and yet your mule never once misses his footing or causes you to fall. During the afternoon of the second day, you enter the foothills of the Hull Hook Mountains and see a plume of black smoke rising into the sky. It comes from behind a treeless ridge, less than half a mile from the trail. The sound of anguished voices can be heard on the wind, and these cries prompt you to leave the trail and investigate. As you crest the ridge, you see a small native village. Several of the huts are on fire, and its people are trying desperately to save their livestock and quell the raging flames. Uh-oh. Hey, I have elementalism. That seems like it'd be helpful here. Until Joe's like, no, it's not. Haha, <laughs> you take some damage for trying, sucker. That would never happen, though. Oh, wait, it did. It did. And I'm still, I'm still fucking salty about it. All right. Let's elementalism some shit here. You dismount from your mule and hurry into the village. You can never really sound all that heroic when you start off with you dismount from your mule. Like, that's, you don't feel like a badass when you're jumping off your mule to handle some shit. You dismount from your mule and hurry into the village. The fiercest fire is raging through the roof of the largest hut, which dominates the center of the settlement. And it is here that you use your Kai skill to best effect. You suppress the flames, shrinking them and containing them so that the villagers are able to approach with buckets of water and put out the blaze. When all of the smaller fires in the surrounding huts have also been extinguished, the elder of the village thanks you for your timely help. He tells you that the fire was started deliberately by a dragon that dwells in the Hullhook Mountains. Oh, remember we heard a thing about the dragon at the Oracle way back. It was like bad dragon good or something. It is the bane of our humble village, he says, shaking his head sadly. We fear that it will return this night to finish us. Seeing the Kai weapon sheathed at your side, the Elder looks at you with hope in his eyes. He begs you to stay here tonight and help rid the village of its bane. Oh man, don't you know I only have 15 endurance? You want me to fight a dragon? Are you fucking, are you shitting me? Am I being shitted? Well, I'm gonna try to stay and help the villagers. Kinda feel like I have to. The Elder spreads the news to his people that you have agreed to help them, and they cheer you loudly. The women of the village bring you food and wine. Restore three endurance. I had food and wine earlier, and it wouldn't let me heal myself with them. And the children make it their duty to see that your mule is watered and f fed. At sunset, you follow the Elder and a dozen of the village men to a rocky outcrop which overlooks the settlement. They have prepared several hiding places among the rocks, where they can lie in wait for the dragon. They are armed with spears and bows, and you note that they have a plentiful supply of arrows. You take cover with the Elder and wait patiently for the dragon to arrive. You do not have to wait very long. In the fading light of dusk, you see the creature come gliding down from the mountains. The Elder tells his men to ready their bows, and as they carry out his order, you see him smile. He seems to be relishing the thought of avenging the damage this creature has caused. This guy seems a little too happy about all this, considering that we're about to get our asses kicked. The dragon circles above the village and then comes swooping over the outcrop. It is now within arrow range. Wait, what, Enigma Soul? You would have done what? Yeah, that sounds like something Joe Deaver would do, in fact. Uh, 
I'm pretty sure Enigma Soul is pure evil. She's like neutral evil. She doesn't even fuck around with law and chaos. She got she has no time for that. She's gotta focus completely on being evil. Um, do I wanna use a bow or do I wanna use elementalism? Both of these things have failed me badly in this book already, so I guess it's just a matter of which thing I want to be disappointed by. I guess I'll use elementalism. The bow ain't gonna do shit to this dragon. The villagers fire their bows, and every arrow strikes the dragon, yet none of them penetrate the creature's scaly hide. See, that's what I'm saying. You muster your Kai powers and cause a strong gust of wind to strike the creature's belly as it soars directly overhead. It makes the beast shudder, but it fails to deflect it from its chosen course. The dragon circles the village once more and then hovers above the burnt-out remains of the central hut. You observe the creature, and your Kai sixth sense tells you that it has not come here bent on destruction. It is seeking something in the charred ruins. Yeah, that's true. According to the Arctic Oracle, it's not bad. You magnify your vision and focus on the tangle of burnt timber and ash that lies heaped inside the ruined hut. You are unable to see anything clearly, but you sense that there is something lying buried there. You tell the elder of your discovery, and you see a flicker of fear in his old eyes. He says that there is nothing in the hut that could be of interest to the dragon, but your senses tell you otherwise. They also tell you that he is lying. A group of villagers armed with long spears rush to the hut and attempt to stab the dragon. The creature roars at them and then flaps its leathery wings and begins to circle around the settlement once more. You slip away from your hiding place and hurry down to the ruins, for you are determined to discover what it is that the dragon is seeking. Guided by your sixth sense, you uncover a bronze statuette from beneath the ashes. Then the dragon returns. It lashes out at the villagers with its clawed forelimbs and smashes their spears to matchwood. The men retreat in confusion, and the dragon lands and settles itself beside the hut. You move to unsheathe your weapon, but you freeze when suddenly the dragon speaks to you. The creature has the voice of a man. The dragon pleads with you for the return of the statuette, for he, sees, he says that it will remove the curse that has changed his shape. Your Kai senses detect that the creature speaks the truth, and that he is not the evil bane that the elder and the villagers have led you to believe. You notice that the elder and his men have left their hiding places and are now running towards the hut. You focus on the elder and see that a strange transformation has taken place. He is no longer the frail old man that he was. Uh oh, it's Kadak! It's Kadak! He's back! You have to save the dragon from the village. Whoa, I know. This is met this is like a this is like a Witcher quest right here. This is like something that would be in the fucking Witcher games. Um his face has become younger, and it is contorted with a savage rage. Your Kai senses detect an aura of evil that is chillingly familiar. It is identical to that which surrounded Ulanga the Shaman, and you sense that he too is a necromancer. Oh, okay, well, no problem then. I just open up my fucking satchel, pull out the moonstone, and he gets fucking destroyed again. No problem, we got this. He orders his men to take aim at you with their bows, and blindly they obey his command. The dragon urges you to escape with him while you are able, and hurriedly you rush forward to climb upon his back. Oh, could this dragon please just fly me to the Isle of Lorne? I will give you your stupid statue, just fly me to the Isle of Lorne, dragon. The dragon urges you to escape with him while you are able, and hurriedly you rush forward to climb upon his back as the first volley of arrows comes whistling through the hut. Puff the magic dragon, live by the sea, and frolicked in the autumn mist in a land called Hanalee. Is that how it goes? Getting all Pete's dragon up in here. Random number table. I have neither of these skills, so I don't get to add anything. Four or lower probably insta kills me. Come on, come on, come on. I got a zero again. Here we fucking go. I'm gonna fail terribly. Roll to zero. Alright, here we go.
we go. As the dragon takes to the air, you are struck in the thigh by an arrow. I've seen Pete's dragon when I was a kid. I loved that movie when I was a kid. That was so long ago, though, I remember almost nothing about it. Aren't they making, like, a remake of it now? I thought I heard something about they were making a remake of it. Struck in the thigh by an arrow. Pick a number from the random number table. I got a two. And, of course, if it's even... Oh, this time I took less damage. What's, what's this craziness? What sorcery is this? Yeah, Google that shit real quick. Tell me if, I, if that's actually true or if I'm just making that up. Alright, so I took a couple points of damage. Struck in the thigh by an arrow. It hurts. Ow. The dragon lands at his lair in the mountains and folds his wings to allow you to climb down easily from his scaly back. Carefully, you place the bronze statuette into his clawed hand and witness a wondrous trans- Wait! No! Don't transform back yet! You could fly me to the place I'm going first! If, if I got turned into a dragon, I don't think I'd want to be turned back. Honestly. I'd be like, okay, I'm good. I think I'm fine like this. Thanks. I can still talk, I can fly, I'm basically impervious to weapons, I can breathe fire, and I'm a motherfucking dragon and look cool as shit. Fuck turning me back. They're remaking it with CG instead of animation. Interesting. Okay. Carefully you place, place the bronze statuette into his clawed hand and witness a wondrous transformation take place. Slowly the dragon shrinks and its body changes into that of a tall man with a proud and noble countenance. Dude, if I was a dragon, I wouldn't need to play video games. My life would be a video game. I'd be a fucking dragon. I'd like be a superhero and shit. I'd be a dragon that goes around and like fights terrorists and stuff. It'd be awesome. Because, <laughs> you know, that makes sense. Slowly the dragon shrinks and its body changes into that of a tall man with a proud and noble countenance. Not as proud and noble as a dragon. He introduces himself to you as Chrysosa, the leader of the Rivorza tribe who dwell on the eastern slopes of the Holhook Mountains. Unlike the villagers, Krasosa's people have resisted Ulanga's evil rule. Even though their resistance has forced them out of their coastal villages to seek refuge in the mountains. The statuette has broken a curse placed upon Krasosa by Ulanga the shaman. And now he is able to return to his people and lead them back to their abandoned homes. So this guy is basically like fucking uh, Zahua from Pillars of Eternity. Oh, there's the illustration of him going from dragon to... Man, if I looked like that, I would want to stay a dragon. I'm just saying. Before you say farewell, Chrysosa offers you two potions of Lomsper. I love you, Chrysosa. I fucking... I could fucking suck this dude's dick. That's how much I'm happy to receive some healing potions right now. <laughs> there we have a Josiah quote for you right there. Um, okay. Drinking some potions. I'm just drinking them right now. I don't even care. I'm drinking them both. Maybe I'm not allowed to drink them right now. I'm drinking them anyway. Give me all those potions. <laughs> you guys are like, wow. <laughs> He then gives you directions which take you back to the trail, to a place where a bridge crosses a steep banked river. Your map tells you that this is a tributary of the river Ito, and you decide to stop here to rest until dawn before continuing your trek to Kano on foot. Turning tricks for Lomsper- hey, Lomsper's a hell of a drug. I'm willing to do some shit for some Lomsper. 
Thanks, but that's not an extra dose of lobster. Uh. All right. Tributary of the River Ito. Let's take a look at the old map. Let's get rid of the book cover. Slinging that ass for that sweet, sticky icky. All right, here's Kano. Here's Katezi. So, well, whatever. We're hanging to Katano. And then we can go to Wong after that. Everybody Wang Chung tonight. No, that's not has anything to do with Wong. And then Zas Zasa. The place has a good name. And then Nang, like our doll. The Nang doll. We still have really far to go. Really far to go. I'm a little concerned by how far we have to go. Man, couldn't you have just flown me to the Isle of Lorne first? I should have held out for the flying mount and then healed him. You decide to stop here to rest until dawn before continuing your trek to Kano on foot. Now I have to eat a meal. Fine, I'll eat a meal. I got meals. I'll eat a meal right now. Not even tripping. You don't hold out on a dragon. I mean, I could have negotiated with him, you know? I'd been like, please, just fly me to this place. And then I'll give you the, the thing, and we'll be cool. You reach Kano in the early evening. For all its great size and former splendor, this city has the appearance of a half-deserted ruin. The famous grand mansions of its northern quarter are now little more than dilapidated shells, and its paved avenues are broken and overgrown with weeds. Yet despite its state of neglect and decay, Kano is a crowded city, especially at this time of the year. You discover why as you make your way through its twisting, soot-blackened streets. On every other wall, there hangs a gaudy yellow poster announcing the Kano Derby, an annual race that attracts visitors from all over Magnamond. The race is to be run tomorrow, and the inns and boarding houses are overflowing with customers. After a long search, you finally discover a shabby inn called the Song of the Silver Star that has a vacant room. The fat innkeeper informs you with glee that bed and board will cost you six nobles, an exorbitant sum for such a run-down establishment. It's the Derby, he says without a hint of an apology. Beds is at a premium with so many visitors around. Man, do I want to pay this guy six nobles? I mean, all I, I don't actually have nobles, I have crowns, but it doesn't say he won't take crowns. I feel like I should. Then again, I've had bad luck with inns lately. Inns and taverns. You know what? Screw it. I'm not paying this guy. Lone Wolf would have the option to hollow out the innkeeper and sleep inside him. Six nobles. Clearly what they lack in facilities, they must make up in service. I don't think they do. I don't think they do. Look, I'm just going to check my TripAdvisor app real quick. Yeah, no, this place does not have good reviews. It's ranked 326 of inns in fucking Kano. Not good. Not paying him. Put that on my bill, says a voice behind you. The words are spoken by a smiling fair-haired young man who is attired in a cloak of darkly patterned wool, or is he a hellgast? He has strong, some lending features, and the cut of his clothes tell you that he is a member of a guild from your homeland. Well met, Master Kai, he says, offering his hand in friendship. I am Melkar, journeyman to the Silversmith's Guild of Torin. I'm honored to make your acquaintance. Come, join me for a meal. The food here is indescribable, but it fills an empty belly. You look in need of food. Come, join me. I don't trust this guy. I automatically don't trust this guy. He's too good. He's too, like, everything about this guy says you should like him and trust him, which means you probably shouldn't like him and trust him.
All right. You thank the young journeyman for his generosity, and as you share a meal, you learn more about him in this region of Shadokai. Melkar is on his way home to Torin. He has spent the past six months studying in Tiklu at the workshops of a famous silversmith of that city. During his stay, he also studied the history of this region. On hearing of your encounters at sea, he tells you that the Buccaneers of Shadokai, it's the name of the book. It's the name of the book again. They're dropping the name of the book quite often. He tells you that the Buccaneers of Shadokai are renegades from the remnants of a great fleet that was created by the Witch King Shasarak. But are they renegades of funk? That's the real question. He said, well, Matt, you must trust him. Good call, Popspy. Nobody says that except trustworthy people. The Witch King Shasarak. Following the overthrow of their master, these renegades were banished to the wastes of the Saudi Desert by Greystar, the wizard regent of the Free Peoples. Uh, interesting note, Greystar, there's another series of books they came out with that came out before this. They came out during, like, simultaneous with some of the older Lone Wolf books called World of Lone Wolf, and there were four of them. And in those, you played a wizard, a, one of these Shianti from the Isle of Lorne, and, you played, and his name was Greystar. So in those books, which I'm actually going to probably do those books after I um, finish the Lone Wolf books. There's four of them. You play Greystar the Wizard anyway. So that's the Greystar they're talking about right here, is that character that you play in those other books. Pretty interesting. Wizard Region of the Free Peoples. However, the Buccaneers have recently returned to prey upon the rich sea lanes, and their piracy has grown unchecked ever since Greystar disappeared three months ago from his palace in the city of Shadokai. His court officials maintain that he is abroad on a quest to western Magnamund, but rumor is rife that he has been abducted by necromancers who wish for a return to the dark days of Shasarak's rule. Shasarak sounds like a drunk person trying to say, That's a rack. <laughs> By the power of Grace. No, wait, never mind. It says anything with soul. Yeah, try to almost drop some He Man there. Fucking He Man. I thought that shit was really cool when I was a kid, but looking back, He Man, kind of a ridiculous, a ridiculous IP when you think about it. Um. Melkar asks what has brought you to this part of the world, and you tell him simply that you are on your way to the port of Soon to meet with Lord Zanair of Desi. On hearing this, Melkar says that he may be able to help you reach your destination. Do you have a flying ship? Do you have a sky ship? Do you have something awesome? Do you have a teleport thing? Do you... Just, I just want to get there. I just want to fucking get there. Melkar excuses himself and then goes to another table, where he talks with a bearded man wearing a three-cornered hat. When he returns, he is smiling. Old Captain Leongi owes me a favor or two, he says, conking, cocking his thumb towards the man. He can't take you to soon, but he'll take you as far as Nang, and he's agreed to free passage. It's a good offer. You'd be mad to try to go south from here on foot. The Coltanes are full of bandits. You'd never make it there alive, or at least not... Completely in one piece. Naxmu, I happen to be a man that is actually a dragon. And will take you there if you get me a bronze talisman. That'd be funny. So He-Man teaches us that it's okay to wear spandex and fight alternative lifestyle skeleton men. Ring Whistle says He-Man teaching us that it's okay to wake in the morning, step outside, take a deep breath... Get real high and scream at the top of our lungs, WHAT'S GOING ON?! You thank Melkar for his help, and accept the captain's offer. He tells you that Leongi will sail for Nang in two days' time. As you have a day free in the city, Melkar invites you to go with him to the Kano Derby tomorrow. He won two tickets in a dice game last night, and he would be pleased to give one of them to you. Why is this guy being so nice to us? I mean, yes, he's a fellow Somling ding in a very, very far away foreign land, so I guess that makes sense, but still. This guy is, like, suspiciously nice. You accept and agree to meet him here in the tap room for breakfast before leaving for the racetrack.
Okay. You meet with Melkar as planned, and after a meager breakfast at the inn, you follow the crowds who are making their way through the streets to the Kano racetrack. This magnificent establishment dominates the city's eastern quarter, and it has provided the venue for this spectacular derby for more than a century. Unlike the famous horse races held in Slovia and Lorden, the Kano Derby is run by Gwanza, large bipedal lizards that are bred and trained throughout the Southlands. Huge sums are bet on the big race, and the owner of the winning Gwanza stands to collect a purse of 100,000 nobles. That is a ridiculous amount of nobles. Cool thing is, even if I won this, as a Kai, I'm only allowed to carry 50, 50 coins, so, like, I'd have to, like, give away... I'd have to give away 999,950 of them. Yeah, Melkar is curiously similar to the Tolkien baddie. He also promises that you can use bardsmanship that won't backfire at the derby, yeah. Burn me once. Once bitten, twice shy here. I What? I have to fight some dudes. What the fuck? On entering the racetrack, you and your companion make your way through the crowd to the parade enclosures. Melkar is keen to bet on the favorite, for Luzon. But he wants to view the other runners before placing his wager with Rock the Bookmaker. Having satisfied himself that the favorite will win, he goes off to the betting ring while you stay at the enclosure and watch the Guanza lope past. As Forzuzan passes by, your Magnikai discipline of animal control tells you that something is wrong. You sense that the favorite has been drugged with a mild tincture of grave weed and that he will be incapable of winning the race. Quickly, you hurry to the betting ring to stop Melkar placing his wager. He is about to hand over his money when you catch up with him and tell him what you know. Melkar cancels his bet, and Rock the Bookmaker glares at you with undisguised hatred. He signals to a group of his henchmen, and swiftly they surround you both. The moment the race begins, you and Melkar are grabbed from behind and manhandled out of the betting ring. Rock's henchmen bundle you into a tack room below the public stands, but before they can lock the door, you draw your weapon and attack them. I gotta fuck some dudes up, apparently. Well, finally, I get to fight something that's not going to totally wreck me. Good news is that while you'd have to give away almost all the winnings, Prague would never be able to top you. I would permanently win the fucking... the uh, generosity contest. Alright, let's do this, then. I am unconcerned by you motherfuckers. Actually, I'm a little bit concerned, because I don't want to lose any more endurance, but... Nothing I can do about it. I feel like I'm in daylight as well. No. Attack room. Below the public stands. That seems like a place where some sunlight would creep in between boards or something. I think it's, I think I'm in sunlight. I'm, call, I'm, I'm calling sunlight here. Alright, 24 and 36. Yeah, it'd be cool to have one of these fucking reptilian chocobo things. 24-36. Here we go. Here we go. Round one. No, I already lost two. This isn't going well. Well, they, but he lost 12. 22-24. No, I don't want to lose any more endurance! 19 and 16. I lost another one. Come on, let's finish him off here. Let's polish him off with no more loss of endurance. 18 and 12. Yes, okay. I still have 18 left. That's not so bad. Josiah's doing some metagaming with the DM right now. What do you mean? No, I'm not doing that. Saito. Made this game in the second act. You're taking quests from this guy in Egypt. He's ugly. He's hunchbacked. What game is that, Enigma Soul? It's always disappointing when bad guys can't be as evil as you know they could be. Alright, well I beat the henchman. You make a quick search of the dead henchman and discover the following items. Three swords, three daggers, and eight nobles. Oh, I'll take the eight nobles. 
Take those fucking eight nobles right now. I got eight nobles. Melkar helps you to hide their bodies before you leave the tack room. Outside, you discover that the race has ended and that the favorite, Four Luzan, came in last. The crowds are bitterly disappointed with the result, but Rock the Bookmaker is beaming with joy, for he and his conspirators have made a fortune by sabotaging, sabotaging the favorite Guanza. He begins to wonder why his henchmen have not returned, and when he looks to the tack room door, he catches sight of you and Melkar leaving. Frantically, he signals to his conspirators to stop you getting away. You see them closing in, and you grab Melkar by the arm for fear of losing him among the crowds that are heading for the exit gates. Can I just tell this guy, look dude, you see this blood that I'm covered with? It's the blood of your six henchmen. Would you like to add to it? But no, I can't say that apparently. I just have to try to leave. Main exit or side gate? Um... Melkar is super nice. You think of yourself as nice, but you're more than a little reticent about assisting someone I just met in concealing evidence of murder. It was self-defense. Ish. I don't know, though, dude. He's from Somerlin, and I'm a Kai. And we're in this extremely foreign land. It'd be like if you were an American traveling abroad, like on the other side of the fucking world, and bad shit was happening, and then you met like a Navy SEAL, and they were like, hey, I need your help. You'd be like, alright. Kyre like the, the special, the spec ops of, of Somerland. Self-defense, only like four plus guys. I don't know. Let's fucking, let's just leave by the main exit. I don't know. The crowd gets denser as you approach the main exit. He does know you're a Kai. The first, he says something about you being a Kai, like literally when he walks up to you in the beginning. Because you're wearing Kai clothes. When you first meet him... Wait, I went back too far. Well met, Master Kai. See, it's the first thing he says to you. The crowd gets denser as you approach the main exit. And the increased numbers slow down and the speed of your slow down the speed of your escape. Rock communicates by means of hand signals with two of his henchmen who occupy a platform beside the main gate. As you pass below this platform, they leap into the crowd and attempt to block your escape. I do have elementalism. Is it gonna screw me over this time or is it gonna be good? I don't know. I guess we'll find out. I'm feeling lucky. Use the power of your Grand Mastery to whip up a cloud of dust from the ground. The sudden whirlwind causes the crowd to panic and a clear space forms around you in your elemental summonation as they fight to get away. You direct the whirling dust cloud at Rock's henchmen and as they are engulfed and blinded by it, you and Melkar seize the chance to make good your escape from the racetrack. How come I never use elementalism to just burn some fucking people? Fire Snake is so bad at subterfuge that people can just look at him even when he's not wearing Kai clothes and know he's a Kai. No, you are wearing Kai clothes. It said so. It said so in the beginning. Big glowing tattoo on his forehead. Get dead giveaway, yeah. He's a bard disguising himself as a Kai. Yeah, no shit. He's not really very good Kai. He's more of a bard, a spoony, spoony bard.
Yeah, but in the beginning of this book, it said something about... Me wearing Kai clothes. What did it say? I remember it. Because at the time I thought, huh, why is he wearing that? That's dumb. If it's supposed to be in prom or, you know, incognito. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't I just remember something about something about Kai Close. Like it specifically I remember it specifically saying something about you wearing a green Kai tunic or something, and I thinking, hey, why doesn't the cover art show that? But I don't remember where it was. You seriously registered at the end under the name of N Cognito? Are you trying to get everyone to think we're suspicious? Yeah. Incognito would not be the best incognito name, ironically. Melkar leads you back through the streets of Kano to the Song of the Silver Star Tavern, and the young journeyman laughs with sheer relief at having escaped from Rock's henchmen, when finally you enter the sanctuary of its crowded tap room. The innkeeper asks Melkar if his happy mood is due to a win at the Derby. He says that, thanks to your advice, he did not bet, and therefore he did not lose. He also adds the real reason why he is feeling elated, and the innkeeper frowns, Why are you telling this innkeeper about our fucking criminal activities? <laughs> this is- this is between us, okay? You know, just go telling everybody that we just- Hey, <laughs> we just got in a fight with a bunch of, like, criminals, and we killed some of them, and then we ran off. It was fucking awesome, dude. It was really hilarious. No, you keep that shit to yourself. Rock's not a man to cross, he warns. He's ruthless when it comes to getting even. I think you two had better stay in the attic tonight. Rock's sure to send his lackeys out a-hunting for you. You heed the innkeeper's warning and spend the night hidden in his attic room. Before dawn breaks, you slip out of the tavern by a back door and say farewell to Melkar in the street outside. Captain Zyongi's ship is moored down at the docks, he says. It's called Embassage. I wish you a swift and safe journey to Nang, Grandmaster. See, he even knows you're a Grandmaster. This guy knows everything about you. He's like, good luck taking the Moonstone. <laughs> Fire Snake? Like, how the fuck do you know about the Moonstone? I'll always remember our little adventure at the Kano Derby, and I hope we'll meet again one day when you return to Summerland. Maybe I will. Maybe we will. Who knows? Wait. Okay, never mind. You find your way to the docks and discover Captain Leongi's ship moored at the end of the quay. It is a battered old trader that is in desperate need of a lick of paint, but it looks seaworthy enough. The crewman on watch is expecting you and he invites you aboard. The captain greets you with a wry smile. He has heard stories about the incident at the Kano Derby yesterday and he insists that you remain in your cabin until the embassage is safely out at sea. I love the fact that I killed six dudes and we're calling it an incident. You agree to his request and descend the proud deck ladder to your cabin below. And I now have to eat a meal, which is no problem, I have meals. Cool, I eat a meal. Lone Wolf needs to be able to study the Grand Kai Mastery skill of genre awareness. Save him a lot of headaches. Seaworthy enough, not reassuring. Yeah, seaworthy enough. 
The two-day voyage to Nang passes swiftly and without incident, and you arrive at the port early on the morning of the third day. The entrance to Nang Harbor is noted for its 80 fearsome stone statues, known as the Warriors of Nang, which stand in two lines and form a double colonnade out into the sea. Their ferocious granite faces glare down at you unmercifully as the embassage sails between them and the docks at the quay. And docks at the quay. Before you disembark, Captain Leongi warns you to be on your guard while you are in the city. The natives still harbor loyalties to the memory of Shasarak, and recent uprisings have led to the imposition of a dusk-to-dawn curfew. He advises you to go directly to the city of Tiklu and seek out his cousin, Gamulkan. He too is a merchant captain, and he regularly plies a trader between Tiklu and the port of Soon. Leongi gives you a scroll. A special item called Leongi's Scroll. Leongi... Scroll. Seems like it should be trademarked as well. It is a letter of introduction which bears his seal, and in it he asks his cousin to take you to Soon. That'd be nice. Man, for a place called Soon, we sure as fuck did not get there soon. Fire Snake's non clad clothes must also belong to him, and he's wearing his tunic inside out so everyone can see his name written on the collar. In before all 80 stone statues jump you at once. I don't know why Fire Snake also wrote his rank on the inside of the collar, but that's why he's in the Grandmaster Asterisk program. <laughs> nice. Fire Snake is differently abled and proud. You thank the captain for all his help and then disembark onto Nang Ki. You leave the port area and follow the Street of the Full Moon, the main thoroughfare which bisects the city and ends at its west gate. Your first impressions of Nang are mixed. The striking design and construction of its buildings amaze you, but the dismal mood of its natives and the large number of street beggars leave you with the feeling that the city could erupt at any time. You pass many hundreds of shops and they all appear dingy and un uninteresting. Do any of them have healing potions, though? until you happen upon a triangular building created by a fork in the road. It has no sign stating its business, but by the nature of the various goods displayed in its window, you judge it to be an emporium. Oh my god, it's the third emporium in this book, Saito. Honestly, we've encountered more emporiums than buccaneers. It should not have been called the buccaneers of Shadokai. It should have been called the emporiums of Shadokai. Let's go in. Of course we're gonna go in the Emporium. Oh my god. If you're an idiot, turn to 281. If you want to get some sweet potions and shit, turn to 156. As you enter, you are greeted by the shop's owner. He is a bony man with a streaked gray beard and mustache which he habitually tugs as he speaks. His skin is pale and wrinkled and he appears to be older than his years. Among the items that he has on display are the following, which catch your eye. He's got a sword, a whip, an axe, a bow, six arrows, a spyglass, a quill pen, and a pot of ink. Do I want any of that stuff? I don't need a spyglass, I can already magnify my own vision. Pen and ink seem like just a red herring that I'd buy and they'd, I'd never get to use them for anything. The owner asks if you have anything you wish to sell. He says that he is particularly interested in Katezi artifacts and he will pay the following prices for these items. The pouch of Seota dust, which I already used. Talisman of Defiance, like I would sell a plus two CS permanent item for 15 nobles. I wouldn't sell that shit for 15,000 nobles. Or the Eye of Laws, which lets me control snakes. No, I don't need 20 nobles. I want to control snakes. Fuck off. Um, I don't have Deliverance. So, <laughs> so Iron Snake also does his family proud. Never has anyone else in his family in their long history of lead mining achieved so much. That's fucked up. That's so fucked up. No, but doesn't he have any food or, or healing potions? I don't want this shit. I want stuff that I 
want. You leave the shop and depart from the city of Nang through its west gate, following the main trade road that leads to the city of Jazzer. Forty miles to the west, it's well known for its Jazzer size. <laughs> There are many fellow travelers on this road. Some, like you, travel alone and on foot. Others journey in convoys of ox-drawn wagons heavily laden with wares. You try to hitch a ride aboard these convoys, but without success, and so you resign yourself to the fact that you have a long day's walk ahead. Looks like we got us a convoy. As soon, at noon, oh, wow, at noon you come to a village where the road enters some hilly timberland. A sprawling taverna dominates the village, providing meals for travelers. I need meals. There are more than a dozen wagons parked outside its doors, and many sullen-faced natives are sitting on nearby benches, eating their midday meals. I gotta stop and enter, because I'm out of food, aren't I? No, I have one meal left, but still. Even though I've had a bad bad time. Yeah, it's trucking through the night, exactly, Seto. Um... You notice an empty shelf with a sign underneath that says free blankets. <laughs> As you walk in, a man is walking out with a blanket saying, Wow, I'm so lucky I got the last one. Lol's jazzercise. Alright. Trucking through the night. Even though I've had bad luck with taverns and inns, I'm gonna I'm gonna go in here. The inside of the taverna is crowded with travelers eating their meals and serving girls rushing to and fro clutching trays piled high with food and ale. All of the tables are occupied and there are no spare places. We're full up! Can't you see that? Bellows a surly waitress. She slams her tray down on a nearby table, startling the meek-faced group of pilgrims who are seated there. If you want food, it'll cost you four nobles, and you'll have to eat it outside. The meals here are very expensive, but your rumbling stomach reminds you that you are very hungry, and the city of Jazzer is still half a day's walk away. Uh, I will buy a meal. Yeah, I, I got four nobles to spare. Oop. I will fucking buy a meal. Oh, this isn't good. You collect and pay for your food and eat it outside. After your meal, you continue along the trade road, which soon enters a dense timberland. It is an uncomfortably hot and humid region, and you are made to feel even more uncomfortable by swarms of tiny insects that bite any exposed areas of your flesh. Use two endurance points. What is this shit? Judging by the number of bites you sustain, you suspect that these insects consider somlending flesh to be something of a delicacy. Can't I just, you know, elementalism? Fucking burn these things away or blow them away with wind or something? As the sun approaches the horizon, the road passes a high plateau before descending towards the shimmering green waters of the Jazzer Strait. The city of Jazzer nestles in a wooded bay and you arrive at its east gate shortly after sunset. A notice board fixed to the gatehouse wall informs you that you have missed the last ferry, a service which carries road travelers across the strait to connect to the trade road to Tiklu and beyond. The next ferry leaves tomorrow in the morning at an hour after dawn. It is a warm night, and as you wander through the streets of this city, you contemplate where you should best spend it. Uh, lodgings for the night or sleep in the ocean open. Probably should get lodgings for the night. Lone Wolf is like Superman. He always forgets what his powers are until it's convenient to the plot narration that he remembers them. I know, right? That is exactly what it's like. Start singing mightily. Damn it with the mighty Duodon! Alright. Bardsmanship make all the insects angry and cause minus four endurance. Yeah. That was some bullshit. I'm still mad about that. Alright, let's find lodgings for the night. 
Maybe I can play for my supper. I have instruments. I'm a bard, but I don't think they're going to let me. Following the city's signposts, you make your way to the ferry station. Nearby, you find an inexpensive tavern which overlooks the waterfront. A rustling sign bolted to its door states that a room and a meal here cost two nobles a night. Yeah, I'll pay it. I'll pay it. You push open the tavern's creaky door and step into a low-ceilinged room that is poorly lit and furnished. The air is thick with the smell of burning tallow, and customers sit hunched and unspeaking over their glasses of warm rice wine. The one-armed tavern keeper flashes a toothless grin. Want a room? He mutters. You nod and place two coins on the counter, and he tosses you a key engraved with the numeral one. Your room is located at the rear of the tavern, next to the communal lavatory. You draw... Ooh, that sounds like a great place for my room to be. You draw upon your Kai skills to suppress your sense of smell and prop a solitary chair beneath the door handle to keep it shut. Apart from the chair, a bare mattress of straw is the only other item of furniture. No wonder this place was cheap. It is a warm night, and you have no need of a blanket, and so you lie on the mattress and use your satchel and backpack for pillows. Soon you have fallen into a deep sleep. Uh-oh. Why am I rolling a random number in my sleep? Three. Great. Damn it, Saito with the song versus... Oh, come on! You wake within the hour, and from then on you spend an uncomfortable night, during which you are bitten constantly by the fleas which infest your mattress. Your Kai curing skills protect you from contracting any illness or infection from the bites, but you lose three endurance points due to your lack of rest. Oh, so I spent money for a place to sleep, and ended up losing endurance. That's Joe Dever just- Joe fucking Dever just did it to me again. You got me again, Deaver. You got me a fucking gan. When the sun rises, you decide to abandon your attempts at sleeping. You check your equipment, and then you leave the tavern and walk to the nearby ferry station. You can see the ferry approaching across the strait. It is loaded with carts and horses and more than a hundred people. A queue is formed at the station gate where a ferryman is waiting to collect the crossing fare. A board slung around his chest informs you that the price of the crossing is two nobles. Alright, I can afford it. You hand over your money to the ferryman and take a place at the bow. As you wait for the vessel to cast off, you look around at your fellow travelers and notice that most are merchants with wagons and handcarts loaded with goods destined for the markets of Tiklu. It is a short voyage of 20 miles across the strait. When the ferry approaches the landing jetty, your fellow passengers get ready to leave. As they disembark, one merchant's small cart is overturned and his cargo is spilled onto the shore. The other merchants push past him, but you feel sorry for his plight and you help to calm his cart horse and retrieve his goods. He is very grateful for your assistance and he offers you a ride to Tiklu aboard his cart, which you willingly accept. Yeah, thanks, sounds good. Getting a ride on a cart. During the journey to Tiklu, you learn much from Zai, from Zai, your talkative companion. He tells you tales about the local history of this region, its ancient legends and heroes, and about the dark days not so long ago when it was ruled by Shasarak, the infamous Witch King of Shadokai. The journey passes swiftly in his good company, and you arrive at Tiklu during the afternoon. It is a bustling port which stands at the edge of the Sea of Winds and is second only in size and importance to the sh city of Shadokai itself. 
Zaya is welcomed by the guards on watch at the gate, who wave as you pass beneath its mighty arch. It is clear from the, your reaction that your companion is a popular man. As you travel along a paved avenue towards the heart of Tiklu, Zaya asks where you are going to stay during your visit. When you cannot readily answer his question, he invites you to stay at his house tonight. Gratefully, you accept his generous invitation. Wow, I'm getting lucky meeting some really nice people. I feel that this guy is trustworthy. Zai's house is located in the center of the city, opposite the main market square and its municipal buildings. It is a large dwelling and much of it is a warehouse given over to the storage of his goods. You are greeted by his family and he takes great delight in introducing them to you. You meet his brother Chin, his wife Tuve, his two teenage daughters Lidu and Liga, and his young son Undai. His wife and children seem very pleased to have you staying as a guest, but his brother Chin views you with suspicion. You can tell from his cold reaction that he does not think very highly of foreigners. Fucking Chin. I mean, something horrible is about to happen, I know, right? Something horrible is totally going to happen. That's why I don't trust Knox. <laughs> Later, you share supper with the family, and you tell Zaid that tomorrow you will look for Captain Leongi's cousin, Gemulkin. You hand him the scroll that the captain gave you, and he passes it to his brother. He says that Chin has many friends at the dock, and he asks his brother if he recognizes the name. Chin shakes his head tersely and barely glances at the scroll before handing it back. He then leaves the table and goes to his room. As you watch him leave, your sixth sense tells you that he knows Gemmelkin very well. Oh, Chin is holding out on me. Damn it, Chin. After summer... After summer? No, we're not talking about the seasons. After supper, Zai invites you on a tour of his warehouse. While you are looking at the hundreds of fascinating items that he sells, are any of them healing potions? You suddenly hear shouting coming from outside in the main market square. A noisy mob has gathered to denounce Danjai, the city's mayor. They are demanding that Kuga, a former Shatakin warlord, be returned to power. The city militia arrive to disperse this unruly crowd, but a struggle breaks out, and soon the two sides are fighting openly in the square. Suddenly, the warehouse door bursts open, and a dozen men armed with knives and clubs begin to loot the shelves. Damn it, I only have 13 endurance. I, I'm getting too old for this shit. Then Chin comes running fr through from the house, alerted by the noise. He is armed with a stave with which he attacks the looters. One of them knocks it from his hand, and another grabs him from behind and pins his arms to his side. Zai screams as a third looter advances towards his helpless brother with a knife in his hand. See, this is where Chin learns that he should have been fucking nicer to me. I stand by and do nothing. No, I'll fucking use my bow to help him, but still, I'm tempted. It'd be like, yell out, like, hey Chin, I have a bow and I could save you right now, but remember when you were a dick to me? Do you remember that? Have fun getting stabbed, son. But I won't do that. I won't do that. You won't use lay terms anymore, only proper names and... Classifications. They're talking about how many stomachs a cow has. Or how the stomach of a cow is, is subdivided. I don't know. Uh, let's use the bow. Down to three arrows. You aim and fire your arrow at the looter as he raises his knife, and your shaft buries itself in his chest. As he spins to the ground, the other men push Chin aside and come rushing at you to avenge their fallen comrade. You shoulder your bow and draw your Kai weapon in readiness to meet their attack. Wait. Alright, it's night time. I don't get the daylight thing. Alright, I have to fight some looters, apparently. Hopefully they don't hurt me too badly. Come on, let's kill these looters quick with, with little... I'm gonna have a big combat skill advantage over them, so it's possible I'll one-shot them and not lose anything, which is what I'm hoping. 13 and 29. Yes, I one-shotted them and didn't lose anything. 
Yay! Finally a decent victory. Killed some looters. Now math shit is being talked about that I don't understand. The remaining looters flee from Zai's warehouse, pausing only to pick up and carry with them the bodies of their confederates who fell to your deadly blows. You help Zai and his brother to secure the warehouse doors by barricading them with crates and barrels. Once this has been achieved, the three of you return to the house to check that Tuve and the children are safe. Soon the militia gain control of the main square and the mob disperses. Chin thanks you for saving his life and he apologizes for the way he has behaved since your arrival. He tells you that Gamulkin is an old friend of his and he offers to take you to see him first thing in the morning. Ha! Saving his life turned out to be beneficial. Can I get some healing? That's really what I want out of life right now is some healing. Next morning, you bid farewell to Zai and his family before accompanying Chin to the docks. Moored at a jetty by the old harbor wall is a sleek, proud merchant trader called the Vargas that flies a Sunni's flag. Chin takes you aboard this vessel and you meet with Gamulkin in his cabin at the stern. He is a wiry man with a hooked nose and close-set eyes that gives him an expression of sly cunning. Yet his voice is deep and resonant and you can tell that he is someone who is used to commanding respect. By way of introduction, you present him with the scroll that his cousin gave you, and he smiles as he reads it. If I had a noble for every favor I've done him over the years, I'd be a rich man, he says jokingly. Then he furls the scroll and places it in the drawer of his chart table. Erase this item from your action chart. Goodbye, Leongi scroll. Welcome aboard, journeyman. Pay my no attention to my jest. I owe my cousin more favors than I care to remember. You're welcome to sail with us to soon on the noon tide. All I ask is that you work your passage. Oh, I'll work my passage, all right. I mean, I was a little too enthusiastic about that. Nobody gets to have fun anymore because someone had to correct me. What? Noxmoo does, because he's just an innocent cow. You agree to Kamulkin's turns and shake his hand to seal the deal. He calls for one of his crew to come and show you to your bunk, but before you go with him, you bid farewell to Chin. He thanks you again, not only for saving his life, but also for curing him of his distrust of foreigners. The Vargas sets sail on the noon tide. It is carrying a valuable cargo of silk, and also it's carrying the most powerful and valuable item in the entire world, the Moonstone, but it doesn't know that. And Gamulkin is anxious that it should arrive safely and soon. He expects the voyage to last four days. During your first day aboard, you help the crew with their duties and listen to their tales about the Sea of Winds. Gamulkin has ordered the crew to be especially vigilant on this voyage, for pirate raiders from northern waters have become more daring of late. The ships of the Freedom Guild patrol the Sea of Winds to deter, deter buccaneers, yet they cannot guarantee safe passage to any ship once it passes beyond Shuri Point. On the morning of the third day, the lookout sights Shuri Point in the distance. As the Vargas swings around this rocky cape, you see a storm brewing on the horizon. A cluster of black clouds hovers menacingly over the sea, discharging bolts of lightning that arc back and forth between the shore and the surface of the ocean. Just real quick, let's take another glance at the map. Another glance at the map here. So, we're in Nang. The Sea of Winds, Shuru Point, okay. So from Tiklu, we sailed out here. And now we're just, oh, we're almost there. We're so almost there. If we're at Shuru Point, 
Look how close we are to the Isle of Lorne. Wait, I thought we were going to... Port of Soon. I guess we are going to the Port of Soon, but... Can't they just drop me off at Lorne on the way? If we're going around here to the Port of Soon, why sail all the way across the sea? Just drop me off. Let me just jump out and swim. Because there it is, the Isle of Lorne right there. <laughs> you thought MS stood for multiple sclerosis and it was the most depressing means of keeping the date ever. Yeah, that would be pretty depressing. Alright, don't even trip. I'll use my elementalism to command the storm and we'll be fine. I don't think that's what's gonna happen. Your grand mastery of elementalism tells you that this is no ordinary storm. It is the result of powerful elemental sorcery. You urge Gamulkin to turn his ship about, for the fury of this unnatural storm is churning the sea, making it boil and seethe. Fearing for the safety of his cargo and crew, the captain readily agrees, and he orders his helmsman to bring the ship around. But as the Vargas returns towards Shuri Point, Gamulkin suddenly sees something on the horizon that makes him change his mind. There's a mini cliffhanger, Joe Deaver style. What does he see? We'll only know when we turn to 100. Sailing towards you across the Sea of Winds come three pirate ships. They are long and low and rakish, with sleek black hulls and armored decking. Their scarlet sails are filled by a gusty wind, and they move through the water with a silent, ominous speed. Trapped between storm and buccaneers, Buccaneers. Gamulkin faces a difficult decision. He can either confront the approaching raiders or brave the dangers of the storm. He chooses the latter, and as the Vargas swings back once more towards Shuri Point, the Buccaneers hold off and wait expectantly for the storm to lay claim to your vulnerable ship. You had to fall in the water and have to battle the underwater dinosaur again? Nice. It's pretty funny. Okay, let's um, pick a number. I got a six. That might be okay. Gamulkin orders the crew to hoist the sails and secure the decks before the Vargas plunges into the heart of the raging storm. You brace yourself for the rough passage, yet you are stunned by the sheer breathtaking violence of the storm. It pounds the decks and lifts the hull clear from the water. As the ship lurches wildly, you are thrown across the aft deck to crash painfully against a splintered, a splintered hatch cover. Lose six endurance points. That is fucking horrible. That was half my goddamn endurance. There's the massive corn holding right there. This is, this is the beginning of it right here, Saito. First it takes away all my endurance, then it makes me fight some shit that's way too hard. Through the blinding spray, you see the helmsman lose his footing and fall overboard. His cry alerts Gamulkin, who battles his way bravely to the ship's wheel. To prevent himself from being swept overboard, he fixes his belt to the hub of the wheel, and then he fights to turn his ship into a towering wave to save her from capsizing. A mighty wave crashes against the prow, and Gamulkin's courageous action saves the Vargas from being split in two. It rides the wave and emerges from the storm into calmer waters beyond. You thank Ashir that you have survived this ordeal, yet it soon becomes apparent that the storm is merely the prelude to an even greater threat to the ship's survival. Now we get the mini cliffhangers coming hard. Yeah, I know. This is this book is going to have some serious bullshit coming up, I'm, I'm sure. Some serious bullshit. Turn to 230. Man, there's no way I'm going to finish this. I'm not going to be able to do it with this low-ass endurance. From out of the dark clouds, there descends a winged horror that freezes the blood of all who gaze upon it. I guess we're all dead then, because if our blood is literally frozen, then we're dead. Heavily muscled and sheathed in a glistening green skin, 
This nightmarish creature lands upon the main deck and glares at the terrified crewman through slitted eyes. Its wings shrink and melt into its shoulders, and from its fang-filled mouth there issues a chilling hiss. Does this thing count as a poisonous snake? No. In the next instant, it springs among the stunned crew to wreak carnage with its razor-tipped claws. In their terror, many men throw themselves into the sea to avoid the beast's deadly talons. Relentlessly, it forges its way towards the stern and climbs the steps to the rear deck, where it stares at Gamolkin hungrily. The captain fumbles to release himself from the wheel as the creature looms closer. Clearly, it intends to slay him, and you know you must act quickly if you are to save Gamolkin from a terrible fate. Alright, the bow has failed me badly a lot of times. Magi Magic hasn't been that bad. Maybe I can fuss through all this thing. It screeches, Deaver! As it swoops in. Yeah. Alright, let's Magi Magic this thing. You utter the words of the Old Kingdom spell, Invisible Fist! And project your hand at the creature's head. I like to think that the words of the spell is just literally you saying, INVISIBLE FIST! Like, really dramatically? Like, that's the words of the spell? That would be awesome. The force of your spell makes the beast stumble, but it quickly recovers its footing. Angered by the pain you have dealt it, the creature turns its ghastly stare on you and hisses vehemently. Quickly, you reach to your Kai weapon in readiness to defend yourself from its attack. Yet it does not attack you. It continues to stalk its chosen target. Gamulkin frees himself from the wheel, but before he can get away, the beast is upon him like a hungry lion. It grabs him by the throat and lifts him off the deck. You race across the slippery decking and rig your, raise your weapon to strike the creature in the side. Callously, the beast hurls Gamulkin into the sea. That's not good. And then spins around to face you. Noxmoo says, Kai Alchemy, the flying horde turns into unicorns and rainbows and restore the endurance of everyone on the ship as they fly by. <laughs> oh, man. It would be difficult for Fire Snake giving his inability to not sing. Oh yeah, he's he's got to sing it. So if he's uttering the words of Invisible Fist, he'd be like, Invisible Fist! Or something like that. Alright, callously the beast hurls Gamulkin into the sea, and then spins around to face you. Your first blow opens a wound in its chest, making it shriek loudly. But it recovers, and it lashes out at you to connect with your shoulder. The force of the blow knocks you sideways and sends you sliding across the slick deck to fall headlong through an open cargo hatch. Uh oh. Alright, open cargo hatch. Sounds like an advert from the 80s. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right, here we go. Random number time. I got an eight. How's that? How's that do for me? How does an eight do for me? God damn it! <sighs> really? You land on your back with a severe jolt that leaves you gasping for breath. Lose three endurance points. Don't you understand? I need every one of these endurance points really badly right now. You have crashed down upon the floor of a cargo hold that is stacked with bales of silk. Above, framed in the open hatchway, you can see the creature getting ready to leap. Quickly you roll away as it drops into the hold, and your speedy action saves you from its deadly talons, as maniacally the creature slashes, sla slashes at the floor. Suddenly can't speak. Maniacally, the creature slashes at the floor, where only moments before you were lying. Hissing like an angry snake. It leaps after you and lashes out again. This time it rakes its talons along the wooden wall of the hull, barely inches above your head. The tips of these razor-sharp claws become embedded deeply in the timbers, and for a few moments the creature is held fast. No, I don't want to attack the creature while it's talon- No, I want to run the fuck away. I will choose to use this opportunity to try to evade the creature.
Yeah, I know, it's not good. <laughs> you try to avoid the creature only to learn that the ship is also transporting broken glass shards and lemon juice. You hurry across the hold and run through an open bulkhead door into an adjacent cargo area, which is stacked with crates of food and barrels of water. On the far side of this hold, you see a wooden ladder that ascends to a hatch in the foredeck. Your Kai senses detect that there is also a concealed trapdoor in the floor of the hold, close to the base of the ladder. Suddenly you hear the cracking of timbers, and you sense that the creature has freed its claws from the wall of the cargo hold behind you. You hear the snake-like hiss of its breath, and you know that you have but a few seconds before it will come cr rushing through the open bulkhead door. Hide among the crates and barrels. Climb the ladder to the foredeck hatch. Open the concealed trapdoor in the floor. Well, let's try the trapdoor in the floor and see what happens. You prize open the trapdoor and discover a secret compartment built for the smuggling of contraband. The compartment is empty, but it is of no use. It is too small a space in which to hide. You glance at the doorway and see the creature rushing towards the hold. You cannot hope to hide from it now. Your sixth sense tells you that it wants the Moonstone and it will stop at nothing to take it from you. Let's try to evade it by climbing the ladder. This probably isn't going to work. I'm just going to get killed, but... Deaver brand lemon juice. It'll hurt you. Bad. Yeah, we're not in good shape here. You grab the sides of the ladder and climb towards the hatch. The rungs are slippery and the slick leather of your soles does not make for a speedy ascent. Then you hear a loud hissing and you look down to see that the creature is directly below you. Suddenly the ladder lurches violently as the ship is struck by another wave. There is a loud roar, and then the hatch above your head collapses and you are hit by a deluge of seawater that sweeps you off the ladder. You crash down upon the creature's head, stunning it, and the force of your fall sends it reeling to the floor. Frantically, you scramble to your feet and reach for your Kai weapon to finish off the beast before it can recover. But to your horror, you discover that your weapon is not at your side. It fell from your belt when you were swept off the ladder. You look around and catch sight of it sliding across the floor towards the bulkhead door. Hell no, I'm not going to attack it with a normal weapon before it recovers. I gotta get my Kai weapon. You leap over the stunned creature to get to your Kai weapon, but it senses your presence and blindly it lashes out at your legs with a sweep of its razor-sharp claws. I'm going to die right here. Your endurance score is 14 or lower, deduct one. So I've got a deduct one. I don't have Grant Hunt Mastery either, so. I got a seven minus one. Okay, I still got five or more, but I'm still probably gonna die right here. <laughs> you got jokes. You got fucking jokes, Deaver. As you leap, you draw your legs up high enough to avoid being slashed by the creature's talons. On landing, you quickly retrieve your Kai weapon and turn to attack the beast before it can fully recover its senses. We've got a Zork. Combat skill 51, there's not a chance. There's not a chance with four endurance left. Due to the advantage of your initial attack, ignore any endurance point losses that you sustain in the first round of this fight. Yeah. Right. There's no way. There's no fucking way. Get obscenely lucky. Master of cornholing, yeah. Alright, so... Look. There is an open hatch here, so some, some daylight is coming in. So I'm, I'm counting this as daylight. And... I could get obscenely lucky. Here we go. I've already died four times in this book, so here's going to be number five. Ooh! Ooh! Two in a row! I didn't lose any endurance. He lost a bunch. Okay, come on. Come on. No! Now I have no potions left, Noxmoo. Alright, so that's death number five. We're going to try it again. I'm going to try it again. That's death number six, right there. We just He just one-shotted me. We're gonna try it one more time, and then we're gonna back our asses up to some other shit. Uh, 
Oh, here we go, here we go, here we go. Oh, oh, I got him down to 11. Come on, come on. 3 and 11, 3 and 11. No, no, I got him down to 7, but I still died. Wait. Wouldn't have lost any endurance during the first round. That's true. What does that mean? Oh, yeah, but I wouldn't have... Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. Backing up. We're backing up. Backing up. Backing up. Backing up some more. Still backing up. Giving myself back those three endurance. Still backing up. Backing up even more. Backing up even more. Giving myself back this six endurance. We're going all the way back to here. So, random number time. A zero. Turn to 25. Wait, lose three endurance. What did the other one do? Lose six endurance. Oh, that's not as bad. Kamulkan orders the crew to hoist the sails and secure the decks before the Vargas plunges into the heart of the raging storm. You brace yourself for the rough passage, yet you are stunned by the sheer, breathtaking violence of the storm. It pounds the decks and lifts the hull clear from the water. As the ship lurches wildly, you are thrown across the aft deck and slammed against the wheelhouse. Lose three endurance. Okay. Then this is the same thing as it said before. He ties himself to the thing. Alright, now, what are we doing here? The creature appears. I didn't try using the bow last time. Let's try using the bow. You brace yourself against the gunwale and draw an arrow to your bow. Taking careful aim, you let it fly towards the creature's head. The beast senses its approach and lashes out at the onrushing missile with its clawed hand in an attempt to slap it away. The arrow's steel tip skewers its hand and the beast shrieks with pain as green ichor drips freely from the wound. Then, to your shocked surprise, it bites the shaft in two and spits the pieces back at you. That's, that's not great. It's not great. Maybe it took some damage there, though. Tell them to close that open hatch while they're at it. The Eye of Lamaz doesn't affect giant screeching horrors. What I really like is how basically this section is effectively Deaver saying, fuck you, lol, to anyone who has three or less EOP. Yeah. Angered by the pain of its wound, the creature turns its ghastly stare on you and hisses vehemently. Quickly, you shoulder your bow and reach for your Kai weapon in readiness to defend yourself from its attack. Yet it does not attack you. It continues to stalk its chosen target. Okay, so then it sa says the same thing. He grabs him by the throat. He throws him in the sea. Turns around to face me. And I gotta fall through the open cargo hatch. This time I got a two. And I didn't get hurt this time. Okay, that's good. You land on your back with a jolt that leaves you gasping for breath, yet you sustain no injury from your fall. You have landed on a bale of silk, one of dozens stacked in this cargo hold. Above, framed in the open hatchway, you can see the creature getting ready to leap. Quickly you roll off the bell as, bale as it drops into the hold, and your speedy action saves you from its deadly talons as maniacally the creature slashes the silk bale to ribbons. The only thing it hates more than Kylords, silk! Been a steady leeching of endurance points for a while. Yeah, I know. Alright, this says the same thing as last time. Alright, what if I attack while its talons are struck in the a hull instead of running away. Son of a bitch. You raise your Kai weapon and launch a swipe at the creature's neck. With stunning speed, the beast grabs your forearm with its free claw and stops you landing your blow. Its talons bite into your flesh and its crushing strength makes it hard for you to keep hold of your weapon. Lose three endurance points. I hate you so much. The deck lurches as the ship is hit by a wave and the sudden movement throws the creature off balance. As, it gri as its grip slackens momentarily, you are able to twist yourself free from its claws and escape into an adjacent cargo hold. Alright, this time let's try hiding among the crates and barrels and see what that does. You crouch down behind a crate and listen to the chilling sound of the creature's horned feet scratching the floor as it comes running towards the door of the hold.
It pauses at the threshold and sniffs the air. Your Kai senses tell you that it is searching for the Moonstone, and only the corlinium lining of your satchel is preventing the beast from locating it, and you. I don't have a semblance or Kai alchemy. Oh god. It's even tougher than last time! Son of a bitch! The creature tears aside barrels and upends crates until it discovers the place where you are hiding. You draw your weapon and retreat until your back is pressed against the wall of the hold. With chilling slowness, it flexes its talons and bares its ghastly teeth. Then, in a blur of movement, it comes lunging towards you with claws outstretched. There's a Zork. Look at that thing. What a motherfucker. That looks like something that would kick your ass, and of course it is something that would kick my ass. It has kicked my ass. It will kick my ass again. <laughs> you have Kai Alchemy. Turn to page 350. That should just be like right in the very beginning, in section 1. If you have Kai Alchemy, turn to page 350. Otherwise, go through the whole book getting your ass kicked and being sad. Getting the sense that the New Order series was basically the Dark Souls of gaming books. I know, right? This is ridic. Alright, well, we'll try the fight a few times, three times. That's the, my, how I, what I do three times, and then I go back if I can. So, still got sunlight. I got sunlight coming through the hatch, though. Oh, this is ridiculous. Dead. Okay, let's, let's try again. Dead. Okay, let's try again. Dead. Alright, got to ten deaths so far in this book. Learn that you are the true monster. Quickly use your flute, it just wants to give you a hug. Alright, we're backing up, we're backing up. We're backing up to here. Remember when I lost these three endurance points? We're taking those back. We're gonna evade the creature. This time, we're not gonna hide in the barrels, we're not gonna do the trapdoor, we're gonna go straight for the ladder. Ah, but we get screwed. Attack. Uh, last time we tried, we got re retrieved our weapon. What if we do this? Attack with a normal weapon before it fully recovers. This is probably a terrible idea. Oh my god, it's a terrible idea. Now nah, that's not gonna work. Back. Retrieve Kai weapon. Let's roll a random number. I got a three. No, I can't have that. Back. Alright, so here we are fighting it again, but this time we have 10 Endurance. 10 big Endurance, so we might be able to win now. 10 big Endurance. There we go, 10, 39, 4, and... Oh, but I, I ignore, I ignore that! I ignore that first round. 10 and 38, 10 and 29, 6 and 24, 1 and 22! Oh, no! Okay, let's try again. That's 11 deaths. Makes me happy. You know that when Josiah picks Kai Alchemy for the next book, it will never come up for the rest of the series. Yeah, I know, right? Well, think about it. As bad as this is, as hopeless as this is, imagine how truly hopeless it would be if I didn't have that weapon mastery, though. Like this, I could try this fight enough times and eventually I would get lucky and win it. But if my combat skill was five points lower, it would be pretty much unwinnable. Alright, round one. Took nothing. Ten and twenty-nine. Six and twenty-five. Come on, six and fifteen. Come on. Three and nine! Here we go! Get lucky. One lucky roll. A really lucky roll right here. <gasps> one and two. We're down to the, oh man, we're down to the bone on this one. Come on, I just need to get lucky one more time. Yes! On my, what, what is this? My fucking fifth try against this thing? Sixth try? Seventh try? I don't even know. I, uh, I, I beat it with one endurance left over. Yeah, I already added in the bonus from the special item from the village. Yeah, that's already added in. 
one endurance left. Finally beat it on my... I don't know. Seventh or... Yeah, then you get a sliver, lose one endurance point, lose the book. Yeah, I know, because anything, anything that loses endurance now, and I'm dead. Which is fucked. So fucked. Please tell me that was the last thing I had to do in this book, and now it's basically just downhill to 350. The moment you... Really? First thing I see, Kai Alchemy test. The moment you strike the killing blow, the creature's body transforms into a hissing mass of fiery green sparks. Rapidly, these sparks dissolve, leaving no trace, except for a lingering odor of decay. Your Kai senses detect that the creature was a magical creation, an evil summonation, sent here to find the Moonstone. You go to deliver pizza, and as you leave, you fail your acrobatics roll down the stairs, lose one in Terrence point. <laughs> oh, man. All right. You were pondering who could be responsible for the creature's creation and presence here, when suddenly your thoughts are forced to turn to more immediate matters. The hull of the Vargas is starting to crack under the relentless pounding of the waves. The hold is rapidly filling with water, and you must act swiftly to escape from here before it becomes your watery tomb. Is this going to be a thing where if because I don't possess Kai Alchemy, I'm going to take some damage, and it'll instantly fucking kill me? Because that's going to be some bullshit. I don't have it. You struggle to climb the ladder out of the hold, but you are hampered by torrents of debris-laden water that come pouring into the hold through the open hatch. Pick a random number, deduct one. Oh, two or less will insta-kill me. Ha 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 ha! And I got a two! That is so awesome. That is so fucking awesome. I rolled a two. Here we go, let's read my death text. You are nearing the top of the ladder when you lose your grip and fall backwards into the hold. You struggle to stand, but you are suddenly struck by a second deluge of water and debris that knocks you unconscious. Sadly, you never regain consciousness. Minutes later, the Vargas sinks beneath the waves and she takes you down to the seabed, 50 fathoms below. Tragically, your life and your quest end here at the bottom of the Sea of Dreams. <laughs> Yeah, that is death number 12. This book might be the new record for deaths. Any <laughs> real illustration which is just Doe Deaver giving the reader the finger. I know, this is the most unfair bullshit book. Fall killed you, not the sinking. <laughs> Alright, let's reroll. Alright, here we go. You force yourself up the ladder and emerge on the foredeck amidst a tangle of rigging and ruined sails. As you pull yourself onto the deck, you see that the traitor has lost every one of her masts, and the stern is slowly submerging beneath the relentless waves. You scour the shattered main deck, but you can see no sign of survivors. Then you glimpse a hand protruding from beneath a mass of debris, and you stagger across the shifting deck towards it. Suddenly the prow is struck by a cresting wave, and you are catapulted off the deck and into the angry sea. Please no automatic damage. That'd be hilarious if I die of starvation. Do I have meals? I have a meal, thank god. Otherwise, I'd be dying of starvation right here. You fight your way to the surface of the churning sea and gulp a lung full of air. All about you are flailing lumps of debris, foaming bubbles, and treacherous strands of rope and canvas that threaten to entangle your limbs and drag you to your doom. Breathing hard, you fill your lungs and feed oxygen to your blood before diving deep below the flotsam of the dying ship. You surface beyond the debris and swim for the shore, now less than a mile distant. The waves bring you ashore upon a rocky beach, where you crawl for shelter among boulders at the base of a chalk cliff. From here, you see the wreck of the Vargas come drifting towards the shoreline to be smashed to pieces on the rocks. Gangs of men are pacing the beach, salvaging cargo and slaying any crewman who has washed ashore alive. 
They are wreckers, and your Kai senses tell you that they are led by an evil magician who possesses great power. Oh, you're fucking tripping if you think I'm gonna fight someone else. You can feel the aura of his presence nearby, high upon the cliffs, and you know that he has been responsible for the wicked destruction of the Vargas and its crew. Saito says, You finally arrive on shore only to be greeted by Araya, who has escaped and come to meet you. She rushes to you and hugs you tightly, praising you for your glorious victory. However, she tugs slightly too hard and it hurts a little. Lose one endurance point. <laughs> that would not surprise me. That's some Joe Deaver shit right there. You could write game books, Saito. Using your Kai camouflage skills to keep yourself hidden from the wreckers, you hurry away along the rocky coast. During your escape, unless you possess the discipline of Grand Hunt Mastery, you must now eat a meal or lose three endurance points. Alright, I'll eat my last meal. Hopefully I'll survive. What have I died, like 12 times? Wow, I made it. Somewhere. For two days, you follow this shoreline which borders upon the Sea of Dreams. You feed upon the plentiful supply of marine life that you find at low tide in rock pools and caves, and you avoid the natives of the coastal villages through which you take care to pass only at night. During the morning of the third day, you catch your first sighting of the Port of Soon, and your spirits rise. It sits upon an islet at the mouth of the River Azan, and it is a most welcoming sight. There have been many times during your long voyage south that you feared you might not live to ever see this city. You continue your trek and enter soon by means of a grand wooden bridge. It spans the Azan and leads directly to the harbor. You stop to admire the great harbor gate of Soon. It is a magnificent arch that is decorated with likenesses of the heads of every ruler this city has known. You count 120 heads in all, the last in the line being that of the city's present ruler. Greystar, again the wizard from the other books, the character, the protagonist. The harbor is filled with low, wide boats, many with makeshift shelters that rock gently on the tide. Native families crowd these vessels, their menfolk working long hours at the busy quayside and trading wharves nearby. Passing through the harbor, you see several patrols of city guardsmen who are heavily armed and quick to stop anyone they consider to be suspicious. There is an underlying sense of unease about the place. A tension that reminds you of Nang. You decide it would be wise to avoid the city guards, and so you leave the harbor and go in search of Lord Zanair, the Decian Ambassador. Beyond the harbor gate, you see that there are only two thoroughfares. One leads directly to Soon's Market Square, and the other, the Avenue of the Southern Seas, wends its way into the city's trade quarter. Uh, I think I'm going to follow the street that goes to the market square, because maybe I can get healed there. Or something. Oh my god! Potions of Lomsper! Oh my god! As soon as you walk into the busy market square, you are assailed from all sides by merchants eager to sell their wares. All manner of goods are offered, but most are of little or no use to you. As you push your way through the merchants, you notice a market stall that sells healing concoctions. One of these is Lomsper, for which the vendor is asking two nobles per potion. Each potion of Lomsper restores four endurance points. It seems like I can buy as many as I want here. Oh my god. Yeah, we're gonna buy some potions of fucking Lomsper right now. How many can I possibly afford? I'm spending all my money. No, I'll spend 20. I'll spend 20. I'll keep four, just in case. That's... 10 potions, okay. I want to keep 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I want to keep 3 of them. Which means what? I'm drinking 7 of them? 7 times 4. 28. 
still. Okay, good. I'm back up to a full health. Well, not full, but, you know, a decent amount of health. And I have more potions. I don't care that I just spent all my money. That is fucking fine. That's what money's for. Oh, I'm so happy right now. So now if I accidentally bump into something and take one point of damage, it won't fucking end my adventure. You just imagine Fire Snake shoving his money in the merchant's chest and then guzzling them lumber from his star. I know, right? Just grabbing them one after another, just ripping the fucking tops off of them and just guzzling them down. Lumber potion all pouring down his chin, down his neck, all over the front of his shirt and stuff. No, the merchants will only accept nobles. No, it doesn't say that specifically. You're a sale by merchants eager to sell you wares. Lose one endurance point. An infinite lobs promotion vendor stands nearby waiting patiently to sell his stock at 75% off. Okay. Now let's ask the vendor if he knows the whereabouts of Lord Zanair. I'm so relieved right now. The vendor has never heard of Lord Zanair, but he suggests that you visit the soothsayer's shop near the exit from the square. You thank the man, and as you leave, you decide to follow his advice. Oh, maybe I can talk to him about some soothsaying stuff since I am an astrologer and everything. Lol, 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 lol. This is hilarious, and you'll see why in a second. You may, might already realize why. On entering the shop, you are greeted by a tall woman with pale skin and long black hair. She wears plain robes of brown cloth and a miniature crystal ball that dangles from a chain around her neck. Welcome, stranger, she says. I am Gia Laird, the soothsayer. How may I help you? You ask if she can tell you where you will find Lord Zanair, the Decian Ambassador. She looks into the miniature crystal ball for a few moments, and then she replies, I have that knowledge, and all it will cost you is five nobles. It'll cost five nobles. Let's take a look at how much I have left. Four. <laughs> I have exactly four. And it will cost five. God damn it, Joe Deaver, you got me once again. Well fucking played. Well played. You did the change wrong. Ah, oh, five nobles. I don't have it. I guess I don't get to fucking get the soothsayer knowledge. If it's one to one. It is one to one. What do you mean I did the change wrong? I shouldn't have 14. No, the potions cost two each. Potions cost two each, so for me to buy 10 of them, as I did, it would have cost me 20. And I had 24, so I spent 20 and now I have four left. The woman is disappointed that you will not pay her charge, and she asks you to leave her shop. As you are walking to the door, she calls out, Zinair is well known. Perhaps you should ask the city guards. They won't charge you for information. No. I think she's trying to lure me into a trap here. The city guards are going to kick my ass. If I try to talk to them. You thank her for the free advice and return to the square. The city guards seem to be the only option left, and despite your feelings of unease, reluctantly you approach them and ask for their assistance. Your request for assistance is greeted with suspicion by the hard-faced guardsmen. Your northern features and travel-stained clothes clearly do not impress them, for they ignore your requests and begin asking some questions of their own. They ask you to show them what you're carrying in your satchel, and they ask why you're carrying weapons in a public marketplace contrary to the law of soon. When you hesitate to answer, they immediately place you under arrest. For a moment, you consider making a run for it, but then you notice that each guard is armed with a crossbow, and you decide that it would be suicidal to try to escape. Man, this is my third time being arrested in one fucking book. Oh my god, I'm having flashbacks. You 
You'd like to think that every person in this world has their own game book with their own set of disciplines. The city guard patrol confiscates your weapons, including your Kai weapon, and marches you out of the square under close escort. You are taken to a black stone citadel called the Hall of Correction, a dour building that was constructed by the by order of Mother Magri, the former steward of Soon, during the reign of the hated witch king Shasarak. You are brought before a pompous, pompous guard officer named Hyojin who refuses to believe that you are a messenger from Elzy and here to meet with Lord Zanair. He believes you are a hired assassin. These are troubled times. There are men abroad who would seek to harm Lord Zanair. I cannot allow this. It is my duty to protect the ambassadors to our great city. When you steadfastly refuse to change your story, the officer scratches his pockmarked chin and narrows his beady eyes. Perhaps you have some truth that what you say is true, he says as he stares at you. Really? Again with the Kai Alchemy as the only option? I hate you so much. I hate you, Joe Deaver. Kai Alchemy is ridiculously over-fucking-used. Not pick the humility <laughs> or comedy guardsmanship disciplines. I know, isn't that hilarious, Doxmu? Kai Alchemy, once again, is the only fucking option. No, I don't have Kai Alchemy. Eat a fucking dick. Only Kai Alchemists would have messages for Lord Zanair, yeah. Surely, the Kai would not have sent someone with only bardsmanship and herbs mastery for a message for Lord Zanair. Any good guy would already have guy alchemy. Alright, the officer becomes angry when you quietly refuse to show him what is in your satchel. He bangs his desk with a fist and threatens that he will order his guards to confiscate it by force unless you begin to cooperate with him. Uh, a bribe. Well, I don't have any fucking money, so... Fearing that Hyojin will carry out his threat, in desperation you make one last attempt to reason with the man. If I were an assassin, do you really think that I would ask the city guard for directions to my victim's house? Hyojin frowns. <laughs> yeah, if I saw somebody just sing that at me, I would also frown. Hyojin frowns. He is beginning to have doubts about his assumption that you are a hired killer. <laughs> I think singing the lines puts so much extra funny context on these things. Like, after hearing me sing that, yeah, he's definitely gonna have doubts about me being a hired killer. Rather than admit that he could be wrong, he begins to bluster. Uh, I'll have to look into this further. In the meantime, you will be held here, pending, uh, further investigations. My daughter took a distant summer course and learned Kai Alchemy. That's fucked up, Saito. Hyojin quickly summons his men and has you taken away and placed in a solitary cell. Two hours pass before the door to your cell is open, and an apologetic Hyojin appears. He is now convinced that you are not an assassin, and, fearing a diplomatic row with the Decian ambassador, he apologizes repeatedly for your arrest. He has your weapons restored to you, and then he escorts you personally in a horse-drawn carriage to Lord Zanair's residence, the Decian Consulate, in the city's north quarter. Man, could be one of those assassin crams I've heard about, though. As the toadying officer and his carriage depart, you turn to face the entrance to the consulate building. With mounting anticipation, you climb the front steps and knock on its stout oak door. Let's do this. Uh, he did apparently pick cowardice and toadying, though. Yeah, those are, those are popular ones among guards. 
Slowly, the door opens to reveal a gray-haired man clad in the robes of a high council elder of Desi. At first, his sea-blue eyes and lordly countenance are fixed in seriousness. But then he recognizes the insignia of your Kai tunic. Of your what? I'm sorry, what am I wearing? What am I wearing? My what? My Kai tunic? Am I wearing a Kai tunic? Because somebody earlier was trying to argue that I'm not wearing a Kai tunic. But I'm pre pretty sure this says my Kai tunic right here. Thank you. Thank you for the vindication. And his stern face breaks into a warm and welcoming smile. Praise the gods! You have arrived, Grandmaster. I feared that you and your precious cargo had been lost at gold to brass. I am Zanair. Please, please come inside. Lord Zanair ushers you into the consulate and asks you to wait in his private chambers. After he has taken the precaution of dismissing his staff, he joins you there. He had expected your arrival weeks ago, and had almost abandoned hope that he would ever see you alive, fearing that you had fallen foul of Sescaterra. When you recount all the perils of your journey from Elzion, Zanair is doubly amazed that you are with him now. You reassure him that you still have the Moonstone, and you offer to show him the precious artifact. But he declines your offer, saying that it would be safer for you both if it were to remain within its Corlinium satchel. Zanair suggests that you bathe and eat, and avail yourself of the many luxuries that the Consulate has to offer. He suggests that after you are rested, you meet again later, so that you may discuss the final and most vital part of your mission. Wait, you remember now? What do you remember, Saito? Wait, the vi most vital part? No, my mission's fucking done. I've made it here. I fought the final battle. I hope. I've made it here. I'm, I'm done. Just take this fucking moonstone. I'm leaving. I'm going home. Still a Kai tunic, just not a Grandmaster one. Yeah, that's right, it's a journeyman tunic. So that doesn't, doesn't explain why that one dude knew that I was a Grandmaster, though. Actually, there's been a couple dudes now that mysteriously knew that I was a Grandmaster. Zanair has made preparations for your journey by boat to the Isle of Lorne. This fabled home of the Shianti lies 120 miles from the port of Soon, and has been protected for thousands of years from the attentions of man by enchantments, magical mists, and mage winds. Only by virtue of your possession of the Moonstone can this voyage be undertaken with any hope of success, he says. I have been in mind contact with the Shianti, and they are ready to receive you. You sense that Zanair is proud of your successes and achievements during the quest so far, but you also sense that he is ill at ease and you ask him what is wrong. The Moonstone will facilitate your passage through the Sea of Dreams to the Isle of Lorn, Grandmaster. But you should know that this journey could still prove perilous. The Shianti no longer have control over the forces that exist within this enchanted region. Until you reach the shores of Lorne, your fate will be entirely in your own hands. Apparently this book literally never ends. It is a daunting message, but you do not allow it to weaken your resolve. You stare Lord Zanair confidently in the eye as you reply. It need be no other way, my lord. I am ready. Zanair smiles. <laughs> He just takes this in stride, very casual about it. S so be it, Grandmaster. But now you must sleep, for you sail at dawn. We were both wrong. I think we can also agree that Deaver has made a few story errors. I, we weren't both wrong. I said that I was wearing Kai clothes. I wasn't wrong. I never said they were green. Or that they were Grand Mastery, or anything else. All the magical Moonstone babies become Grand Masters, so they just give them whatever kind of tunic is on hand. <laughs> 
Kai tunics are made by prisoners. You are awoken shortly before dawn by Lord Zanair, who helps you prepare your weapons and equipment before leaving the consulate. He accompanies you on horseback to the harbor where you go aboard a fishing boat crewed by consulate staff. On setting off from Soon, you head south, as if you were bound for the rich fishing grounds of the Azanam Peninsula. But shortly after Soon disappears over the horizon, Zanair brings the boat to a stop, and you are lowered over the side in a single-sailed wooden dinghy. Lord Zanair tells you to take the Moonstone from your satchel, and you obey his command. You cup the precious stone in both hands, and a wind arises to fill your sail and propel you swiftly towards the mists of the Sea of Dreams. That's why Fire Snake kept being jailed so he could make more tunics. Random number time, here we go. I got an 8. Uh oh, here we go. When first you enter the mists, it seems as if you are no longer sailing upon a sea of water. It becomes a blended sea and sky of deep blue light, without horizon or boundary, a limitless space. Gradually you detect vague shadows passing quickly by, and then distant sounds, like muffled whispers, surging then pulsing away before you can catch the words. Then you see globes of darkness hovering to and fro, and your Kai senses scream a warning that these are invaders, evil intruders in this realm of ghostly mist. They grow in numbers and begin to spiral around your boat, whispering and laughing and babbling all the while. You can feel your boat gradually slowing until it ceases to move at all. Fear grips you when you realize that these mischievous black spheres have the power to hold you prisoner, to keep you from ever reaching the shores of Lorne. Suddenly, the vague sounds and voices in your mind begin to crystallize into words that you can understand. You have proved your physical courage, foolish follower of Kai. But now you must put your mental strength to the test, if you wish to find the Isle of Lorne. The eerie voice laughs and you steel yourself to meet its mental challenge. How great in number are the warriors of Nang? I'm pretty sure it was 80. It was 40 or 80, but I'm pretty sure it was 80. 80 sounds right. Yeah, we're going with 80. The moment you voice the answer to the challenge, the black globes disappear, and the mist fades to reveal a lush, green, volcanic island that is crowned by a halo of silvery cloud. Your pulse races with anticipation as you feel the sea return beneath the keel of your craft and a wind to propel you towards this wondrous isle. You have met the challenge and you have triumphed. Now you shall reap your reward by landing upon the shores of Lorne, the mystical realm of the exiled Shianti. However, as you land, you trip and fall and hit your head very hard and lose 29 endurance points. Ha ha. The boat scrapes aground on the stony shore, and you take your first few tentative steps upon the soil of this legendary isle. As you ascend the beach, instinct prompts you to unbuckle your satchel and remove the moonstone which is now aglow and throbbing rhythmically, like the beat of a giant's heart. As you raise it before you, cupped reverently in both hands, the clouds part and you are bathed in a cone of brilliant sunlight. Through the binding, blinding glare of the sun's rays, you see a procession of robed figures moving down the beach towards you. Tall and proud and enigmatically graceful, they each shine with a unique radiance that reveals the goodly power of their ancient arcane wizardry. 
Silently, these Shianti encircle you, and your senses become charged with a new vitality that instantly obliterates the fatigue of your long passage across the Sea of Dreams. Restore endurance points to its original score. That's nice, except I'm wondering, why is it giving me back my endurance? Am I going to need it? Am I going to have to fight something else? Then one of the divine beings moves nearer. And when you look into his eyes, you see your own image reflected there in his mirrored pupils. Welcome, Grandmaster, he says without speaking, his lyrical voice forming the words in your mind. We have prayed for your safe arrival. We praise you for the skill and courage you have shown during your long and difficult voyage to our realm. Come with us, for now you may rest a while. Your quest is done. Wait, are these real? Am I- is this an illusion? Have I not actually made it to the Shianti? It's Kadak again! It's a civilization of Meryl Streeps. That's fucked up. Your kind senses tell you that the Black Lodes are obviously sent by Kadak, yeah. Shank. Yeah, Joe Deaver, buy as many Lumps proportions as you want. I won't take any endurance points after and slip in a free heal. I know, right? I just thought about that too. What an asshole. Even when it comes to giving out healing, he has to do it in a dickish way. Apparently that I'm holding the Moonstone. That's it, I guess. Oh. They're not kidding. When he says your quest is done, he means your quest is done. We got turned to 350, gentlemen. We finally made it through this fucking book. Why would it bother to restore all your endurance points if you just win the book immediately? Like, I mean, I guess just for effect, just to let you know, oh, this place is so cool it heals you. But, I mean, it's not like you're really going to use your endurance points after this. Amazingly, by healing you after giving you the opportunity to buy a whole bunch of cheap potions, Joe Deaver does the biggest dick move of all. Well, it's okay. I'll get more money at the start of the next book, and, um... I still got to keep these three potions, so I'm okay with it. Let's finish the book, shall we? The Shianti escort you from the beach to a wondrous edifice, the Sacred Temple of Amida, which stands upon a high spur of rock commanding a spectacular view of the four corners of their magical isle. Apparently their, their island is square. Here in a formal ceremony, you receive the thanks and praise of Ikaria, the leader of the Shianti exiles. Solemnly, he vows to deliver the Moonstone into the hands of Goddess Ashir herself, thereby ensuring that never again will its powers disrupt Magnamon's delicate balance of nature, nor be misused by the forces of evil. After the ceremony, the Shianti show you some of the magical wonders of their island that have never before been seen by man. You marvel at flowing rivers of jewels, fabulous flora, and species of exotic fauna that defy description. After your tour of this Paradise Isle, you are allowed to rest a while before you are escorted to your boat to begin your journey back to the Port of Soon. I don't suppose they're going to let me take a few jewels from their quote-unquote rivers of jewels? I guess not, huh? Yeah, the biggest dick move was the bardsmanship having the reverse effect on that. Or when I used the, the very next thing I used, which was elementalism causing me to just take damage and not actually working. That was pretty nice. Your return voyage across the Sea of Dreams is swift and eerily smooth. 
You sense that your direction and speed are being controlled by the Shianti, for within minutes of casting off from the shores of Lorne, the bustling harbor entrance to the port of Soon suddenly appears from out of the swirling sea mist. A stiff breeze catches your sail and propels you toward the quayside, where, to your astonishment, Lord Zanair is waiting to greet your valiant return. Congratulations, Grandmaster. Once more, you have proved your courage and resourcefulness. You have completed the trust, the, the quest entrusted to you by Lone Wolf, and you have triumphed magnificently. The safe return of the Moonstone to the Shianti is a major victory in the war against evil, but it is a war that is still yet to be won. Upon your return to the port of Soon, you learn from Lord Zanair of a new and sinister threat to the fragile peace of your world. If you wish to confront this deadly threat and prove that you are truly a champion of the New Order Kai, then the nature of the challenge can be found in the next exciting Lone Wolf New Order adventure entitled Midnight's Hero. Dun dun dun. And we actually won. Silas so says, Meanwhile in Saraland, a woman weeps over three tiny graves. Rain dwenches her as fields of wheat molder around her. <laughs> Lone Wolf strides forth proudly, beaming. He slaps the woman on the back and says, You're welcome, and then strides off humming a merry tune while the woman curses the gods. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Midnight's Hero. The only thing that this tells me about the next adventure is that fucking somebody doesn't know how to spell midnight. Wow, I can't believe we got through this one finally. That one was long as a motherfucker. I've been recording for 6 hours and 11 minutes. Are you shitting me? And I and we died like 12 times in this book. Oh, this one was a was a brutal brutal journey. The Buccaneers of Shadakai fucking fucked me up. Hilariously enough, despite the fact that it's called the Buccaneers of Shatterkai, I did not fight a single fucking pirate in this whole book. So we made it. You just ensured the death of countless innocents and in doing so ensured continuous business for the Kai, Lone Wolf, and Bane and will totally bro-fist you for this. Yeah. Job security. Job security. Well, we made it. We did another one. Book 22, complete. Good times. Next time, we will come back and we will do... Wait, no, that's not how that works. Next time, we will do... Midnight's Hero... Which is going to look a little something like this. Apparently. The fuck is going on in this book? Apparently it's going to involve horses and shooting fire. So, that's it. Thanks for watching. See you next time for book 23, Midnight's Hero. It's gonna do it for this one. So thank you for watching all of this. This has been Josiah Plays Lone Wolf, Book 22 The Buccaneers of Shadokai. <laughs>